My name is Notepad Anon, and I write games for fun usually. But today, we're not going to be writing any games. I know. We're going to be looking at a few games. We're going to be looking at quite a few games, actually, because this entire stream was supposed to happen last week. But uh, my computer exploded, as does happen. And I managed to... I recovered most things. I went over a bunch of things, and I said... It's time. I'm going to go over some more games. I've added a, quite a few games to my little list here. Um, I'm actually going to make this go away real fast. See that? And we're going to go over Japanese tabletop role-playing games. Now, Japan has actually a very unique history with tabletop role-playing games. I've gone over this a few times before, but I'll do a quick summary more than anything. 
effectively, they didn't really start with what we would consider war games. One of the biggest games back in Japan back in the day for a very long time were things like Mech Warrior and Call of Cthulhu. Now, I want you all to think, just close your eyes here for a minute and think for a moment. What do those two games do? What do they have that another game may not have, actually? And while you're thinking about it, I'm just gonna just gonna open this up real fast. Let's do uh That's a that's a certificate of conformity. Uh let's see, Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu Japan was actually a fairly major part of their industry in a way. And you may think, like, why Mech Warrior of all things? Like Mech Warrior, that's kind of odd. You know, the old Battletech games and stuff like that. You kind of see that. A game of armored combat. Well, one of the big things about these particular games is that they were incredibly uh, hello, Ohio goes on a so no, Padono. Technically, it would be Mem uh, Memosan. The idea was a lot of these games had pre-written shit. Yeah, no, it's weird to think about. Where Call of Cthulhu had actually a very large amount of very high quality adventures and supplements to really make sure that you didn't really need to plan ahead that much. And making a Call of Cthulhu character back in the day was actually pretty, pretty simple. Combine that with things like Mech Warrior, for example, which were pretty much a written scenario that you the GM would read through, give you some like really basic options of like literally a choose your own adventure book effectively, and then you go to the next battle. That shaped Hello everyone, by the way. That shaped Japanese game development for quite a while. Now, of course, you had some major games. Uh our friends in the East unable to write adventures? Not quite. This is the reason why. Because the thing is, dice in actual like dice in Japan were actually incredibly expensive, like three, four times the amount they were here stateside. And because they were that much more expensive, it was kind of prohibitive to get into it. <laughs> it was kind of prohibitive to actually get into the actual game. So, what they did was improvise. They made, and they had to shift things around. So you have this prohibitively expensive hobby, except D6s, which were easy to get a hold of. You have an entire introduction to, effectively, this hobby, which was based off adventures. Hell, one of the most fa you know, famous games, actually, uh, in, uh, let's see. For those who are appreciatory, uh, you know, appreciate, you know, older anime, Record of the Lo Lotus, Lotus War, I call it Lotus War, Record of the Lotus War was actually that particular group's D&D &D campaign, which slowly morphed into uh, its own thing, not notably known as Sword World. Yes, most pop one of the most popular Japanese tabletop role-playing games evolved from this. The big thing is, Japanese people don't have time. Weird, because if you think about it, you may only have a couple hours every weekend, and you're not really going to go to, like, someone's house and someone's basement and play. No, you're going to go, you're going to rent a booth, you're going to go to a table, and you have this... How do I want to wear this? A mixture of various parts, all created what we would like to call the modern Japanese tabletop sphere. A lot of these games are incredibly directed. They usually have a very strong pitch. They usually are very simple mechanically. And the big thing is, they often are not really designed for multiple playthroughs. Most of these games are kind of a one and done almost. But I want you to think about like the last actual role-playing book you, you, you bought. How much was it? 20 bucks? $15? Most of them, and a physical copy of the book was are things like eight, nine dollars. Ten bucks a month, like here in the US. 
Yes. <laughs> also, hello. Hello, Rosinia. So you kind of mix all these things together with Japanese role-playing games, and you get a very unique and very different culture of tabletop games. Instead of war games that take hours and months to play, you get a game that kind of punches, kind of, kind of punches you right in the face and says, "Here you go." Yeah, forty. Th yeah, they're about eight to ten sometimes uh, in Japan. The thing is, these games are supposed to punch you in the face, and you're supposed to be pretty much done making your character by the time you hit the table. It's done, or usually they're like, here are pre-generate characters. Here are uh, cool things that you can do really fast, and like, here's a shit ton of options, but you're not really going to gain any more options. Now, on this particular channel, we've gone over a few Japanese role-playing games before. We've gone over quite a few of them, in fact. Uh, things, you know, l l little known games such as Necronica or things like that. See, I, I would like to, what I would like to do is show you all these games. However, because my new computer is kind of weird. I technically don't have, is that a USB drive in there? No, that is not a USB. Can I though plug, let's see everybody. Live on stream, Notepad breaks his new computer. Plug you in. Are you actually a, no you're not a USB why do you look like a USB port but there's a lot of Japanese role-playing games a lot of them and let's see the ones that I've personally gone over so one of the ones that I've gone over is you know the ever popular Necronica written by Ryu Kamiya Ryu Kamiya this game is an about zombie lolly combat it's incredibly thematic and even those from VT you can see even VTubers got into Necronica it's an incredibly simplistic game at its core. It's a D10 game. I've also gone over Shino Begami. Shino Begami is actually about Ultimate Ninja War. It's probably the only game where they actively encourage you to say, fuck working together, just murder one another. Supplements aren't done either. Uh, let me think at the top of my head some other ones. Uh, we've gone over Maid RPG, and that's a very popular game as well. We all like Maid. It's a game about being a fucking anime maid. Yeah. Look at all these things. It's, it's insane, because you have such a wide variety of them. You also get games that we will never see. Because here's the, here's, the, here's the biggest joke. I'm going to mispronounce this already. Here's the big joke when it comes to... A lot of these games. We'll never see these. We'll never actually see an English translation of, say, Tokyo Nova. We'll never actually see... We'll never see a translation of Card Ranker, an official translation. Majority of the games we're actually going to be going over today are actually fan translations. Because... The shame is, nobody really wants to translate these, and the games that really do get translated are rare, and very expensive, and very unfun for people to actually translate. Some of these games take years to get, you know, get over, and there are also some major issues with some of these games, which just plain flat don't work the way you want them to work. Turns out... Things are expensive, and when you do something really expensive in a niche hobby, in a niche niche hobby, yeah, things get a little bit rough, but that's why I'm here, to introduce you all to the wonderful world of Japanese role-playing games. It's gonna be fun, we're gonna learn a lot together. Most importantly, Jesus Christ, there's gonna be a lot of games. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a big thing too. Uh, there are, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, I also went over Zetai Raido, the, 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 the penis game. It's, yeah, yeah, we don't, they don't really care, but we don't care about them very much either. Again, we're, this is a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche. Like, this is a very specific group of things, but I enjoy showing all of you. So, we're going to go over a lot of games today. <laughs> We're going to be going over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're going to go over 9 games today. 
Yes, this is going to be a big one. But mind you, some of these games aren't actually very big. The only two officially translated ones we're going to be going is going to, going to be Ryutama and Floria. Which I have thoughts on Floria. So, let's begin with probably the most, you know, most popular one. Ryutama. Ryutama. Everybody loves Ryutama. Everybody loves Ryutama. This game is incredibly nice. It's incredibly kind and nice and lovely and everybody is happy when you play it. No one can physically be sad when you play Ryutama. Because the art is gorgeous. It's kind. Look at it. It's like a little JTRPG. Oh my god, it's Ryutama. It's nice. So, who actually did Ryutama? Well, the actual translation team, is, as you can see here, is Kotodama Heavy Industries. Kotodama have done quite a few of these kind of games. I can actually... <laughs> it didn't... Okay, Kotodama, Kotodama Heavy Industries. There we go. Kotodama has actually done quite a few games that are usually very, what we will call, Japanese-focused. Of their games that they've published is Tenra Bancho, Ten Tenra Bancho Zero, uh, let me, a Ryutama, and Shinobigami. Those are the three big ones that they've done, as you kind of see here. Tenra is a game that I want to go over eventually. Tenra is also, just, I mean, we emphasize this, Tenra is over, like, 800 pages. Tenra is fucking massive. Uh, so me going over this nightmare will take me some time. Bear with me here. Uh, obviously, we have Ryutama with all the fun things here, and we have Shinobigami. So they've translated all of these by doing Kickstarters for all of them. Because, yes, Ryutama well, did actually have... Ryutama, Ryutama did have a Kickstarter back in 2014. Though it's kind of debated that the translation effort started in about uh, 2013. So, yes, yeah, Ryutama! It's right here. Helped on the chaos, yeah. But yeah, it made $97,000. That's pretty big! That was almost 100000 United States dollars back in 2014, which is actually... Back in this era, this is back in 2013, actually. That, at this era was actually pretty impressive. And they, of course, go over everything. Where well, here's how this game works, and here's all the parts about it. And everything was going to be sent through drive through RPG. Now, the game is actually laid out by Daniel Solis. He is a guy that I've gone over a few times here. Most of the time, he, do, he does a lot of artwork. And he does a few games that I've kind of seen through. Nothing really, um, nothing really jumping out of me of really something like, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. He does mostly like board games and shit like that. Board games, card games. And like, oh, don't worry. Electric supplemental material, including the seafaring rules and the navigator class. Awesome. We're going to get some new cool thing and we're also having the original author write some books write some more stuff for us oh my goodness we're doing some original awesome things so notepad where's the supplements <laughs> well uh good news everybody there are no supplements it's never they're not coming out yeah, it's like they've been saying it's been prog progressing since 2013. They're we're doing this. No, we're we're it's happening. It's not. Things kind of get delayed and then things get a little bit slow and then things just never happen. And they also have a a few other games from this that they've also apparently said we're gonna publish the the supplemental material such as Shinobigami and Tenra Bancho. It never happened. Navicular class did come out, didn't it? No, it did not. It did not actually come out. It might have come out in Spanish. 
Because Ryutama, interestingly enough... Uh, let me see... Interestingly enough about Ryutama is that it did come out in... Um, let me see, let me just Google Tama real quick. Let me just hit the, all the wrong fucking buttons. There are actually, if you look here, it entirely in Spanish. I think a Spanish company got it picked up and they managed to get a full translation of it. I believe this is Spanish anyway. And they also did one of the expansion books, which does look like they actually add a few different things to it. Oh, and generally speaking, good. And yeah, this part particular company, I believe they're Spanish, have done quite a few different you know, translation works of Japanese games as well. Very, it's, it's the nature of the beast. Let's actually see. Someone sent me... Ah, let's see. Ah, yes, the holiday pack. Yes, this is the holiday pack where you can get the, the brand new Navigator class, apparently. Uh, it's here, apparently. It's a holiday grab bag, not an actual expansion book, though. That's weird. But generally speaking, the promised supplements never quite came out. Now, I'm not going to say, like, it takes time. I'm not going to say it's, like, a problem or anything. It's just the nature of the beast. And if you give me one second, I can bring up... Now, one other thing to, to note about this particular game is that I actually won a any Best Family Game, Silver. And this is the actual writer. This is Okada Achiro. Yes, yeah, Okada. Did I'm not going crazy. <laughs> yes, it did come out. So, this is Okada Oshiro. He's the one who actually wrote Ryutama. He's the Japanese author of Ryutama. Now, one of the interesting thing is this is his business. This is, I think the pronunciation is uh, Manodraco. This is Manodraco. This is a board game cafe. And you can rent tables and you can order food and you can have the food and eat the food. Here's the menu. You want to look at the menu with me? Let's look at the menu together. Look, everybody, it's the Ryutama Omu Rice. It looks delicious. Yeah, no, they... He wrote... If a few different things are to be believed, he wrote Ryutama for his particular business. It wasn't actually this one at this time. It was a daydream... Uh, let me see, is this the... It's not Daydream Cafe Tokyo. Uh, the fuck is it? Let me actually bring it up. Uh, let, me, let me go to Tokyo real fast. <laughs> and we want to go to Daydream. I googled you earlier. I googled you earlier, god damn it. Or were you? Is that... No, that's not it. I can't. I can't find the fucking place now. God damn it! But yes, he actually had another business called Daydream. Daydream was actually ah, here we go. Daydream was actually, I believe, to be his first business. This is the original Daydream site right here, and. <laughs> Soy rice, yes. Uh, this is the original, you know, cafe that you can kind of see, and it was a legit board game cafe. And I do mean what you would do. What you do traditionally in these areas is you rent a table for usually like an afternoon. You pay a fee of about thirty dollars, and you can play with your friends. This was, according to him anyway, this was the first you know board game cafe in Tokyo, and this came out a while ago. This was like two thousand six. And Ryutama was ma was made in 2007 in Japan, I believe it was 2007, for this particular establishment. He wrote Ryutama to get people into daydream seats, which 
is interesting. And you kind of see even like, uh, let me translate this English real fast. These are, according to 117, D&D had the 385 sessions. And, you know, people are pretty, con you know, pretty consistent. People play D&D here. They, they want people to buy play D&D. It happens. It, the, the inexplicable cries of D&D is not something that anyone can, can deal with. <laughs> Playing riffs in a bar would lead to stabbings. You are correct in that assumption. But yes. I, I find this is interesting. Because they don't actually really talk about him very much or his new location. Uh, if you look at the staff, these are all of the main guys. This is actually him right here. Uh, translate to English. Uh, he likes the... He literally GMs his own at his store. He's been working on, you know, GM for 18 years. This is just what he likes doing. And this is everything that he will want to run, including 3.5 and Pathfinder. Hobby Japan version. You know, it's... I find it fascinating. I really do. And this is one of the reasons I actually like going over to the people who actually write these games. Because you can get a lot of information about them indirectly. But what is Ryutama? What is Ryutama? Well, Ryutama is all about traveling. Yes, this is a game about going on an adventure with your pals to go to a place. By walking there. And it is a incredibly incredibly friendly game I'm gonna say that right now Ryutama is aggressively friendly this is the kind of game that you can play with children like very young children and they can kind of grasp it right away you know as you know, Orange Chainsaw says soul and that soul does kind of perfect into the artwork and everything about it. But again, throughout this entire thing, this entire game, I want you to close your eyes and remember this was written as an almost an advertisement. Like, hey, hey folks, come on down to my fucking store, buy a table, we're going on an adventure. Look how god damn comfy this looks, god damn it. Yeah, so you get things like, oh, the healer, a farmer, an artisan, a noble, and, you know, hunters and merchants and minstrels. Yeah, there's a little bit off kilter. I don't know why. Don't question it. Now, <laughs> this also leads to probably one of the most fascinating parts of Ryutama, which is the Ryujin. And the Ryujin is, for lack of a better word, your Game Master DMPC. Yes, this is a legitimately written-in DMPC. Your job as a Game Master is to play this particular character as well as kind of manage, hello Varric, manage the game itself. And the entire port, the entire lore of the world is very simple. It's make it up as you go. Who the fuck cares? Yeah, there isn't really any lore to uh, Ry Ryutama. The only core pieces of lore that you really need to know. There are dragons. There are, and each dragon is tied to something. This is a locational dragon. It's a seasonal dragon. It's a dragon that is part of the, the natural order or whatever. Ryujin are quite literally kind of like dragons whose entire job it is to tell the story of a travel of travelers and then give that travel stock that travel log to a kind of a, a a young seasonal dragon telling the story and have kind of giving them the introduction to like hey this is what the world is like and yeah some of these are very you get superpowers you get special artifacts which change the nature of the game these are all things that you get and you can play with. So what is the actual game system? What, what's, what, what, what kind of game are we actually playing here? Well, very simply, very simply, it is a stacking dice system. I call it stacking dice, other people call it dice ladders, kind of depends on how you're doing it. But effectively, you have your, force, your four attributes, strength, dex, intelligence, and spirit, 
and each of them are assigned a dice. D6, D8, D6, uh, it's a D4, D6, D8, D10, D12. Believe you can also roll like a D20 in special circumstances. But yes, this is very simply what the game is. Anytime you need to make a check or anything, you have a target number, you take two of your dice, and such, for example, let's say I need to make a dexterity spirit check. I would take 1d6 for my spirit, 1d6 for my dex, and I would roll them together, try to hit a target number. That's it. Yeah, that, that what, what, were you expecting anything more? No, 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 we can't afford anything more. <laughs> Neko Goblins, thank you very much. Now, that's what the game is, pretty much. It's not a complicated game. But it doesn't need you to be, it doesn't need to be a very complicated game. Uh, let's go over, kind of go, kind of go over the lore, kind of how things work here. But the big thing about Ryutama that most people know about is that the art is pure Kino. It really gets you into the mood. As you can kind of see here, it's very nice, very pleasant. Throughout, you can kind of see the Ryujin following along, because that's literally the, the plot. That's what's supposed to happen. So, scroll right through here. <laughs> Vocabulary kind of goes over the system. I literally just explained that to you. Now, criticals and fumbles are a little bit weird. Uh, fumbles are just ones. If you just roll a bunch of ones, you fuck, but everyone gets a fumble point. A fumble point allows you to concentrate. If you concentrate, you get a pretty decent bonus to your roll, which is pretty good. You can hit people better, you can hit harder, you can just generally be more consistent and not dying. Criticals, on the other hand, are when both of them are six or both of them are maxed. So, for example, they give an example here for D4 and D8. You roll a 4 and an 8, congratulations, you've maxed. However, it's both dice rolled a check for show 6, or both sides show the highest possible result. So, if you have a, let's say for example, you roll a d6 and a d8, and it comes up as a 6 and an 8, you didn't crit. Actually, you, you would have crit there. Let's say a 6 and a, let's say you have a d10, a, fuck it, let's say you have a d10, it comes up as like 6 and... Six, you would have crit. Six and ten, you would have crit. If you only have a D4 and D6, you need a six and a four. It's a, it's a little bit weird, but it makes a lot of sense how it works. Uh, spring, the Book of Spring. Now, the big thing is they very much do hold your hand through this game. <laughs> so canonically... <laughs> <laughs> Best self-defense tool. Yeah, pretty much. It's it, the GM has. I I can talk about the GM a little bit later. It's a very fascinating role, but the main thing is that you have to choose your class. They do like to hold your hand through this game. Ryutama, kind of the, I would say the English translation. I don't know about the original Japanese translation because I don't, you know, Japanese translation. I don't really know about the original Japanese because I don't speak Moon Ruins. I can, however, say this game hold, grabs your hand and holds on tight. It want it's gonna it's gonna tell you a lot. It's gonna say, ooh, excuse me. If you've never played, play these four. If you've played a little bit, you can try to play these, but be comfortable. Like, don't try to do anything too exciting. And then you choose your type. So you choose a class and your type. Your type kind of affects how it is. Attack type, technical type, magic type. Magic type gives you more magic abilities. Like, alright, you can use magic. Attack types are usually just better at dealing damage. And technical types are very useful because they allow you to do literally everything else in the game. Which you should totally take. Technical for life. And then you just assign your stats. You don't roll your stats at all. They give you three arrays. Use one of these. Don't do anything else. Please, we're begging you. <laughs> yeah, it's... When I said this game is holding your hand, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it's... 
<laughs> this game probably also gives you a hug. Yes. This is the kind of game that is going to hold your hand through every step of the way to make sure you can never fuck it up. Because this is, again, this is to get, ass, get asses in seats at a board game cafe, along with people who may have never played a you know, role-playing game before. Because how do you introduce someone to a role-playing game? It, it, it's hard, initially, because sometimes people aren't going to vibe with it as much. Other times people are going to be like, yes, this is it. Finally, this is the moment for me. But if you just hand people being like, this is literally how you play. Very simple, very easy. It's like, oh, well, cool. There's a reason this Ryu Tama won the Ennies, kind of the uh, the Ennies, which is like the Oscars of tabletop games. No one likes the Ennies. Um, it won it for best family game because this is a game is a really good for kids. I actually seriously debated putting Ryu Tama with uh, kid games just because it was that overly friendly. But yeah, it's the very, you know, the, the Neko Goblins, the cats, are very much the, uh, how do I want to word this? The uh, mascot characters. <laughs> very much so. And as you kind of see here, most everything else is very much laid out for you. Your max HP is two times your strength. Uh, wow, I have a strength of four, so it's eight. Your max MP is your spirit times two. I have 12. We're going to tell you exactly how this works. We're going to tell you exactly what your initiative is. We'll tell you exactly all the rules. At the end of the day, you really just need this character sheet in front of you to learn how to play this game. And this is also a game, and this is very common in Japanese games in general, where if you're not really confident, give them a pre-gen. Pre-gens are pretty popular in Japanese games. Because it's easier. They're going to hand you this being this like, here's a character. Do whatever the hell you want with it. But this here it is. Because this took me about, to actually make all this, this took me about 20 minutes. And this was me, and most of that time was me like, gotta min-max my fucking gear because I'm that person. I am a goblin when it comes to gear sometimes. Gotta, gotta min-max that shit. They choose a mastered weapon. And very simple, also very uh, JTRP, JRPG. If you've ever played any of like the old Final Fantasy games, you know exactly what you're getting into here. And again, if you're a Japanese audience member who've probably never played a role play in TRPG before, if you've played Dragon Quest when you were a kid, you're like, oh yeah, of course I know this. This is Dragon Quest. And everyone's like, it is Dragon Quest. And everyone's like, yay! Yay! You know, pick your character details, character name, age and gender, all of the rest of that. Uh, let me see. As you can kind of see here, this is not actually very complicated. This is a very easy game to pick up and play, pretty much. Even down to the fact they have the picnic rules. <laughs> yes. Get a game going more simplify players. <laughs> Item size and durability are ignored as the rules for concentration. All weapons use strength plus dex and strength for damage rules. All food and water are automatically refilled. Everyone gets a traveler set. Everyone gets a party set. Everyone gets everything. Because they're going to tell you exactly what you need to know. And they're not going to let you go any other possible way. So, what are the classes like? Well, most of the classes are going to give you a variety of bonuses and abilities. For example, this is the minstrel. Yeah, the minstrel, kind of the examples, are things like dancers, musicians, a minstrel for the minstrel, you know. This is kind of what they want you to do. Why are you traveling? Well, I'm a, I'm a traveling bod. I'm a spoony bod, and I'm going to go from town to town now I'm going to show everybody what it means. I see Notepad as a goblin with a note on his head, yes. Yeah, that sounds about right. And most of these skills is you're going to get automatically when you just start the game. 
are things like this. You get a plus one to all of your journey checks. You can get more information about things you see in here. Here's where you can, you know, use it. And this is what it's going to be about. Music. You can, once per scenario, you may choose one terrain or weather type you are currently traveling through and gain it as a song. For example, if your character is currently in a rainy grassland, you might learn the Rain Song or Ballad of the Grassland, but not the Desert Rumba. Play this song if it matches a specific condition in which it was acquired. Anytime it is raining, regardless of terrain, you can name your song whatever you like. Anytime you play it, give all party members a plus one bonus to their next roll, or if it's a critical, a plus three bonus. However, if you fumble, if you fuck it up, everyone gets stupider. <laughs> You're just that bad. Ta-da! Like, this is the kind of thing you're going to be getting. And this is for almost every single one of the classes. You're going to get little plus ones, little plus twos, or minor bonuses, or minor penalties. And if you want to become a trader, you can. You play the merchant because you have the trader ability, which allows you to do these things. Oh, you're a hunter. Why does he... <laughs> I like it how the two example hunters are, like, very clearly, like, fantasy woman, and then we have, like, a fucking commando here. This bitch has got dog tags. Like, this man is... Th this man fucks. <laughs> he's ready to fuck your day up because he's apparently solid goddamn snake. <laughs> Yeah, no, Solid Snakes and Ryutama, come on. Come on. Yeah, I know, again, yeah, this is beyond, failing travel rules are in the, all the game. <laughs> and we have a game, don't worry. So, things like healers, you know, farmers, artisans, and nobles, and even the way they're laid out, of like how, because these aren't in alphabetical order, really. But they uh, want you to know the Minstrel is by far the easiest fucking class to play. You just get a lot of raw bonuses and everyone's happy. The Merchant, pretty fucking easy to play. You just get a plus one bonus and you get more animals and you get a shit ton of money. Hunter, attack things. Just attack things. Like, <laughs> get more stuff. Healer. All right, we need to heal a little bit more. And then it goes into the more advanced ones. Here's the farmer. The farmer is very odd because you get a bunch of, like, bonus checks and penalties. You get a lot of things. The artisan is very much about kind of very much subsystems and making things. Which the noble is bad at everything. <laughs> the noble just sucks. Because you're a goddamn noble, of course you suck. But yes, your type does influence things. Your attack type gives you bonus health. You get plus one damage rolls. Technical stuff gets a bunch of very useful things, which you should totally always get. Because if you don't, you're literally insane. <laughs> and then magic gets you a lot more incantation spells. Like, oh wow, magic. And they want you to also get the party roles accurately. You know, make sure you get assigned things like the leader. You also keep track of everything. This is literally not anything. There's no rules behind this. It just keep track of everything. The mapper is the only one that really has actual abilities per se. Because you need to make some checks to map things out. Same with kind of quartermaster. But the Quartermaster is all about just keeping track of things. Literally, that's it. And the Journal Keeper, entire job, is to write down everything. The only person with mechanics in this entire dedicated section is the Mapper, really. But that's okay. Because you want to kind of gain, you know, this. You, it's a very standard, you, here's how you level up. At level 5, you get an extra class. You know, you're getting stat increases, you're getting specialties, you're getting favors, and you embark on super journeys when you hit level 10. It's kind. It holds your hand. 
it it drags you close into its nice soft chest and says, "There, there, we're gonna be okay," and then smothers you a little bit. <laughs> because shit can get a little bit wacky. Like, and this is a kind of a, this is a kind of a rough game sometimes, because they're gonna want you to keep track of things like size and capacity of items, maximum carry capacity. Everything technically has durability. And you can buy and sell and additional item rules. Like, don't don't worry. Like, what what does a cute hat do? Nothing. It does literally nothing, but it makes you look better. Like, cute hats do nothing. Beautiful hats do nothing. But that's not the point. It's like you want the cute hat, even though it costs twice as much. Or you can just burn your entire bank account trying to get, you know, magical characteristics. We're gonna go over food, what inns look like, the other services in town. Most of these don't actually do that much. You know, it's the prices per item of clothing cleans. You know, send one sheet of paper to another city. Shipping, wound healing, getting rid of status effects, item repair. Some of these don't really do that much, but they give you a good idea of what you're kind of expected to do. And then we go into all the items. Pretty much, when I get to combat, I'll explain how items work. It's interesting. But yeah, it's... I think that's like the big thing with this, because you're going to get, you're going to have the option of having, you know, you have five, six types of fucking shoes to go over. And you're going to get a plus one bonus in all of these circumstances. Or, hey, you make sure you have the right cape equipped. Because if you don't have the right cape equipped, you're fucked. Oh no, imagine having to do anything. Think of the children. You know, it's you know, they make you think. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of making the... You, you, you might be able to pick up on what I'm trying to say here a little bit. But you still do things. And this is kind of what the game goes with it's about maxing out your equipment it's about understanding where how the animals kind of work how all the various you know characteristics what small items are like and how these technically don't really do anything except do do things sometimes because they're valuable but you can also choose to have a grandfather clock because we're making an Oregon trail reference it's, you look at it, you're like, hmm. But you want to get into the mindset. The big think, you could say. Because you only have about a thousand gold to begin with. And since you have so little, you kind of need to understand how you get herbs and stuff. How do you get herbs? Well, you gotta fucking find them. Duh. <laughs> You buy them or you sell them, or you know, you buy them, not buy them. You find them, you sell, you find them. You do a bunch of things like that. Magic, on the other hand, is out of anything in this game. Magic is probably a little of my least favorite things. Got a weeb shit ad. Yeah, welcome to the wonderful world. See, I I turned off all ads, so I hopefully you don't get too many ads. But yeah. I'm not a huge fan of the magic effects. I'm not really that big of a fan because most of the things, it's like this. Pure crystallite. Crystallize is part of a tool touch. Gives off white light similar to intensity of a lantern. Cool. Like, you can choose that. It's range. You pay some MP. Nothing really jumps out at me, if that makes sense. Some of them are fine, you know, you roll and and heal target HP, heal shooting star, speed blood die and deal damage to the equal amount. Nothing really like jumps up and is like, yeah, here's magic, because you really only get about three tiers of magic per area. So you have, you know, basic incantation, you know, these are kind of your basic spells. It's spring magic, you got like, Spring magic, and then we also get summer magic. We also get fall magic. Yeah, most of these things are like are filled with tears, blurring their vision, and giving them a negative two penalty to accuracy checks. Like, oh, 
because it's not about you know, like fireball. <laughs> That's not what the game is about. It's not what the game is about at all, in fact. Which some people are going to say that's fun. Like, that's fine. Other people aren't really going to like. Because this game is, by all accounts, about traveling. Yeah, kind of, this is what the system is. Anytime you need to make a check, you roll and just try to hit over the ver over the target number. These are your basic target numbers, and these are evaluations. Evaluations work similar, and sometimes <laughs> save or cry. That's great. Yeah, pretty. It, it's shit like that at point. Now the evaluations are actually pretty interesting, which is, instead of like, and instead of saying necessarily like you succeed or fail, it's well, roll. You got a six. Well, you could do a, like you did all right. Not great, but you could do better. And it's just it's just a basic evaluation, being like you're gonna do the thing. Let's see how well you do though. You're gonna be amazed when you discover what the contested checks are. You just roll against each other to find it out, and it's gonna give you kind of some. Here's this. Here's situational modifiers. He's retrying checks at negative one. Concentration is one of the bigger things. You either pretty much burn half of your ma your mana, or you get one fumble point. When you get one fumble point, you get a plus one. You when you burn either of those, you get a plus one to your next check. But on a, when your range of values are like two to twelve, a plus one can be pretty good. If you pay both, you get a plus two. You know, technical tag would be like plus three. Oh, you know, even down to like, if you have one MP and you do it, you're still going to get the bonus, but you're going to faint because both of these values, your health and MP, both of these need to kind of keep above 100, be above 100%, because if you hit zero, you're unconscious or dead. This is where things start getting a little bit wonky. This is the condition check. This is actually a fairly important system. It's pretty much, you score at the beginning of every day. You roll a condition check, rolling your strength plus your spirit. So, let's roll what my condition for the day is going to be. My strength is D4 and my spirit is D6. Alright everybody, let's... I rolled a... I rolled a 7. I have a seven on my condition track. So I'm gonna be there. Now what does condition actually do? Well, if you your condition means a lot of different things. For example, when it comes down to these. You might have a status effect of say like four, for example. I have a body four injury. If my condition is four or less, I'm gonna take a penalty to this. But if I, my, if it's above form, I'm not going to because I kind of powered through it. The condition check is actually a fairly important part of the game. <laughs> I, oh, thank you, Small Cupcake, by the way. Thank you very much for the, for the bits. Uh, I'm already crying. <laughs> oh, no, don't shoot the cat cat soup. Yay. Uh, yeah, you, you can roll two every day and just be a horrible mess of a human being. That's what it is, because the status effects are also things like injury, poison, sickness, exhaustion, just go undergoing shock. And you could have, say, for example, something like this. This could be your, your status effects currently undertaking you. If I have seven conditions, seven condition, I'm only being affected by poison. Technically, but my um, my next check, since I have a negative one already, I now have to roll 2d4 for my next day's condition check. Oh no, I rolled a fucking three. I'm affected by all of these. <laughs> because this game is brutal sometimes when it comes to it this game has a pretty meaty cascade where if one thing goes wrong if you do one little thing wrong 
it's going to start affecting everything going forward. And if you fuck up a journey check, you're going to have to reduce your health. That means your condition is going to be lower. And since your condition is lower, you're going to be affected by status effects. Because you're affected by those status effects, you're going to be rolling worse. Because you're rolling worse, you're going to not be doing as well. And you're going to lose more health. And oh my god, I'm 95% dead as I hit the next town. Welcome to Ryutama. Because they may, it may look friendly, but Ryutama kind of kicks you in the dick sometimes. Not going to lie. This game does kick you in the fucking dick. And most of the time, it's fairly easy. It's just when one thing goes wrong, everything starts going wrong. And, you know, Days Movement, they, they are going to clever this. They don't really say anything about maps, but I would personally put it on a map if I were you. So, and then we have, oh, well, oh no, it's a... It's a really hot day today, folks, but we're going through a grassy wasteland. So since it's really hot, we need to roll a seven or higher. Let's see what we can do with our 2d6 strength check. Let's do it, kids. We rolled an eight, we rolled a nine, we did it. Everything's fine. But it could have gone very badly because what happens, what happens when you fuck up? You fuck up a particular check. Well, when you fuck up a check, well, half the character's current HP. So I would go down, for example, to four fucking health immediately if I failed any check. And you could go down because if you have two check, you faint because you are bad. You say bad design, I say, this is the kind of, it's a very friendly game. And we'll get to the reason why that is the case, though. Get to the reason why that is the case. This is very brutal when it wants to be. Incredibly brutal. But it's usually things like, nothing too serious. Oh, well, we need to make a direction check. And if we make the direction check, we can find our way. Regardless of the diff terrain difficulty. Or, here's the camping check. Here's all the, you know, oh boy, well, at the start of the next day, everyone's HP is doubled. MP is fully restored. Oh. Neat. Pretty much if you can survive the day, you're gonna do fine. You're gonna be able to make it. And once you make it, sit down, relax. You did it. There is... The only major issue with the, the journey check system is that you, the GM, really need to make it interesting. And what do I mean by that? Because if you do it raw, just raw mechanics, it's day one, rolled, in, rolled a seven, we passed. Direction check, rolled a seven, we passed. Camping check. Roll to six. We failed. We don't restore any HP. Next day. Roll to five. We fail. It's that's what you can do. That's what this game can devolve into. However, what you need to do <laughs> uh, what you need to do in this game is really breathe life into literally everything you do. At some point, like, you, <laughs> it's hard sometimes. And there's going to be points where, of course, it's like, just make a fucking check. I'm not going to describe. I've already, it's been, you've been in the open plane of fucking nightmares for the past three goddamn hours. We're just going. <laughs> like, you can do that. But it's very much a, you will liven shit up right fucking now. Because if you don't, this game, like, take it raw. If you just kind of apply it to a white room. This game is not actually that interesting. Ryutama excels at handing you a very interesting set of ideas and saying, make fun. Like, make this interesting. God, please. Because you don't actually get that many, like, mechanical... Um, there's not a lot of bite to the mechanics, and that's fine sometimes. And other times people are going to... Sometimes people are going to like, that's not fun. Or like, yeah, that is fun. And they even say, like, random events. Oh, no! Ha, 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 ha. Someone twisted their ankle. Ha, ha, ha. 
Because sometimes when people are doing too well, you're almost, <laughs> you're almost, you know, encouraged to punch them in the dick sometimes, being like, be kind of mean. If they fail a check, oh no, oh well, you got an injury, and you're gonna take a penalty your strength check. Ha 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 ha! And the big thing is they're they're gonna tell you how to do it, and the main thing is about with the dragons. And pretty much where a dragon goes, the land follows. And I love this section because all the dragons are very nice. You have look, look at the woodland dragon. I want to pat him on the head. Look at the highland dragon. He's so fluffy. Oh my god! Look, he could probably eat me whole. The big stone dragon, the dark dragon, the muck dragon, muck dragon supremacy, kids, muck dragon supremacy. This is a man that we. This is a dragon who fucks. He's ready to fuck your day up. <laughs> Go on, you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, cliff dragons, like, they're gonna, like, these are what you're gonna be kind of encountering, almost, in a way. Because they want you to kind of get into this feeling, and they want to tell you, when you enter into a level one zone, look at this, here's a giant field of flowers, and inside the field of flowers you find some random stuff, there's some abandoned goods in here. Huh, I wonder why that's here. Wonder what's going on? Why did why why are there just some abandoned tools here? We're like, hey, look at this nice little you know small river. Let's just relax by the river right now, and everyone gets a plus one to their condition or something. Or hey, you've entered. Oh, look at there's some there's a nice den, and oh god, oh no! And you know, as you get you know you twist your fucking ankle and get a eight because your GM hates you. And then we have all the weather dragons. And, <sighs> So combat. Combat is actually fairly simple. You roll your initiative, wow! And then you place your player characters on the two points in the battlefield, because again, this is a JRPG, this is fucking Dragon Quest, and the highest initiative axe. Cool. That's all we need to do. So what is the actual, this is the, the, the map. Yeah, I wonder if I can find um, the battlefield. This is the battlefield, and you're gonna, you put your guys in here, yes, it looks like a fucking egg, and the front area, everyone in the front area can attack everyone in the front area, the back area needs a ranged weapon. That's pretty much it. And each side is gonna have a number of objects to strewn around. I actually really enjoy them, uh, the object system, I think it's kind of a cool idea. And it's just things in the area. It's... There's a there's a stall and oh no the the cat goblin's going to hit me with his little sword. I toss open the I throw open the fucking you know table or something to hit him with the table, or oh no there's a stone wall over there I'm gonna dive behind the stone wall and pop a you know shoot my bow or something. Use an object get an accuracy bonus. Hey, good. I'll, uh, this is coming from someone who lived in the Midwest forever. Good cow maneuver, maneuver. That goes for some good fucking money. Like, <laughs> we don't even have a chicken map first. Yeah, it's an egg map. <laughs> and the problem is, if you when you use an object, it's erased and can no longer be used. Objects are quite literally combat bonuses to say. Well, I want a way to get a plus one bonus. And I think it's also kind of that subtle encouragement being like, Oh no, you rolled a six when you needed a seven. As they kind of, as you kind of physically hear, you know, dad who's GMing. <laughs> Say, little Timmy, you have an object. Would you like to use an object and bump that up to a seven when little Timmy can't roll above a fucking two the entire game? And be like, yeah. You hit, and the and the goblin explodes. It's just like, ah, cool, like, yay! And it's very simple. 
this is combat. Because the big thing with combat is that you have to make two, effectively two checks. You make an accuracy check, and then you make a damage check if you hit, anyway. So, target number is equal to the target's initiative, which I always thought was fairly interesting. I think only get plus one, I don't know, I have plus three there. So, let's say, for example, I have an initiative of seven. The Actually, the roll to hit me is seven now. Yeah, well, he answered bless. Yeah, damn straight. Uh, and it's like, oof, you've gotten hit. But if you roll low, you're going to have a low initiative. And it's like, ow, and, but you have high. It, it leads to a very interesting you know, dynamic. So you hit them, then you have to make a damage check. Can't talk, concentrate. And if you roll a critical... My god, we get to roll instead of 1d6, 2d6. So, for example, this is, if I just use my basic short sword, I roll my dex plus my int plus 1, I'm going to do whatever my intelligence is minus 1. That's it. That's combat, everybody. Ryutama combat is not important. <laughs> Let me just reiterate this. You can... Ryutama combat is not actually essential. At all. <laughs> this is still my favorite fucking image of this game. Something about it is goofy. Apparently there is the seafaring supplement. Apparently that is a thing that you can do according to what was sent earlier. I'll look at that actually right after... God. There we go. I'll open this up real fast. Yeah. However, the thing is what you have to remember with combat in this particular game is combat is not I'm going to like jump on you as you know, it's less like I'm a I'm a lovely traveler. It's time to go across the world. It's not like jumping on the Neko Goblin and stabbing it in through the eye socket repeatedly, trying to make sure it fucking dies. No, it's like, I've hit him with my sword, he falls over, and you see like a little angel you know, fly up with little X marks on his eyes to indicate he's dead. If you try to play this game like deadly serious, it ain't gonna work. But if you play it bong, like kind of play it bonk and it's kind of silly, it works a lot better. And I think that's always, I think that's very important in, with, with games like these, with a lot of Japanese games. It's about building, it's got kind of a building the expectation, you could say. If you can build the expectation, it's going to work. You, you, you're going to do exactly what you need to do. Uh, then we have things like town creation rules. The town creation sheet, the world creation sheet. Ryutama has a an absurd number of just stuff and just supplemental material that they want you to go over. Like, just to give you, like... Uh, let, me, let me see if I can find anything. Ah, yeah. These are all just various things that you can just find and download and add and just have on your sheet and to let you do stuff with you don't need to add any of it but it is also incredibly important so as the game master now this is where things get a little bit weird this is this is where Ryutama kind of uh, I would say Uh, I'll post. I'll post everything after stream. Um, you can just post it there too. Uh, this is uh, the the game master. The Ryujin system is what kind of separates this game from a lot of different games. Most notably, just because of it's very strange. But yes, as the GM, you have a DMPC, and you have life points. You have a level. It's very important. Every time you choose to do something, uh, benediction, for example your life points go down and you you're, you might die trying to save them you know save people or do things and 
you're expected to kind of fill out this character sheet for them. This isn't the this isn't the actual character sheet. Uh, let me see. Do I have? No, it, apparently I don't have. But yes, you do have a yeah. Like here, here's this. Here's the literal character sheet. And this is everything you're supposed to have. You want to use your abilities, and you kind of want to act, and you was just like, oh well, we're a narrator, or we're this. And every single one of these guys has a certain number of artifacts. You only get one artifact, and these are things like encyclopedia. You are running the game using the rules as written. The artifact indicates that the GM has created a few original rules and will be using them. At the end of each session, all experience gained by the PCs is doubled. I'd say like the the best way to kind of how do I want to work? The best way to actually summarize how the kind of the Ryu should work are uh, skulls from Halo. <laughs> if that sounds a little bit silly, but bear with me here. But they're effectively skulls. You take one of these things, you look at it, and it gives you a bonus or a big penalty. It's shit like, hey, at the end of every session, everyone's going to get double experience. Because you have the torch. Or, hey, uh, let me see if I can find, uh, what was another one? Uh, we'll use the Azur Dragon. Oh, I have the crystal. All PCs can survive damage that reduces them as far as negative 20. They will not die until their HP negative reaches negative 21. Normally, it's just negative whatever your condition is. It's like, uh, what? Nani? Nani? And you don't actually get that many benedictions. When you first start the game, you get one benediction to actually use on that particular journey. And these are things like the tale of the journey of the two PCs who roleplay ardently pursuing their goal of the journey can ignore all weather modifiers for the rest of the session. Oh, at the end of a session, up to two PCs write about their journey in a travel diary will receive their character level times 300 in gold. Some of these can get pretty fucking gnarly in some ways. For example, the red, like, of the dragons. The green dragon is the balanced one. You're supposed to play the green dragon. And this is all about traveling, adventures, hope, freedom, balance. As are dragons about relationships, a family, about learning out of each other. And the crimson dragon is about war. Dungeons, hack and slash, death traps. And it's things like, oh, if you choose to have the longbow, you, you change the combat system fundamentally. And you you kind of twist your head a little bit. You're like, wait a fucking second. Wait the f wait, wait the fuck. Nani the pizza. Which people are either going to love this system or fucking hate it. <laughs> You know, it's just like, oh, hey, allows the mortally wounded PC to cheat death. Use PC would have died. All HP of party members is immediately restored. They can only do once per session. Because that's the entire idea of what these stories are supposed to be told. Including the Black Dragon. Where you get shit like Dagger. Once per journey, an NPC can die. No role required. <laughs> or it's like, oh, you experience fear, you have to make a check. But remember, you only get one of these artifacts. So, if you really think about it, this is this is the thing when I kind of, yeah, when I kind of am um, going over some of these, is these are going these are you can kind of argue 
don't think of these necessarily as DM PCs. Think about these as, I have never DM'd before, but my friends don't want to run, I have to run. And this is literally a system being like, you have four ways to play this game. You can either do hardcore, you know, adventures. You can talk about feelings and relationships. Just fucking kill some monsters or have something more dramatic. And you're like, uh, and you as the G, you and the new GM is like, I don't, uh, what do I do? I'm scared. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, no, don't worry. Don't worry. You, you want to make sure they all play right. You have the long spear artifact. Everybody is part of the, part of a military operation. I can do that. Yes, you can do that. Now take the long spear one. That's your magical artifact. And now everyone's a part of it. Everyone's drafted into the military. Yay. And it's like, oh, all right. Oh. Even down to things like the dagger. Any, any GM can kill a character anytime they want. That isn't really like a big thing. That's not like an, oh my God, you violated the rules and killed a character. No. However, if you've never GM before, if you've never played any games like this before, that may seem weird because you're basing it off of video game logic. Or you're just kind of like, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm kind of winging it. But you now, ha but the game effectively slides a little card next to you being like, you have the dagger. Once per journey, you can stab a bitch. And everyone's like, well, shit, the game says I can do this. Hell yeah, I can do this whenever I want. Once, only once per journey, though. It's like, oh, okay. This is pretty much how to GM the character, which is fascinating to me. Absolutely fascinating. And yeah, benedictions, you add benedictions. And most of these things are, you know, allow you to change things. As you spend health and you spend your life points and things change. Hey, rewind time. Fast forward time. Yes. The spend two health, you can fast forward time. Or you can do things like everything is a critical success. Or you allow you to like, uh yeah, this one's an elite enemy. Of course. Duh, this enemy's elite, so Yeah. Of course it is. Duh. It's like, oh, it automatically succeeds. We meet again, as did I, no longer dead. Yeah, no, it's like this entire system, the entire Ryujin system, is more designed around holding the hand of not a player, but the GM. And some of these are things pretty nasty. You know, like when you use this, when you kind of reveal yourselves, it's, you're supposed to kind of, you pay a little bit of health, and it's like, oh, well, when you are lost, you can kind of give them a sense of where they're supposed to go. Or, oh, Jesus. Like, you guys are getting shit on in combat. I'm going to spend one of my health and make sure you can win this. Because I want you to win. Because, yeah. And the big thing is you level up by people literally signing on. And the more you sign on, you know, the more sessions you run, the higher level you get. The more level you get more stuff you end up with which allows you to kind of use more abilities and more things it allows you to be a better gm but you're also learning a little bit more aren't you you're like oh ha -ha -ha. Ha -ha, i've learned a little bit so it's things like oh well you you're getting a brand new artifact or here's a brand new, you can become a traveler, you can join them on their journey. And the final one is when you, when your seasonal dragon that you're supposed to raise leaves. After 12 sessions, you stop playing that dragon. You stop playing that reusion. 
and they're now referred to as a Mere Dragon. You can, you can appear on that journey, use a single benediction revealed to return, in addition, gains the use of ritual benedictions. Yes, after 12 sessions, you're encouraged to kind of drop the character that you, you, the GM, have been playing, and do something else. And some of these ritual benedictions are kind of amusing, such as the Ritual of Sleep. If a player, not a PC, a player falls asleep in the middle of a session, they lost their wallet. Money decreases by the character level times D6 times 100. If they lose more money than they had, they have a tax. For the entirety of the session, the GM player cannot use any modern words or expressions. If they quote a line that appears in media or use a clearly modern expression, they take damage. Or my personal favorite, Ritual of the Drifters. If a player rolls double ones, a tin pail or bucket falls from the sky and hits their character on the head. You cannot block it, you cannot dodge it, you will take one damage. In combat, the pail counts as one object. <laughs> or the Ritual of Improvisation. <laughs> Journey's GM is deterred by playing a round of rock, paper, scissors. It, you look at it, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> you're you're just an asshole, I guess. Like that's the that's the problem. You're just an asshole. Like, yeah, I just sorry, you just fucking died because you got hit on a bucket. And it's how do I want to word this? Ryutama's stupid sometimes. Ryutama's really dumb. And that really dumb aspect is kind of what it means to be like, you're playing the game. Because sometimes the GMs may feel like, hey, I'm not, I, like, I'm, a, I'm a different part of the game. Like, I'm not really like a player player. I'm a character, I'm, a, I'm running the show. But like, you get to do stupid shit sometimes if you really want to. And uh, the final thing I'm going to go over is uh, the scenario preparation. A lot of these games use scenarios. It's very much a, for example, an event sheet. You're going to go through this in a very detailed way. You're going to write out, effectively, everything you need that's going to happen in one way or another. Once you write down everything, that's what's going to happen. And you're going to go from A to B to C. PCs may not really get the chance to say, I want to do X, because that's not really part of the plan. You're like, oh, well, here's what we need to do. Like, let's do this. Like, this is very simple. And like, oh, well, we need to travel to IFA. And we need reason why we need to go there. Uh... You know, no, leaving Alfon from the gate at the edge of the Alfana grassland. Alf Alfambra ga grassland. It's going to take two days of travel. But uh, two days of heavy pouring rain. Oh, no. I make a gas line just before sunset. Part of me is a young man walking toward them. They find Kotaru, the Koneko goblin, under a tree. He's lost something. Oh, no. That's it. This is a session. Congratulations. This is the entire session. It's you made a traveling check. Let's make a camp check. Oh no, there's a problem going on. You're going to help the fucking goblin. Act three, climax. You're going to make a travel check and a direction check. And then you're going to end it. That's it. And, you know, you can do a little bit, you can have a little bit more stuff going on, obviously. Hence, you know, you know, Koneko Goblins. It's... If you like being very direct and kind of your hand held a little bit, it's going to work. If you're not a huge fan of that, eh, I can see it maybe not being the most appealing thing. Do I like... Yeah, here's all the Q&A stuff. Like, yeah, let me... Yeah. Weather specialization, precautionary measures against status effects. 
you know, and then special things afterward. Yeah, they're going to go over everything. And all the Kickstarter guys and then all of the various lists and all the things. It's like, yeah, like, yeah, this is fun. But here's the thing. Here's, here's the gist with Ryutama. That's a little bit... I like Ryutama. I think you should like Ryutama. I am going to say this, though, about Ryutama. It is a game that is for people who don't normally play games all that much, if that makes sense. Where, to get the most enjoyment out of Ryutama, it's you're playing with people who may not fully understand tabletop games very much. Not really normie fodder. I wouldn't say that uh, as that much. I would say this is more for, I want to bring somebody into the sphere. I want to I teach someone that this is fairly interesting, or I want to show people the that tabletop games are fun. Or, hey, you've never played anything except Dungeons & Dragons, Let's play literally anything fucking else right now. Ryutama is going to be able to teach them that really easy. Is this a game you can play endlessly, though? Is this a game that you're going to play forever? No. Absolutely not. That didn't sound good. <laughs> this is a game that you're going to play a couple times. You're going to play this, uh, you're, you're going to introduce people to this game, but it's always going to lead into something else. Wow, we had a lot of fun with Ryutama. Hey, do you want to try something else? Like, what did you like about Ryutama? Well, I thought the combat was fun. Well, here's this game. I'd we'll be like, oh, well, I really like to travel. Well, here's this game. It's, I like the game. I think it's really good for people who may not play that much play that many kind of games, or uh, I know there might be one or two people from WVT here. This is great VTuber fodder, I will say that. This is fantastic VTuber fodder, because you can teach anybody this game in about five minutes. You don't even need to have like a VTT set up, you can literally do it in paint. You can do the entire game combat section in paint. Like, <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, that's Ryutama. And uh, before we go, what I'm gonna do, we're going to do the Ryutama Holiday Special. So, this is the Book of the New Year. Let's uh, zoom in a little bit. Yeah, it looks like... Uh, promised a brand new start, new adventure. So, Navigator class from the first supplement. To not Goblin PCs from the second supplement. So, it looks like this is kind of a... I don't want to wear this is a combination of a few different supplements that have been partially translated. So, like, do you want to play a Kaneko Goblin? You can. This is how you do it. This is this is how you play a Kaneko Goblin. There it is. <laughs> Ta da. Like here's some like seasonal cards. Like you want to play if you if you really want to play some of the you know various things. You know if you really want to play a navigator, you you can. Like that's definitely a, a option if you really want to play a navigator from the first supplement. Here it is. Ta da. <laughs> Really want to play a Kaneko Goblin from the second supplement? It's also here. But kind of take it as you will. So. That is Ryutama. Let me let me open up my handy dandy notes here. Fast. Ah, oh, alright. So, our second game on our, on our list of sadness today. Second of nine, and we're already an hour and a half in. Fuck me. Uh, let me see. I need to do... Ooh, Ghost Hunter... That's so we're going to do this. I don't want to save that. This is Ghost Hunter. Ghost Hunter First Edition. Now, what is Ghost Hunter actually? 
What is this game? Hit the right button. What is Ghost Hunter? Hello, phone. Ghost Hunter is, the best way to word it, is how do you take Sword World, which is Japanese D&D, &D, and how do you make Call of Cthulhu? Because that's effectively what this game is at the end of the day. This game isn't really, um... Bump up the sound here. Yeah, this game this game takes place in the 1920s. And Ghost Hunter is a fascinating game. Mostly I say Ghost Hunter is a fascinating game. Not necessarily for it's good. Like, let me let me let me just reiterate this. I'm not saying it's an interesting game because wow everybody, this is a fascinating game that's gonna really revolutionize the fucking world absolutely goddamn not this is not that kind of game uh let me see if i can find my character sheet uh there we go because ghost hunter ghost hunter 1e is actually done by group sne so this ghost hunter Ghost Hunter 1E, actually Ghost Hunter JTRPG E Group Group SNE. And if you notice, nothing pops up. So if you do that instead, the Group SNE company information. What is this company, you may be wondering? Uh <laughs> this is a effectively like a board game company in Japan. This is probably one of the more famous companies because these are the guys who did uh let me actually let me translate everything into english because well i need to do that these are the guys who do sword world wrote senki rpg fabrication of mystery ghost hunter we'll click on that dice of the dead <laughs> these are the guys who oh god damn it oh yeah this is a group sne Group SNE did Sword World, and arguably one of the first major Japanese role-playing games these guys did. These guys were fundamental to the whole, you know, birth of the Japanese role play, t you know, tabletop role-playing game industry, you could say. Uh, and these guys have done quite a bit. So this is Ghost Hunter proper. Technically, we're on the third edition of Ghost Hunter. Will we ever see Ghost Hunter? No. Because the original version we're looking at came out in 1994. And Ghost Hunter 2 came out in 2002 due to its popularity. And 3 finally came out in 2017. I'm interested in Ghost Hunter, you know, Ghost Hunter 3. It looks kind of, you know, looks kind of interesting. Looks like it has a lot of uh, interesting ideas to kind of go over it. And... It's like, oh, all right, like, here's the, here's a blank character sheet, for example. It's like, oh, well, I can't read any of this because I'm not Japanese and I don't read any of that. You can read raw sessions if you really want to. However, Ghost Hunter is based off a game called Laplace's Demon. A, you know, the Laplace no Ma, that's what it's called. Laplace no Ma, which was literally a SNES game. Right here, yeah, it was an SNES game that came out way in, way in the long time ago, and you took the role of an investigator and his crew as you went into a ma spooky mansion with a demon in it, and you needed to try to exercise the demon, there's plot elements, you're fighting, you're doing JRPG stuff, and if you kind of go here... All of the classes from the original game are in the tabletop version. So it's like, oh, that's fascinating. Very fascinating. But yeah, Ghost Hunter is directly based off of that pop of that game. And it was actually fairly popular. This group SNE has a very bad tendency of um making everything. They they make literally everything. It's kind of ridiculous how much stuff these guys put out. But who actually did this 
particular game? Who, why is this here? Like, why the hell is Ghost Hunter here of all things? Well. For context, I have my, I have a particular button to do this. But for some reason, it sometimes just doesn't feel like working. Uh, but yeah, who... Who did Ghost Hunter? Well, it was by a guy named Claytonian JP. Claytonian JP, if we... Oh, didn't click that button. If we go here, I need to open up this. I need to open up my notes. I need to open up this. Claytonian JP is a blogger. Kind of elf games and Japanese elf games old school. This guy is actually, I believe, in Japan currently. I actually was talking to him a little bit. Yep, Claytonian. He's right here, and he does stuff. Like, he just likes to do things. And he talks about old JRPGs. He talks about old RPGs in general. And he has actually written a module right here for DCC, right? Right there. From Kill It With Fire, uh, that's really the only thing he's written. Uh, he does actually have a YouTube channel. Let me just bring that up. I can type in literally everything wrong. Claytonian JP. Uh, let me see. And this is YouTube. Yeah, right here. Uh, here's his YouTube channel. He's got eight subscribers. Uh, he does go over what was in the original 1E box set. Because he bought the box set a few months ago and just decided to translate it. So he did. I can respect the grind set. But yeah, this is who this guy is. He seems really nice when I talk to him. I'm uh, just basic things. It's I, I respect the guy. He, he's got that. He's got that Sigma grind set that I can appreciate. And well, let me see. Does he mention anything? Any additions? No. So, Ghost Hunter, Ghost Hunter, Ghosty Hunter. This is Ghost Hunter. 1E. Yes, 1E came out in 1994. And with it being 1994, there are some things that are a little bit funky in it. Because this game is old. It's pretty damn old, all things considered. And it's gonna show its age a little bit. So, sometime in around, you fight encourages out of the world, astral ethereal phenomenon. All right. And they're going to go over what Ghost Hunter is. The best way that I can kind of summarize the Ghost Hunter experience, and give me one second up, is this is how I'm going to summarize the Ghost Hunter experience. So, call you know, COC is spooky monsters plus dead investigators. Ghost Hunter. Spooky monsters. Spooky monsters. Splatterhouse investigators. Because, yes, it does have a very certain... Um, how do I want to word this? It does have a very certain um, uh, uh, opinion. Very certain aesthetic. Instead of being like, beyond the veil of reality, what are we going to do? Oh, no! It's more like... Uh, you can almost hear, like, the backing track of a guitar as it's like, I'm gonna fuck that ghost up because he's being an asshole. It's very gory. It's kind of over the top. Everything is... Put everything that would normally be at 10, put it up to, like, 11. Like, it's a little bit ridiculous. It's a little bit over the top. But that's Splatterhouse. It's kind of those cheap, old horror movies. And that's the fun part. That's what you're supposed to do. He does go over the, the setting and how everything works. And the big thing with this game, draw 12 playing cards, horoscope time, aspect of your personality or circumstances. All four suits. Yes, this game is actually used with playing cards. And you use these playing cards for everything. So, for example, let's see what my first card is. My first card, Queen of Hearts. So I'm pretty. I'm a pretty person. Cool. Your reputation. How? I rolled an 
eight. I'm not particularly not. What's my Taurus? I got a nine. I'm bougie, you could say. I'm very, I'm very, I'm doing pretty good. What's my cancer? How many parents do I have alive? I have all my parents alive. I'm doing pretty all right. My Leo, what are my hobbies? What? I got a four. I have a fickle attention span. I only have a certain number of special skill points, special XP. You know, Virgo, what's my work ethic? Let's be honest with ourselves. Oh, two, I'm a slacker. Uh, Libra, let's, let's do it. Uh, Absence of spouse or romantic partner, nine. Nobody right now. Hey, ladies. Uh, Scorpio, let's see. Queen again. Let's see. We got, oh, we're wealthy. We're $500,000 with liquid assets. In 1920, we are doing good. Sagittarius, what's our, what's our education? What's, what's, our edu what's our education, everybody? Oh, I got an A. We're high school educated. All right, all right, Capricorn, all right, let's, four, my God, we're not very trustworthy. How many contacts do we have? Oh, we got an ace, four of them. Pisces, our rival, oh no, what's our rival going to be? We got a six, oh no, we have no rivals. Yeah, no, use cards in this game. <laughs> and... That actually plays into the ability score system. Can we talk to everyone and change how feeling strongly about them? Use called ability scores. A suit score of four or five is the average. To determine the suit stat, take the 12 cards from the characteristic step and think how many steps of each suit you have. Suit sharing cards, not the numbers. So we have a diamonds, hearts, hearts, diamonds, hearts, diamonds, hearts, spades, clubs, clubs, spades, and diamonds. So we're doing pretty good. We got a we got a good we got a good mix here actually. We're not too bad, not too good in any any particular thing. So becomes the score for that stat. Now, what does this actually mean? Like relatively speaking, uh, <laughs> this is my my sample character. We did Billy the Oxygen Spear, you know, ox Oxygen Thief Dyke. Uh, he rolled incredibly poorly on literally everything except his stats. So these are what you're going to end up with. Because I have a four of di I have four diamond cards, I'm going to have a four in my for my diamond base. Because I have four hearts, I'm going to have a four for my heart base. Because I have two spades, two spades, two clubs, two clubs. That's how that works. Now, what do those actually do? Well, nothing. They do nothing. However, however, they do do something because they help you determine your score because secretly, everybody, this game is a D6 system now. So to determine all of your scores, yeah, it depends on how many you actually ended up with. For example, Billy here only had two in his spades. So he had to just roll a D10 for his brawn and his move score. He had a five, a whopping five in his diamonds, meaning that he get the roll 1d6 plus five for everything. Uh, oh, what's this? His heart space wasn't very good. That's not very good. Or he's not that lucky either. 4d6 plus 2d6 plus one, and you rolled a six. Come on, brother. We're not very lucky. <laughs> yeah, XL character sheet. Damn straight, brother. Can I be a cute anime girl man? <laughs> Technically. Uh, but yes, so we've established this. Everything pretty much just has two, you know, two substats, except clubs, which is just luck. Once you determine all of your basic attributes, such as brawn, moves, analysis, perception, willpower, personality, and luck, then, because don't worry, we're not done yet, uh... <laughs> They even say, like, you should scrap your character if you don't really have a good role. We did, we had a pretty good one. Um, <laughs> however, how effectively it affects certain roles. You start at level one. Because, yes, this is also has a leveling system in it. Don't forget, we're not too straight too far from it. So, now we need to determine our starting HP. Bronze plus moves plus willpower plus D6 plus brawn bonus, which is different, mind you. Brawn bonus is over here. MP... Two times your willpower plus your analysis plus 1d6 plus your willpower bonus. You're also going to hate me when I tell you this game is also...
Oh, you're not going to like it when I tell you when I tell you this one. This game is also a D100 system. <laughs> yes, this game is a D100 system. <laughs> yes, um when I said this game was effectively uh Sword World but for Call of Cthulhu, I wasn't lying. Where Sword World was kind of a legally distinct D&D &D because we we need to make a D6 version of D&D &D so more people can play it. Yeah, we'll, we'll apply the anime aesthetic. It'll be great. And everyone cheered. Somewhere along the way, they decided to say, let's do the same thing with Call of Cthulhu. But we can't stray too far, so they didn't. So this is also a D100 game. <laughs> yeah, this game... Uh, Ghost Hunter's a little, little messy. I'm just, I'm just gonna say that Ghost Hunter's just a little bit messy at points, which does lead to it having a sense of charm because you have to choose your class. So, you know, your your classes are all like, oh well, here's your specialist skills, and here's your the the main classes are detective, mystic, journalist. Yes, you can be a journo in this one, an explorer. A scientist and a delantante, delantante, an Italian. And you can decide to multi-class, but your XP requirements are higher. It's pretty much the more you multi-class, the harder it gets to actually level up. Because instead of saying, well, you have to assign it to various classes, no, it pretty much halves all your experience. So let's say, for example, you made 500 experience, you'd only get 250 experience. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll translate this later. This is very early. Like, for context's sake, all of this was probably done in, like, three months. Just the fact that this is, like, even here is impressive. Like, don't... If things look a little bit weird or wonky, understand that, again, this was in months. For something that would normally take, like, a year or two. <laughs> Billy, no, it's actually named after Oxygen Thief. Another one. <laughs> Not a tomboy. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do technical terms with everybody here real fast. Technical terms with Notepad add on. So... Technically, uh, among among women, because for some reason, for context, everybody watching and not seeing the uh, chat currently going on right now, uh, everyone's debating the linguistics linguistics of butch. So, effectively, how this works is most le most lesbian couples have about three different terms for it. There's butch and femme, which is kind of the the masculine lesbian while femme is the feminine lesbian. Pretty standard stuff. Dyke is an offensive term for lesbians in general. However, you can argue that it's been kind of taken back in a way to kind of be a secondary term for um, for butch. Personally, usually people just use butch. Tomboys, outside being God's gift to humanity, are or what you would be call a masculine but or Girls with ma girls with uh, masculine traits, which is a little bit different. <laughs> like, uh, welcome to terms with Notepad and on everybody, in which we all learn about the value of English the English language. So let's get let's get through it. Multiclassing exactly as I said, and then we have to determine all our skills because yes, we also have a full. Skill system! Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, you didn't think we had a skill system in this game? Oh, yes, we do have a skill system. I'm getting a phone call. Give me one moment.
Hello everyone, I am back. I got random phone calls. So, yes, um, pretty much how these systems work. Pretty much how the skill system works, and I can get here again. Are you gonna work now? Yes. Wait, no. I gotta fix that. So, what do your skills actually do? <laughs> well, your skills obviously make things better, because if you have a rank in it, you get a 5% bonus to your skill, effectively. So it's like, oh, all right, you know, rank one is low, two is basic, four, five. So if, let's say I have a two in foreign languages, I would have a plus 10% bonus to it. Like, all right, pretty standard D100 stuff, just presented a little bit weird. The big thing is when it comes down to, these are your basic skills. Like, all right, basic skills. And then depending on your class, you may be able to get specialized skills like Weaponless combat, large handguns, hiding, machine guns, small handguns, sneaking. Uh, this does lead to some amusing ones, such as a detective cannot use a rifle. Um, <laughs> pickpocketing, magic, and other things using fast hands. Only the explorer can do that. <laughs> It's a little bit funny in some regards. It's little, little, it's little things like that that kind of just makes you point and laugh a little bit. And it's like, ah, that's kind of funny. And generally speaking, and the big thing is too is you can leave everything up to luck for any roll, whether you have a skill or not. Roll your luck scores five times or less. Just, however, be aware failure in this can mean automatic fumbles, so you can just. Choose to instead just make a luck check if you feel like it. Which, alright. Posed rolls, you know, ambushes, how combat works. Combat's actually pretty simple. 10 second rounds, very standard. Move, you make range attacks, you can aim. If you aim, you get a 30% boost, but you only get it for one shot. You know, your melee, defensive stances. It's a very standard D100 game. And it's like, all right, you know, pins, here's all the pinning mechanics, here's all the non-weapon dam, non-range weapon damage costs, such as my, my favorite, the $10 12 ga 20 gauge shotgun, <laughs> or the $50 12 gauge, like, all right, cool, you want your $20 12 gauge, or technically how, like, a 22 does 1d6 plus 1, Plus R damage, which R is, if I go up here, R is pretty much your overage. If you do better than them, you get a bonus to the, the check. It's, <laughs> there's a lot of this game. And I'm going to, I'm going a little bit fast just because it's, it's an interesting look at it. So let's say, for example, I do pretty well. I'm going to do... 38 automatic is going to do D10. The 45 is going to do a little bit more damage. These do technically do cost the same. Or a 22 rifle technically costs less than a 45. Or the Thompson submachine gun. Here's all your fumbles. Here's your chair. You know, all the different kinds of problems and things that will inevitably go on. I'm going a little bit fast in this one. Uh, mostly because... While there's a lot here, and there is, there's a lot to Ghost Hunter, and I actually quite, quite enjoy, I think this game is fun. I think this game is very interesting. It is, however, how do I want to word it? A product of its time. I think this is a game from 1994. And it shows. It, it, it kind of shows. It's a little bit clunky in some aspects. Like, yeah, everyone can technically get... If you have psychic powers, you can choose to be some of these. And it's like, damages their MP. You do 1d6 plus R. That, like, alright. You know, like... Like, you know, let's say Psycho Shield. You know, this is a, let's say, a level rank 3 psionic ability. Your manifest a shield of astral st Duff, which fortifies the mind of one target, granting 10% to all resist rolls and damage reduction of two points to mental damage. It's like, alright. Like, oh, Kidoki. 
kind of it's one of those things like you keep nodding as you're going through and you're like oh my god like all right I do enjoy the, the there is this uh, gadgets and contraption styles. Pretty much, the scientist is allowed to build contraptions, devices, and special things that we saw in Ghost Hunters. Not we already saw in Ghost Hunters International. The more you do it, the better. You also need batteries. So if you want to build a ghost machine gun, you can build a ghost machine gun. There's nothing stopping you. The only thing stopping you is your own imagination, and your own imagination is usually going to be thing that kills you in these kind of games. So, what is <laughs> going mad, you know? It's, there's a lot here. Because the, this is, you can argue that this is the main gimmick when it comes to the going mad aspect. You know, take a card if you failed. Normal playing cards. You fail, you are gog with fear and unable to act. You a new resist roll, so. You can play, you know, play cards, had you one card with horrid things, may throw more cards at you. Fumble, take twice the amount of cards. Equal to that much HP damage, uh, have your total MP limited to face cards can be used toward recovery. Alright. Interesting. So, what happens when you take sanity damage, instead of having, like, well, you reduce your sanity by 1d100 or whatever, what you usually do is you get a card thrown at you. When you look at it, you kind of look at it, you open it, you got a two. It deals 10 MP damage, and you have, so his hat knocks down to 12. 45 adventures, Vanden house with source of strange phenomenon. Well, it's two meters tall. Oh no, we gotta shoot the, you know, the thing. You fail, roll, and fail. Supreme Terror, and takes a card, 10. So now, because I drew this too, my max MP is reduced. Oh no. But let's say I draw a face card. Even better, right? Let me see if I can fish up a face card. Let's say I draw a face card. Number card is removed, you gain the value of MP, and your MP ceiling goes back up. Go back to the positive number of MP will turn you from insanity if you have lost your marbles. <laughs> so. You can choose it to get rid of your own insanity, or you can spend it on other people. Which is pretty solid. I like this system. And because what, what the idea is, if you have a face card, let's say for example, you have, you have a face card, you can spend the face card to get rid of one insanity. Whatever card you want. However, somebody else, if they use a face card on you, you they kind of have to randomly take one. So you could be like, oh, I got a 10 and a 2, take the right one, and you took the 2? Fuck! It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> I actually really enjoy this system. I think this is a pretty unique way of approaching the whole insanity mechanic. Uh, such as, you know, Almighty Aces, it can be one of the following, you know, re recover all your HP, get a clue, remove a number card, all number card, someone, make a roll of crit, like, oh, okay, but here's the big thing, too, let's say you get, let's say you get three cards at the end of the, at the end of the session, you're looking at it being like, man, I need to get rid of these cars because I'm going insane and I'm crazy. But do you want to? Because, fun fact, you get experience points for having insanity cards in your hand. You get stronger by virtue of being crazier. So do you really want to get rid of that card right now? Fuck no. Push it. Come on. You want to go a little bit further, don't you? You can make it. Look at this. Come on, man. You're too. You're right near the end of the session. You can take one more card and you'll be fine. Eh, you don't need. Don't worry about mental damage. Don't worry about it. Don't wor I don't need to worry about it. The only thing I have is the heart of the cards, baby. And when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. And I. I like it. I think this is a very unique way of handling. Things like madness. And I think it's a way that... This is probably one of the better ways to handle it. That is, an, oh no, I'm going insane because of fish people. 
it's more along the lines of my mental security is a little bit compromised right now, but I'm also kind of okay with it. And you're, it's like some, everyone's going to react to something differently. Someone might be horrified by it, but someone might just say, fuck it. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> so I'm they kind of tell you like, here's the expressions of madness. You know, spades wants you to go through the body. Diamonds kind of wants you to, you know, hallucinate, heart is sanity and morale, your fate and drives toward the fatal end. And if you fall into madness, you lose a point from base suit score. It's bad. And you may get some more, you roleplay madness, and you learn, generally speaking, it's, um, hmm. I like this system. I think this is probably my favorite system of the entire game, roughly. You know, point from one of their suits, the you know, base ability score, they suffer a trauma. Get an idea. Traumas come light and heavy. You can kind of determine what these are. Honestly, I just kind of want to see this expanded, which I'm assuming is what happens in uh, Ghost Hunter 2 and Ghost Hunter 3. And, you know, you kind of have all the GM stuff here. Because in Ghost Hunter 2 and 3, it looks like they kind of emphasize the cards again. To the point where that's like actually one of the major selling points of the game is to get the really cool card deck. Because card decks are cool and you want to expand it out a little bit more. But is Ghost Hunter 1E like something that's like, let's go out of our way to play? No. Gonna, gonna be frank with you here. I'm, and the thing is, I'm saying no. Not because I don't like the game. I think the game's good. The problem is, as kind of said earlier, why not just play Call of Cthulhu? And the answer is, yeah. Because Call of Cthulhu has 12, you know, has years at this point. 40, um, almost 40, almost 50 years now, fuck. Like, has got 40 plus years of supplements, of books of resources online, which I always think is a very important aspect. Ghost Hunter doesn't. And Ghost Hunter has this. This is the only thing we have for Ghost Hunter. Would I like to see a formal translation of Ghost Hunter 3? Yeah, I think I would. I would. Because instead of kind of, like similar to Sword World, how Sword World developed into its own beast. Sword World slowly became its own game, Ghost Hunter feels like it became its own game over time. Just kind of looking at it and seeing reviews and such. It became its own sense of self, which I think is very important. Is Ghost Hunter good, though? Is Ghost Hunter 1E good to read? Yeah, I'd say so. If you really like Call of Cthulhu, you're going to like Ghost Hunter 1E because it's kind of like older school. It's a little bit different. It takes a different approach instead of more, oh no, beyond the veil of reality, it's... You know, yeehaw, motherfuckers, you know, kick down the door. I'm going to fuck this ghost up with my gun I have. Yeah, I'm a dumbass from 1920s Boston, but I'm also an anime girl. It's like, cool. Yeah, that's fine. I love it. It also has that kind of messiness to it that's like, oh, God. Oh, oh Lord. Why are you the way that you are? But, uh, yeah, that is Ghost Hunter. A fascinating duck, more than anything. Something I wanted to show with all of you, to show that they're just like us, in a way. You can kind of say that, in a way. Because we would like to believe, like, oh, well, these are completely different, and nothing is ever the same. But like, no, they, it's, it's pretty similar, actually. Very similar. Too similar, in some aspects. So, the next game we're going to be going over is um, one that I have opinions on I have opinions on this game and not good opinions not good opinions at all this is Floria the verdant way look at this artwork isn't she kawaii isn't she kawaii why oh god okay Floria the verdant way is technically an indie JTRPG yes this is an indie company who did this particular game and that indie game is maybe okay. 
maybe. So who translated this particular game? Who who who's bringing us this particular game? Well, this is Silvervine Publishing. Silvervine Publishing is a company that they're really only games that they've like really showed off at all is Summon Skate, Floria, and I haven't really seen any of the other ones. Summon Skate are is a game about literally it's persona on ice that is summon skate it's just persona on ice like <laughs> i would love to tell you otherwise but it's just persona with the main gimmick of this particular game being you have to on the map draw out the effects effectively, and once you draw them out, you summon them. <laughs> it's a very odd game. Very, um... It's the kind of thing that you, you look at, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> you pitch it, you're like, I... No? no, no yes? Does this old man in the suit drive like a little fucking mo bicycle? And like, yeah, huh? You look at me like, huh? <laughs> it's a bizarre game. I've been trying to find Summon Skate for a while now. Because Summon Skate is just such a crazy fucking pitch of any kind of game. <laughs> You're just like, all right. Um, this is a card game. I'm. They don't have anything on it. Same with Sparkle Stars. Nothing on it. This is the only other one that I've been wanting to find. They haven't said they translated it yet. This is a VTuber game about being <laughs> summon skate, thank you very much. Uh yes, this is Ryutubers, Dragon Shaman, <laughs> Dragon Shaman Streamers. This is literally a tabletop game about playing VTubers who are shrine maidens trying to get donations for their shrine, which has an actual dragon in it. <laughs> this game is fucking ridiculous. I love Ryutube. Like just just pitching it just makes me die a little on the inside. Just because it's so fucking stupid. <laughs> it's the kind of game where you it's just like I refuse to believe this exists. And it, it does. It's right here. Like we all we're all looking at it. Look, it's Ryutubers, everybody. This is a thing that exists. And it's Mwah. lovely. I love it. Also, there's maid skating. Like, <laughs> completely bizarre, but it's the kind of bizarre that I can get behind. However, they did. Yeah. They translated Floria. And who is, like, the main person behind everything? It's this guy named Ben Gessel. Or Ben Gessel. I can't really pronounce. Uh, can't really pronounce who his particular name um, however, the one thing that I have been able to find about this guy is that he does a lot of, he's like, oh, I'm a translator, I do all these things. Kind of see right here for Summon Skate. And he did, I didn't want, I didn't mean to click that. It's just like, oh, well, here's, like, I want to, I want to do this. He made an implication at one point. I can't remember, it was a fucking Reddit post or something. He made a Reddit post where he somewhat implied he had more licenses than he actually maybe did. And it's like... It's like, oh, you made a... Like, he has a few more JTRPG licenses that I genuinely do not know about. But Floria was, you know, Floria was on Kickstarter, actually. Floria the Verdant Way Indie Japanese TRPG you know, publishing, you know, right here on Kickstarter, it made four thousand six hundred ninety-one dollars of a nine dollar goal. Nine dollars. Uh, 
This is what I like to call scumbag moves that you don't do, and if you do do this, I am going to hurt you. Uh, pretty much what this is, is it's a very smart tactical decision. Which um, I'm actually going to... I will actually show it off because it's a very... You want, you know, middle... <laughs> this this is called mar marketeering at its finest. So, pretty much what it is, is kicks, you know, Kickstarter exists. Kickstarter promotes, you know, promotes successful products. You know, successful, you know, successful campaigns. This is the big thing. Because Kickstarter doesn't get their cut until you succeed at it. If you succeed at your goal, they get their cut. So they want things to succeed. And if you do succeed, you get promoted a little bit better. Because, fun fact, people, people like success. Doesn't really, this doesn't really, like, blow your fucking mind all that much. Like, people like successes. And because people like successes... The idea is you're going to manipulate the algorithm. You're going to manipulate people's own minds. Because what they'll see is 350% funded. <laughs> I'm typing fast, fuck you. <laughs> and because of that, they're going to put more money into it. So what happens is, you know, pretty much more money, you know, more money equals more success because you're always you're already going to get it. So pretty much the entire scheme, the entire gamer moment is to manipulate the algorithm to get more and more and more. And they say like, oh, well, we want to we want to do this to get the maximum property for you. No, 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 because they already did this before. This is the, this is the funny thing. This was so, there's something on Summonscape. They originally needed ten thousand dollars. They raised two thousand six hundred. Failed miserably. What a shame. But then they made this version where they had a thirteen dollar goal. Four thousand two hundred. I. Same shit, pretty much. Like, I genuinely don't actually think that, uh, this was a... Am I calling these guys, like, charlatan fuck fuckheads? No, I'm saying they're playing the game, and that game is manipulate the algorithm. But yeah, this is Floria. Did pretty well. Now, this is, you know, uh, ne Nekosuki. Right there. Nekosuki. Uh, they, you know, she, you know, she was working at Illustrator Writer under the handle Natsukuki no Noko, working as a character designer for Japanese commercial tabletop games, and she, this is her game. She did it for the Circle of Rokujama Phantom Space, and it's like, cool! And there's even a Korean version of the game. Alright, alright. Well, who is this person, I hear you ask? Let, let's do a little, let's do a little investigation, shall we? I wonder who... Who is this person like? I mean, this person must be someone very fascinating, right? They made something really interesting. This is, Flory is a very unique game. Let's 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 look. She's a furry. Uh, let's see. Uh, why do you need 10k for translation? The thing is. These guys, this is a side gig for a lot of these guys. Uh, a lot of these things are side stuff. Like, e most translators don't do this professionally. And I think the goal was for, like, 10,000 was, like, we're going to work on it 24-7. Uh, obviously, that didn't pan out. Uh, I, th I think he does have the rights. The thing is, though, a lot of these are indies, are hardcore indies, who probably aren't signing much, who are... Or are kind of. It'd be the equivalent if somebody said, "Oh, let me, you know, let me release this game in Russian or something," and I'd be like, "Yeah, sure, fine, fuck it, just give me a cut." If someone said that, to, it that's the equivalent. They already have the license. They already have everything. 
It's just publishing shit. So, yes, this is, uh, they are technically a VTuber. Yeah, yeah, or sort of like a VTuber. Yep, there, there it is. There it is. They're a cat person. Am I going to jail now? But yeah, no, it's, they are a YouTuber, VTuber, designer. And this is the same person. I, I like the artwork, don't get me wrong, but it's, um... Yeah, they're furries. They, they're, they're just a fucking furry. So, that's that's fun. That's fine. Uh, there is also the implication here that they... Uh, you know, Fantasy Space Production Exchange uh, produced popular tier Explorers of the Tower of Gears. There's an implication that they made this one. Which is, we'll actually go over this one a little bit later. And this was their other big game. So it's like, oh, alright, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of interesting... Yeah, this is the writer. And it's it was like, oi. Oi. <laughs> alright. Alright, gamer hours. It's... <laughs> Case too so early. I wasn't expecting this. When, it, when that popped up in my face, I was like, fuck. <laughs> I was like, god damn it, I can't escape you. Uh, prove that she's biologically a girl. No fucking clue. Um, going to assume, because Japanese. Uh, have... <laughs> yeah, no, that's like, oy, oy vey. Oy vey. But yes, this is Floria of the Verdant Way, and that does actually remind me, I need to bring up our character sheet for this to explain it a little bit more. We're using Ray, my, uh, my, my, my favorite gay furry, you know, gay furry, uh, as our example one. Yes, here it is. Here he is. This is, Flor this is Floria. You know, we got some stats. We got a lot of stuff here. Um, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to talk about any of this. Uh, so, what is Floria actually about? Floria is a game about being the Floria. Because, I'm, I'm just going to leave this here, just so I can explain it a little bit better. And the existential nightmare that we live in. Um, Floria is a game about living in the, in the vast and endless forest of the world. But, oh no! There's something wrong, though. The forest is alive with things called herbs. Herbs are pretty much are uh, plants that have reached the center of the earth and have been sucking up magic. And now they are all super powered. And because of all those super powered plants, you, you as the Floria have to go out there and you know sometimes cull the plants or control them and make sure that people live in harmony with nature and nature lives in harmony with humans or people. Cool, all right, that makes a good, good amount of sense. It's an immediate thing. We automatically know what's going on. Cool. What's the catch, though? What's the gamer moment? Well, obviously, a normal person cannot use the... Cannot just go out there and fight plants or control plants. No, 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 no. You need some help. So you ingest one of these fucking herbs and it let it grow inside of you. <laughs> That's the, that's the catch. And I, I left it on this image right here because this is growing out of this woman right here. Same with this. These are literally herbs that you have ingested most likely and are now growing inside of your body. Holy shit. <laughs> like when I first read it, I was horrified. I thought this was like, oh, they're like druids or something. Like, oh, we use the magic and... Plants. No, no, no. You're just like here's this alien, pa like alien fucking parasite monster, you know, magic monster thing that I've just eaten, and now I'm gonna get superpowers. And it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> you look at it, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> but yeah, that is that's Floria. You you kind of fight, you kind of use magic, and it's a very um. I like, here's the thing, like, I like the actual, like, setup, like, the idea is a little bit horrifying, but it's like, alright, fine, cool, fuck it, like, like, yeah, hey, everybody, hey, everybody, we're gonna, we're gonna use the power of friendship, and we're gonna fight back against the, 
we're, we're gonna live in harmony with nature because nature is really cool but we like nature and it wants to eat us so yeah hey everybody environmentalism yeah gamers like oh, all right like that's fine like that's fine in my book a little bit weird but fuck it i've seen worse if only it was that easy so what i need to do is i need to explain this Welcome to the the centerpiece of the game. Welcome to the Leyline Canvas. Okay, this is possibly the uh ooh, wow, this is a this is a thing in this game, and I am not a fan of this thing. Not a fan of this fucking thing at all. So the Leyline Canvas is your mana pool your health bar and the uh, and the growth inside of your body um initially this seems pretty simple like okay pretty much like let's just do like a basic concept oh no i've been hit i've been hit by an attack i rolled 2d6 i rolled a seven we'll go dead center Rolls in i rolled a seven i would take damage right here all right, pretty standard stuff. <laughs> this is a starting ley line. This is a starting character. So, this is your starting, you know, your species starting ley line. It has to kind of, you know, do this. You get the bonus line right here. You're depending on your magic style. You also get these ones, and these also kind of play into each other. And that looks like a you know a complete clusterfuck. It's because it is a complete clusterfuck. And you look at it, you're like, what the fuck? Oh, but don't worry, because the entire gimmick of the game actually is that you're exploring through to reach the climax of the adventure. And so as you explore, you pick up more herbs. You pick up a lot more herbs. And guess what? You add all of the herbs to that fucking sheet as well. And you look at it, I was like, oh, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, mother of Mary. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, how are you supposed to track this? Because the thing is, what you do is you draw it on your sheet, effectively. And what occurs is, I will actually bring up, uh, give me one second, I just need to do this correctly. Uh. So this is my sample right ley line canvas for Ray. This is pretty standard stuff, to be honest. And uh, yes, they actually do encourage you to bring your own ruler. Now, the thing is, what occurs is, let's say, for example, I use a ability. Let's say I use an ability that costs a triangle. I would fill in this section with like a pencil and then I've used it. I've used this particular thing. But let's say I use something that costs two triangles. I would have to fill in this one and I'd have to find another triangle. Because ultimately speaking, there are two main ones to consider. There are boxes, which are four points and triangles, which are three points. There are, however, unique ones. There are star shapes. Here, let me uh, bring it up the up here. There are star shapes, like here, for example. This is a star shape. Uh, there are also, there's one called a ribbon. Like right here, technically, would be considered a ribbon. Because there's two triangles that share a same a point. And if this looks a little bit visually confusing, the answer is because it fucking is visually confusing. Uh, it is a mess. Because 
remember when I said like, oh, I take a little bit of damage and if the thing is you take damage to any intersection on any of your ley lines, you take bonus damage if the part is already filled in though. So pretty much if you get hit in the same location multiple times, you're gonna get more fucked up. Or hey, if I take damage on a place that I've used already as a cost of something, I'm gonna get more fucked up. Do you see a problem here? So, let's say for example, I get hit right here at nine, we'll say nine, nine. Right here, I get hit here. I would take, uh, let's see, one, two, th I think I would take about two plus D6, 1d6 damage. That's lethal. Uh, yeah, this game is fucking nuts. It's completely bonkers at some points, and I got opinions. <laughs> I yeah, I like the setting. I think the setting is actually pretty pretty cool because the thing is they justify they justify why the ley lines are the way they are because look, it's a plant. You're, that's literally how it works. That's why it is the way it works, is it's kind of this messy thing because it's a plant line. You're kind of using plants to build triangles and build squares because that's how plants are kind of composed. It's like, oh, that's kind of clever in a way. And it is clever. Like, this is actually a very interesting way of approaching it's the golden rotation. Yeah, pretty much. And it's like, oh, all right. So what, how do you make a character necessarily? Well, you need your character sheet. So here's our character sheet. Um, you have to assign your stats. All right, let's assign our stats. Uh, technically you have four main attributes, strength, will, dexterity, and wisdom. During play, when making any checks, a player must select two of these attributes, add their values together, and try to roll lower than the number of their dice. Notice this wording. A player, a player must select two of these attributes, add their values together, and try to roll lower than the number of the dice. All right. The higher values will give you greater chance of success, and the, num and the numbers you assign will determine what things you piece you're good at. So this is implying that you don't even make, the GM doesn't even make any calls. You will always make the call. That is incorrect. <laughs> but pretty much the basics of this system is you take 2d6. And let's say I need to make a agility, well, you know, fuck, we'll say a strength dexterity check. I need to we I need to hit something with a with a stick. I need to hit something with a rock to get to dislodge it. So I have an 8. I need to roll my 2d6 and roll under 8. I rolled a 3. I succeed. That is the system. There are some issues, though, that we'll get to. Just remember that. Because don't worry, you also have six other attributes, which are things like attunement. They don't really do anything until much later. Vitality, which is like your health, but not. Agility is how fast you go, which determines your initiative value. Your carrying capacity is how much shit you can actually bring with you. And finally, life points and familiarity. Familiarity is a fucking meme. It's a meme. Do not trust familiarity. If I, if I make a Fibonacci sequence, do I achieve over heaven? <laughs> oh, effectively. So, yeah, we have all these basic stats. Like, all right, cool. So, assign the two, three, four, five, done. But then you have this one as well. You know, it's like the four, you know, remember that you only use each number once. Like, all right, two, three, four, five. Pretty standard stuff, nothing too exciting. But your vitality and agility, depending on what your background and what your magic school is. They don't really explain what these are at all. Uh, so just bear this in mind. Crafters craft, travelers travel, gardeners maintain things. Uh, this is melee... Melee Magic Rogue, I believe, is the is the thing there. Then we gotta choose our species. You can tell this is a furry artist if you can't tell that. Uh, <laughs> you get pretty much all your skills. It has two skills, you write down your two skills, that's it. Don't really get that much. 
uh, humans. Again, here's the horrifying parasitic monsters that we live with. Uh, we, we just have to accept the fact that we live with the parasite monsters. <laughs> and they get things like the fruit of knowledge. Get a plus one. Strength in numbers. When you, when you fail the check, you can turn a failure into a success. And you do it once a session. Wowzers. These are Therian. So the idea is that Therian eat an herb and gain sentience and then choose to willingly join humans. That is how that is the that is a sequence to being a Therian. Uh also, again, always remember the you can always tell a furry. Just look at the eyes. You can all every single time, just look at the eyes and you can tell it's a furry. Oh yeah, here's your starting ley line. Connect three points within the gray area. All right. Given this one, connect three points in the gray area. They do not tell you initially for no fucking reason. They don't tell you you must. You must connect it to that center line, which is. Uh... Yeah, they get like not affected by area effects. They also get a little bit to their abilities. And then we have the dryads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dryads are hilarious. So, this is what a dryad is. Pretty much, these are sentient plants that become sentient. The, these are these are herbs. These are what the Floria can technically control. Uh, yeah, <laughs> technically you can play either of these. And you're supposed to hunt these down. Like, oh no, Floria, the ones who've been forced through circumstance to interact with humans, or those who decide to slip into human society for their own reasons. Now, they actually get plus one attunement, which allows them to do some things, but they get less health. You know, select one character. This character can add one line connecting two points on their ley line canvas. The position of this line is decided by the player of the character. It's like by virtue of like having them there, you get stronger. However, this is their fucking like thing they have to do. Yeah, this is a... Uh fascinating thing and it kind of violates the rules but also doesn't violate the rules it's like oh 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 then you have to determine your lifestyle this is what you do you get two of the four skills so crafter you craft things you get a plus one or plus minus you get a plus one or minus one to certain effects you're a cook but this is a crafter that's what you are you're just a fucking cook then the fact you have a fucking picnic basket. Other PCs can use items on you. Trade items with other PCs, even if they're not in the same space as you. Oh. A mysterious cauldron. And the number of items you gain a hold of for a number of different... <laughs> you hold to gain any number of different items. Total rarity of the items you gain must be equal to the total rarity of the items you use. You can find scissors in this game, by the way. And that does technically mean you could throw scissors into the magic cauldron and get scissors out. It's great. <laughs> you know, a master's touch. I'm like, all right. What do, what do travelers do? Mm, plus one. Plus one strength. Just ignore problems. This, just fuck you. Or just gain more stuff. I'm like, all right. And then the gardener. Gardeners pretty much make shit. That's what, they're, that's what they do. They gain objects. And you get willpower or dexterity. There's a lot of these like little plus one and little plus two. Like, oh boy, he's a plus one or he's a plus two. Can you make stew out of the waifu? This is just a Twitter game. Not quite. Like, I don't, I honestly do not know if the translation's fucked or not. We'll get to the translation being a little bit fucked possibly. So this is the magic style. Cool. You get to choose one of your magic styles, and you get to pretty much choose. You get or choose what your attributes are, and you get to choose what some basic things are. It's like everyone gets that. Oh boy, like magic. Cause yeah, you get literally all the magic, and like you just get all of this. You just get all the magic abilities, and that's it. We have finished the game currently. Uh, <laughs> yeah, again, like, Cage of Holly, like, some of these are, like, Branch Blade, spend three triangles, deal three damage to one target. All right, Rattling Thor, adjust location of damage spaces from one attack, from 
One space up, down, left, or right. All right. And... Like, all right. So these allow you to, you know, do things. And your starting ley line, two triangles. All right, all right. Leaf, draw one rectangle connecting four points and two lines connecting two points each. All right. Rolla, triangle connecting any three points and three lines connecting any two points each. Oh. Pretty much, you... The idea behind this is that you have to spend something. It doesn't really matter what it is. You do, you're of lines, triangles, and squares. Those are the only things that you're really going to need to worry about in any capacity. Except if you're drawing stars. If you don't use fucking stars, stars is madness. Stars is nightmarish and we don't talk about it. Hmm. Delicious coffee. You have shapes and costs, and these are the rules for drawing ley lines. All points connected by a line must be placed on intersections of the grid. One point of each new line or shape must connect with another existing line. All right, pretty standard. A new line cannot be drawn directly over an existing line. However, lines may intersect, and new lines can be drawn over areas that are already colored in due to damage or magic cost. So you can't draw lines like this, but you can draw lines like this. <laughs> that seems pretty simple, but there is a lot of these. And they even say, like, draw everything to, to the closest to the size as possible to avoid it. Anytime you need to make a magic check, you have kind of already written it, and this is how this works. Yeah, you can also use sides, you know, the edge of damaged spaces. Or, hey, look, there's a damaged shape already colored in overlapping shape you want to use. You cannot use it. So it's like, what? Do the other shape overlapping, but can use a square instead. So triangle with line forming on the sides. Okay, some lines pass into the shape. So these are technically two different fucking lines. But this, this counts as a triangle because it's using this as a blocker. But oh no, this is a triangle. But oh no, we can't use this as a triangle now because there's a fucking damage in the fucking stupid triangle over here, which is different, which makes it a square. What is this game? <laughs> <laughs> This fucking game. Uh. <laughs> so, what is the action check? Roll 2d6 under. All right, pretty standard stuff. Nothing too exciting there. So, you need to make it you know, decide what two attributes are used. Are right, no wait. I thought I chose, but the GM must also decide what two attributes are. All right. Elusive herb in the forest. The GM might decide they need a willpower to persevere in difficult search. All right. You put a massive turnabout of the ground. You can technically use an attribute twice. Like, all right, it makes sense. Nothing too exciting there. So, difficulty adjustment. Check if they feel the action of being checked is relatively easy. Adjustment should be added to or subtracted from the target. Remember that. Below, you can find some broad statements. So, let's say, for example, let's do a little bit of an example. Ray here needs to pull up something. He needs to roll under a six, but it's pretty easy, so he just needs to roll under a nine. Oh, look at that. I rolled an 11. I fucking failed. But if I rolled, let's say, a 7, I would have succeeded. Pretty simple, right? You affect the target. Remember that. You affect the target. Now, aiding checks. This is where things get weird. Just remember. I want you all to remember this. Targets versus player roles. Very different. PC is going to make a check. Another PC with familiarity of at least one with that character may declare that they will aid with aid with the check before the check is rolled. Once they've declared that they should be are aiding the check, to place a check in the box next to the character's name of the familiarity table. All right. By doing so, they may add their familiarity score to the result of the dice rolled by the PC they are aiding. Let me reiterate that. You add your value to the result <laughs> of by the PC they are aiding. By assisting people, you make checks harder. <laughs> I don't know if that's just like a mistranslation. Like, 
I, I, I want to say it's a mistranslation. I want to say it's a problem. But what this effectively does, if you're reading, if I'm reading this correctly, let's say that same check is occurring. Let's say difficulty six, I need to roll under six. Now, my friend, my friend is assisting me. My friend is assisting me. And he has a one familiarity with me. Like, okay, I need to roll under six. Oh boy, I rolled a five. I rolled a six. I've succeeded. No, you fucking haven't. I'm helping you. I've made the check harder. Again, yeah, I, it's exactly cool. A cool iron side. It has to be a translation error. Which I'm assuming it. There's two things you could argue that it was supposed to read. Which is, they may, you know. Either they may add their familiarity score to the target of the diet, you know, the target number, but then you have all this other shit there. So it's like, that's not quite right. Uh, or you mean like it's subtracted from the result. So it's like, oh, I rolled a, I rolled a nine and I needed a seven. Oh no, I have two familiarity. I have now rolled a seven. Cool. Fine. Even if it was like re-roll a dice. I'm like, cool. That works. But no, like that's a, it's like, what the fuck? What the fuck? That's really weird. And that does not work. But then you have fumbles. So when you're rolling a 2d6 for any check, if the PC rolls a pair of ones, the check is automatically counted as a fumble. This is a 2d6 roll under system. You have an entire result under your dice, which is a critical failure, like zero recovery. Like, I, I don't think people quite understand, like, how this is like a bad thing. But I what I want to do is we're going to go to any dice real fast. So what I want to do. This is an output for 2d6. Now, let's say again, we have to make a six and under check. Technically, what we would do is we'd add all of these together. We have a pretty decent chance of you know, a little bit under 50%. We no longer have 50%. There are four results that we can actually score that would not be a critical failure. That takes away an entire little section. That doesn't seem like a lot, but when you have things like check of four or five, like something really difficult, it's like, oh no, I can literally roll three results or like two results or I fail. And it's like, what? Because if it was say, you rolled sixes, for example, you rolled boxcars. Okay, you rolled boxcars. Boxcars are a critical failure. Cool, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Nothing you can do to recover from it. You rolled absolute max on a roll under system. All right, perfect, you know, perfectly valid. But yeah, I was talking with um, someone, Manly, Manly, uh, uh, Manly Salmon the other day, and <laughs> even he commented and it made a lot of sense to me, which was, it would be like on a D20 system, rolling a 20 is a critical failure, as well as rolling a 1. There's no, there is zero chance that you will ever roll, uh, you will ever need to roll under a 12, because you would just have this 2d6 to work with. And it's like, what the fuck? I, I, does this make this game like unplayably bad? No, but it just makes it really weird for no good reason. Which kind of leads into like, oh, here's the magic burst mechanic. You can burn a triangle or a square and activate burst. You add one to the target for the check for each shape that was paid. Like, all right, because like, it's not that complicated. You know, like, if you, if it was like, hey, like we're gonna, fumbles are more extreme than simply failing an action. If it was like, yeah, you you fucked up really bad or you can't magic burst, like, all right, that's fine. Like, this makes sense. But it's like, ooh, ooh. 
Ew. Ewy. Oh, yeah, so we do this, and then we have to go through the search phase. Search phase, magic battle phase. So what's the search phase actually doing? You give them the magic forest map, information about the number of quests and stuff in the forest you need to do, and you go. You know, you turn player order, they are going to do a thing, they're going to harvest an herb, probably eat the herb, and then end the turn. That's pretty much it. This isn't really a, like, a big and exciting kind of system. I would like to believe, like, this is like a, wow, this is a really fun, cool, exciting event. It's really not. Like, it's, it's kind of boring. But, yeah, you make a search check. If they succeed, they are able to move a number of space equal to vitality. Um, if you succeed at the search check, you can tell what's ahead. That's really it. You collect any object, you use an item, you use a skill, you socialize, you rest, you complete the quest. And it's like random herbs. Like, I like the idea of like these random herbs. <laughs> Excuse me, moi. Or I like the idea of socializing. Like, if you end the search phase and you know, reach the goal, because the entire idea. Like, the entire concept is very simple. You take it, you go on it, you go on this little map, you complete little quests. If you complete all the little quests, you can do the big quest. Once you succeed at the big quest, you have the magic battle, and the game then ends. Alright, nothing too exciting about that. So, okay, we've ended the search phase, we can trade items, we can leave things, and I like these ideas, because if it's not defined you have just to roll for it and it's like peaceful woods sunbeam field of flowers waterside difficult terrain dangerous terrain oh no and usually like a quest is you have to succeed at the check to do the thing or just complete the goal where a lot of it would be like for example you can have a quest which is uh, you need to find, you need to find someone's bag. If you can find the bag, you can kind of tell where they're going. So you have to find the space where the bag is. You find the bag. You say, "I'm completing the, you're completing the quest." You do the quest. You keep going. Sometimes you have to make a check. If you make a check, congratulations, you succeeded. And sometimes quests go into other quests. Fine idea. Again, a little bit board gamey, which I'll get to. Have your items, you know, your herbs, and these are the herbs. Because the thing is, every single time you you harvest, you have to roll and you get a random herb. And let's say, for example, in area one, I rolled a one. I need to put the wonder weed somewhere on my map, and it has to go from corner here to a corner down here it has to be exactly that way that's why you need a calculate that's why you need a um, ruler because some of these can get actually pretty nasty so yeah it's like oh yeah here's the the noble liqueur tree you just draw a fucking N in the middle of your thing. And some of these are like, this is a pretty hard angle to pull off. And like, here's the V, there's a bigger V. Uh, where's the really fucked, like, the really, like, come the fuck on ones? Uh, <laughs> the, the Royal Flusha. <laughs> that shit. We've got the Bondana. Uh, where is, oh, if it's chilly, you might just get an H. A boulder berry in the middle there, a forest brazier, giant radish. These are just a giant fucking radish in the middle of things. But these are the depths. These are the weird, weird ones. If you want to get an M, get an X, get a stardust shrub, dragonium, giant wonder weeds. It's like, oh. Yeah, you don't get that many items. Like, most of the time you're going to end up with, like, glow berries, but it's like, oh, if you moon do. With a one session, like, oh, cool. Like, this is, I think, how you're supposed to kind of get rid of some of your problems of this game. It's like, yes, 
uh, recover one A check. I don't know why you would ever want to recover fucking A check. Or like plus one to target of your next check. Yeah, it's it's easier. Ha ha ha! Look, it's funny. Ha ha ha! It's like ugh. There's make sure you make a, you know. Then we have the magic battle phase. Magic battle phases goes by your agility. So your move step in your main step. Guess what? It's a line battle system. Front line, rear line. Use item. Main step. Use magic. Use item. Then the cleanup phase. You recover one. You add one ley line of two points to any part of your canvas. And then <laughs> this is where things start getting fucky wucky. So here's the damage we've got. Look at everybody. You've got hit at Five, you've already marked out the section. You've taken a 1d6 damage. You have 10 health! 10! And you're adding more lines to this, to this fucking mess of a grid the entire time. Every line that touches a damage square for more than a single point of contact. This includes lines that run along the outer edge of the square. You know, it's like, some of these can be absolutely lethal, Especially if you've already been hit. So it's like, oh, how many lines are touching location? You know, oh, and you can get hit three, four times. Oh, fuck. You know, moving damage with magic, and you know, when life hits zero, you just pass the fuck out. You'll lose your herb hosting in your body. However, until you gain at least one life point, unable to perform any action. At ending the magic battle phase. Look at Take three damage, you gotta move everything up one. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh... Oh, God. Like, I wonder if there's anything... This is pretty much like how the quests are kind of... Yeah, this is kind of like how the quests are supposed to be... Supposed to be doing. Yeah, now mind you... These are what the enemies do. Enemies get special skills, and they also have their own ley line abilities. So the guy does know this is a roll under system. Yes! It is a roll under system, and it does not work. <laughs> it, it's. Yeah, it's like, okay, here's all the enemy ley lines, and like. Yeah, like, a boss enemy ley lines contains two stars, which are important for paying magic costs. Beyond these, you should add 9 to 12 extra long lines. 3 to 4 long lines. You know, many lines near the edge of the enemy line, line canvas. So yeah, you gotta do every single one. But oh, you can also select that they have the multi-action. Standard attack 1, standard attack 2. Yeah, use during the main step. There's no cost to these. And a single attack could really do a lot of damage. Or, but everyone also has Wrath of the Destroyer. One damage, one target. When a target location is done, one location to the top, bottom, left, and right. You pretty much do five damage by using a star. Oh, but if you use Poison Flower Labyrinth, oh no, use before when an ally uses an attack spell. Spell will be limited to either six or seven below. Half the ley line the canvas is picked. The caster of the attack spell will only roll 1d6. Oh no, you're fucking killing people. It's, you know, oh, don't use all your powerful action, you know, magic at once. They don't, they literally, there's two reasons for this. If you blast everybody with your magic right away, they will be crippled for the rest of the match. Like, they're dead. Because this is like a boss enemy, you know, one. This is like a standard enemy one. And it's like, oh, sweet Jesus. Because I actually was curious, I'm like, Oh, like all the bosses act the same as well. And it's like, oh. Oh. Oh no. Uh, okay, here here here's the here's the thing with Floria. Here's the thing with Floria. Here's this anime girl. Look at her. The problem with Floria is two things. The first thing is that I don't believe the translation's very good. I think there are some issues in it that kind of make the game a little bit difficult to play. 
And it's like, uh, it, if you look at it just like the raw system wise, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't know if this is correct or not. I don't, I don't feel like it's correct, but at the same time, I think it might be, and it makes things a little bit messy. The second issue, and this is the big issue, this is the big problem child. There is a lot of work that goes into very little. The more stuff you get, which make, should make you feel stronger, puts you at greater danger for everything. Because, because you might have just drawn something wrong, and now you're fucked and you're going to die. Sorry, you, you, you just lost before you even began. Or you end up in a situation where someone takes a lot of damage, and it's like, well, I can't use... I can't use, like, my three spells because I took one point of damage in one location. Now I'm fucked because I just drew something wrong. And you have to get all the... Everything has to be just right and everything has to be just correct. And, well, we got to rotate it. And this is like, okay, let's just double check. Okay, did you get the right angle correct? Okay, we got to put that there. What I'm trying to get across here, more than anything, what I'm trying to put down is Floria has a lot of work be put into it to make the game fun. Problem is, that work doesn't pay off at all. You don't feel rewarded for anything. It's a fun gimmick. You look at it and you're like, this is a fun gimmick. Do you, I, I, I don't want to play this game though. I want to read about it and say, yeah, this is kind of a neat idea. I don't want to look anything deeper into it. Actually playing this would be a nightmare. I think. I, I think if you're playing in like with people that you knew that you want to sit around a table and have fun, then I think it could be fun, but for like once or twice. But the thing is, I want to play this as a board game, though. I think playing it as a board game might be fun. Like you're built, you're moving around the map. You kind of gotta track which herbs you have, and you gotta spend the herbs, and like that could be fun, I, I, in kind of a kind of a weird way. Like I, it, it has an appeal there, but it's not. I'm not sold. I'm not really sold at this game at all. And that's a shame, because I, I kind of wanted to like this one in a weird way. I wanted to say, like, this is... You've really you know, surprised me, Floria, but no, it, it's kind of a fucking mess, to be honest. I don't know, just because it's a $9 translation. It's very likely. But uh, the, the next game we're going to be going over... The next game is actually one that I've been wanting to go over for a while... One that I kind of immediately found and was fascinated in. This is also brought to us by our our main man, the the Russian the, the, the Russian himself, Manly as well. This is Dracu Dracu Scooge Drac Dracu Scooge Dracu Scooge Skadoop Skadoop that boop Skedaddle Skedaddle Bop Chuny Vampires. This is Chuny Vampire Simulator. <laughs> Drac, yeah, Drac Rouge, Drac Rouge. I want to call him Drac Rouge. This, this is a game about drama. This is a very exciting game because this game is done by Ryu Kamiya. Yes, Ryu Kamiya. Some of you may know him as the guy who did Necronica and Maid, and Golden Sky Stories, and a lot of other games. He's done a quite a few different games. Ryu is a fairly... He's probably one of the best known tabletop game design, like Japanese tabletop game designers here in the West, anyway. What the fuck? I believe this is him. It's like, I, he's probably one of the better known ones, simply due to the fact that he has a lot of them translated. Golden Sky Stories is officially translated. Made RPG is officially translated. Necronica has a very long-running uh, fan translation. Zetai Raido has a very long, fine-running translation, and Ventigal is actually undergoing a very large fan translation. The only one that isn't translated, like, or has, like, any translation at all is, uh, this one. Uh, Detato Det Detatoko Cycle. 
this is the only one that I actively know that nobody's talked about at all. And uh, there's probably a good reason for that. Like, yeah, no, this is the only one. Seems interesting. Uh, knowing Ryu, that woman has a cock. Um, but yeah, Ryu is fairly well known. I I would say he's fairly well known among you know people who like JTRPGs. And so I'm not really gonna go over too much. Uh, about him, because you probably already know, or you've watched my previous stream on him. He's a lollicon with a gore fetish. I will say he is a... he. <laughs> is Ryu a cunny connoisseur? Maybe. <laughs> no, Mobius, no, Mobius. We can't advocate for that. But yes, this is... Dracuscuge, Dracuscuge, Chuny Vampires. And this game is very different, but very similar to a lot of his other games. Even down to just, like, the artwork looks a lot different. I think he got somebody outside of his original circle to do the artwork for this one. Or he was brought in to do the rules by someone. But this game is... Interesting. I am very, very confused about this game. Uh, the big thing is here. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the the brief on the world. All right, so, all right, everybody, let's just uh, let's just take a second for let's go over the the, the deep lore of Dracu Scooge or you know Dracu Rouge, Drac Rouge. Chuny Vampire Slayer. Um, shit's whack. Dracul is the ancient super vampire. He's like, fuck the sun. So he got his, like, five daughter wives. And he's like, hey, daughter wives. Um, I'm heading out. You guys rule here. You're all my princesses. Mwah, 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 mwah. I love you. Though so he turned into a giant shadow dragon and 1v1 the fucking sun. Uh, he won. He he did he did a, he KO'd the sun, murdered the sun, burnt up into a thousand pieces, so now he lives on the moon. Uh since the sun exploded, uh it's now called the Everdark. And <laughs> the Everdark is pretty much a land of endless night, unless there's just the crimson moon, which is like the sun, but just the moon now, because it's fine, because our vampire Jesus lives on there. Vampire Jesus who turned into a dragon. Um, so the princesses divided all their territory up to rule individually, and the idea is, like, everybody has to LARP as knights, because that's what keeps the thirst at bay. Pretty much the more you, uh, the, the more you, uh, LARP as a, you know, a knight, the easier it is for you to resist going beast mode on people and not being cool. Pretty much the more tuny you act, the better you are. So, we've got the basics down. So these five princesses are all managing their shit. Good news, though, we have a problem. You know, a thousand years or so has passed. They've also made other vampires, and they've, you know, they're not vampires, though. They've made other knights. Everybody's kind of around doing heroic shit, fighting monsters, because we're awesome like that. But, oh no, the sun's back, it's now a dragon. A shard of the sun became a giant flame dragon, so one of the princesses and a bunch of her knights are like, let's get down to business, motherfuckers. Uh, so they charge the sun, the, this giant sun dragon, and kill the giant sun dragon, but she dies in the process, and everybody is sad. Because oh no, one of our sister, our, one of our daughter, fellow daughter wives is dead, and all of her knights are also gone. Oh no, what are we gonna do? Time progresses a little bit. Oh no, shit's bad. The, uh, there's more thing. Oh no, there's a plague going on, and then oh no, the plague is going on. But we're trying to recover from a giant apocalyptic sun dragon. That killed everybody. So the princess of that land is like, I can't save all my people, so I'm gonna just make everybody a Chuny vampire. 
But oh no, turns out that's not something you're supposed to do. Uh, save them from the plague. And since you try to make everyone a Toonie vampire, she became Satan. More accurately, she became Arthas the Lich King. Since she became Arthas the Lich King, she is now evil. And she has death knights. And every all her vampires are evil and undead and shit. So everyone's like, fuck. We got this. Our, our sister is now uber undead super Satan in the middle of our goddamn land. And then another faction was like, man, we can't. We don't want to deal with these excursions anymore. We're going to die. So they instead unleash hell. They literally just like open a, you know, pit the hell and be like, give us superpowers real fast. And they're now the, they're now the Popo. The fucking Popo's here. They're trying to fight the undead dragon, the undead princess vampire knight. Shit's whack. All right, cool. This works. All right. We're here. We're doing, we're, we're poggers. Um, this is literally just me going off the top of my head. <laughs> this is what I remember. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, they unleash hell. Uh, some other guy named the Rosenbergs, they get a special piece of land. They, he becomes special. Um, uh, let me think. Um, I'm, I'm literally trying to think of what happened else. Um, other things happen, and now we're here. Like... <laughs> I just want to give you guys like a a sum a summation of like the this starts on page ten and it goes Okay, it goes to page, like, 40. There are thir literally 30 pages of just lore. And, the <laughs> and mind you, everything is written in a way to get you in the feeling of, like, this is the most overly dramatic thing. Like, this is the sun drag in the year 777 of the Everdark, the terrifying sun dragon arose from the land of sunset. Indeed, in the utmost expression of blasphemy and humiliation against our ancestor, the sun had assumed his draconic form. The knights were at once enraged and frightful. Even the progenitors knew nothing of the sun dragon, a fragment of the sun larger than they have ever seen, aside from the sun itself, before it was broken. Its massive form soared towards heaven, but was unable to reach our ancestor with the meager wings upon its back. However, their beating was so fierce to stir up all the land. <laughs> you are going 199% when it comes to this game. And it's whack. Like, it's... You, you kind of... You, you kind of, like, just put... Roll back, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Yeah, it's translated. Like, yeah, no, this game is incredibly dramatic. But, like, yeah, here, don't worry. Here's our, you know, Princess Sedemir, Mare of House Dunstein, as eldest of the progenitors that are known with certainty to have survived to this day. It's thanks to her that S. Dustheim has claimed the title of being the most ancient of the houses. As one of the knights who personally participated in the battle against the dreaded sun, she's deeply respected by all other knights. Because nowhere in this... So I'm curious, do they ever mention the term vampire at all in this? One, there is literally one mention of the word vampire, and that's explaining that we would call them vampires. This is the shit that you gotta work with in this game. It is way dramatic, and I love it. I love the setting. It's stupid. I Like, yeah. It's, uh, you know, the Black Dragon Princess. Where he'd guild her drak don't dare she was drak. I shall permit you to kiss my hand. Serve well as my weapon. Oh, she's only served 194 years of, of service. Uh, because, like, there's... The, the big thing is... 
Um, you're supposed to kiss each other. Like kissing is like a big deal because that's like a show of both of like respect and also like we're in this together. Like kissing someone's hand, big deal. Kissing someone's neck, man. We're getting fucking serious in here. Like the entire time feels like you're about to, like everyone's about to like rip off their shirt and start posing at each other. It's like this is great. Oh yeah, this is Princess Marguerite uh, Giljan, the Hell's God. She's the one who unleashed Hell and is also the po and is also the popo. She's also ten. I'm gonna leave that right there. Yeah, um, Ryu couldn't help himself by putting in a dominatrix lolly. Um, she's there though. And did she fight a sun dragon? Yes, she did fight a dragon. Then we have this fanboy here. Yeah, no, I'm here to... This is... You can be a fanboy fairy. Um, uh, house Nosfer... Like, if I can... Let me see if I can remember all the houses in the top of my head. Um, oldest house. Scariest house. Uh... Pff, most fabulous house, uh, Popo house, uh, fairy house, uh, ever all my friends are dead house, uh, literally the the plot machine, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me remember, the, you are not vampires, you are not vampires, remember that. Uh, yeah. The chief representative of the faction count known as the blank. <laughs> yeah, no, the blasphemer. Psycho Velstein von Dustheim. <laughs> uh, Queen of the Dead. Yeah, here's, uh, here's literally S Satan Mommy. <laughs> Look, the guy from Fate Zero. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh this is this is vampire mommy. Uh she is Yeah, she is not a vampire. She's the undead. She's the Lich King. And this is the living embodiment of the sun. <laughs> yeah, no, uh the apostle of the sun, Apostle der Sun. Uh the Give me one second, I gotta <clears throat> This lightless world is one of despair. You must be freed from the curse of this eternal night. I mean, yeah, like you gotta, you gotta be in this game, a hundred and fucking twenty five percent. So, <laughs> I also like this. This is one thing. There are five absolute rules. The first fucking rule that is stated in this entire book. The participants of this game shall do their best to enjoy the game. The second rule, participants of this game shall do their best to consider the other participants' enjoyment of this game. I actually think that's very odd. When I first read it, I, I kind of sat, I, I, I sat there for a moment and I was thinking about it. I'm like, how many games is that like actually a rule? Like, have fun. Like, this is like, enjoy yourself. I was like, huh. Huh, like that's, that's kind of nice in a way. It's actually kind of a, 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 a it felt, um, how do I want to word this? Appropriate, I guess you would call it. No fun allowed. Yeah, do not rewind the game, listed consent, DR ruling, data description, rule description. So, they kind of give you the basics, like... Get your, you know, get your, uh, get your detail, the scenario flow out, you know, the main play, scenes, describe scenes, what your prologue is looking like. Make sure you understand what, like, the lasting bonds are. Uh, lasting bonds are pretty much, like, your ties to scenario important characters to make sure that you don't, like, just fuck off. Like, you're always going to be tied to somebody. Uh, take the center stage, your social scenes, combat scenes, oh no, round progress, round limit. 
most action, like most combat rounds, are only actually going to be two two rounds in most of the scenes, except the climax phase. But like, yeah, but no further mechanical effects happen. The Dracula should try to move on to the next scene as soon as possible. Final act at once, using single uh, can be used. Mana is equal to the current round number, so during the first round, only one point can be used. And then finally, the epilogue. All right, intermissions, little brief pauses, post plays. He reset the PCs, a uh, chance to advance or alter their PC, use themselves. Uh, yeah, so new renown, choose an exemplum, new action or path. Like, this is pretty much it. <laughs> You don't actually level up really in this game, nor at all, but that's a, that's going to be a fun one. But pretty much the idea, the entirety of this game is based around this. This is the bonds system. What do bonds do? Bonds are at the most simplest understanding, both your character's health and your way to survive. So let's say, for example, let's just make up, let's make a big example. All right. Let's say I build up all of my hatred toward Iro. Yeah. Congratulations, Iro. You've managed to piss Chippy off. Chip, yeah, you've managed to piss Chippy off just enough where Chippy wants to kill you. Instead of what would normally happen is if you filled it all up, you've got five noir with that person, you would cancel it, and you would gain one thirst. Thirst is bad. However, you can also add your thirst to the highest die. So let's say you have four thirst. You know, let's say you have three first. You roll a die and you got a four on it. Add three to it and get a seven. You're like, hmm. <laughs> so thirst makes you stronger. Like thirst just by default makes you a stronger, scarier individual. But what happened if you build up friendships? What if you build those companionships, such as with, uh, say with Manly, since Manly's here. Let's say Chippy builds up his friendship with Manly. It resets. But he gains one warmth instead. And the more war warmth does nothing. Warmth doesn't do anything. What it does do, however, is it allows you to mitigate thirst at the end of the session. And because you've already done that, because you've... Because by the end of the session, you have to pretty much get rid of all of your thirst from with using your warmth. So you want to be kind to others, but you don't really get much out of it. But you also want to use your thirst to get stronger. So you're, it's always kind of this balancing act of, of you know, it, because thirst, you know, noir is all about contempt, jealousy, desire, anger, killing, vengeance. It's like, you want to rip your shirt, like, I hate you and I wish to rip you asunder, you fool. But you also want to have somebody being like, no, don't worry, babe. As they, like, come behind you and give you a big old hug. And, you know, the, the violin goes. You want that. You want to have a healthy mix of uh, going sicko mode and literally using the power of friendship. <laughs> so yeah, this game is about the power of friendship, by the way. Friendship and love. Uh, identical bond adds a point of intensity to the existing bond. Can have one to five points. Because generally speaking, you can have multiple bonds with the same person, but they always have to be kind of different. You may fucking hate them, but you also are their best friend. Like you you will go to hell and back for them, but you also kind of want to strangle them. <laughs> Which words it? Either thirst or warmth. The fulfilled bond is then erased. However, the bond in excess of five points, a new bond at the same time is created. So yeah, by taking one point of noir towards, towards themselves, any PC can re-roll any number of dice equal to that number of dice they roll. Check. No 
done multiple times on the same check, but if you quite not tore yourself to the point that it's fulfilled for thirst, you can no longer re check. You can literally have a burning hatred towards yourself. Be like, I must be stronger, you know, I must be stronger to become, you know, to defeat my enemies. Like, yeah, no, okay, like, chill the fuck out. Like, okay, we're chilling the fuck out, cool. So, your thirst hits three or higher, you make a fall table. You roll 2d6, minus your thirst. So, so let's say I have a thirst of three, roll 2d6, I rolled a 10, so I roll a 7. The beast inside you stirs. You take one point of noir towards your choice, toward the target whose noir caused you to roll on the fall table. And this is pretty much it. However, if you roll less than zero, you've completely fallen. You immediately become a wallflower, because that's how they call defeated enemies. They don't call defeated enemies defeated, you become a wallflower. And also a werewolf, black goat, or night beast. You're removed from the game. Tainted spear warps your physical form. Roll twice on the omen table. Roll once on the omen table. Your noble heart has long flast fallen. You lose all rouge you have told the target, which you have the highest number of rouge. You gain one equal to the number of rouge you lost. If this causes your thirst to increase to three or higher, you roll again on the fucking fall table. Or it's like, oh, here's the omen table. Oh, your skin's a deathly pallor. You undergo no visible change. Your eyes glimmer with sinister light. Like, yeah, it's... It's fucking whack. Yeah, pretty much, NPCs don't have this system. You just have, they just have presence. If, pretty much any time you'd gain noir, or any time they'd gain warmth, you instead just hit them with presence. Yeah, pr pretty much. <laughs> Form bonds, you know, instead of adding points of Rouge and Noir, we just decrease their presence. This does mean for everything. So let's say, for example, I'm in an intense fight. Talk a little. Look. I got an achievement, everybody. Oh, wow. T chatting at the same time. We did it, everybody. We've got ten people chatting. Thank you, everybody. We did it. So, the entire concept of this is quite literally, your combat isn't necessarily me hit you with sword, do 1d6 damage, it's me hit you with sword, and as you build a burning hatred of my soul within my blade as I strike you down, cretin, it's like, okay, because you're effectively immortal, you're not dying, unless you really fuck up, and I mean really fuck up. So, and... Wallflowers are, as far as the rules concerned, wallflowers have ceased to exist. They cannot be made a target of any action. Uh, prison the narrative, same true with fallen characters. Yeah, so, round progression. Participating NPCs, and then the area map. Because there wouldn't be a Ryu game if we didn't have an area map. But instead of the, you know, heaven or hell, you know, heaven or hell system that we saw in uh, Necronica, instead it's three areas, throne, court, and garden. Uh, throne is the formal area, court is kind of in the middle, and the garden is away from everybody else. It's metaphorical. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see, line between them, like, yeah, because the lines actually do things, it's like, oh, alright. Everyone gets nobly so liege. You get resistance, you make resistance checks, because that's the only way for you to actually, like, resist not dying horribly. <laughs> yeah, role play, turn head. It's a yeah. Let's uh, because yeah, this is the main way you're actually going to be taking damage. Each type of steward, when existing in an area where steward is present, when it's ending their turn in an area with where the steward is present. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple steward. Yeah. It. it it gets... So, what is the actual system? You, you, you may be wondering, notepad. <laughs> you know I'm not a big fan of VTM. Here's the, here's the thing. Um, this is where things get a little bit funky. What is the system? Notepad, you have not talked about the system at all. Well, you, roll, you take 4d6, you roll your dice. Okay, I've rolled my dice. I have a 1, a 2, 
a four, and a six. That's my roll, and that's what I get to use for my actions this round. Let's say, for example, we'll use, we'll go, we'll go to Chippy here. Let's say Chippy wants to use, in, in combat, he wants to use All Shall Be Illuminated. At the beginning of the next turn, the minimum cost of action the target performs is raised by two. I need to spend seven points. So I'm going to take that six, and I'm going to take that one, put it off to the side. I've spent it, and I've used it. I also now have a two and a four. So I'm looking, I'm looking around, I'm like, what can I do with a two and a fucking four here? You're like, well, that's six. I can try, you know, let's, let's use a knight's chivalry. I want to attack him. Knight's chivalry, I take my four, I put it away, I have two left, it's fucked. Can't do anything else. That is how combat and how every single action in the game takes place. You roll your dice, and the thing is, each dice acts as a kind of a, a separate thing that you have to worry about. So, let's say, for example, that all shall be illuminated is seven. If I have a th if I have, let's say, a six, five, four, and a three, I can choose to use that three and four to do it. But I can also say, for example, let's say I don't have that three anymore. I would have to use like a four and a five. I've overspent on it, but I don't get anything back from it. Which is kind of where the game comes in. It's this kind of a, you could argue calling it like a roll and keep system. What is this chart? Why is everything different size? Uh, this is literally just how the... Um, the uh, sheet that came with the book, how it does things, don't question it. So if I could probably do... There we go. Probably do that. Make it better. But yeah, no, this is what you do. And mind you, social actions and combat actions use the exact same system. You pay the cost. You, If they're within range and the, you have a valid target, you do it. And mind you, these are also very dramatic. Excuse me. My name shall be heard. Knight's Chivalry. Cry of the pitiful one. Irredeemable era. Rest in my arms. What a gentle kiss. Inquire of the endless archives. Let us retreat, however briefly. Yeah, no, it's it, very dramatic. And that is how the system goes. And... Ta-da! Pretty much what you can do with the Noblesse Oblige is that if you have at least one point, you can spend it and increase the number of dice you roll by one. So, instead of rolling 4d6, you can roll 5d6. Instead of rolling 5d6, you can add 6d6 if you roll for everything. It's that. The big thing what you want to do is you want to always kind of build it up and you want to spend more. So by round three of the final act, you could be rolling like 7d6, you know, putting all the actions together to do it. This does actually play into the Pips of Glory system, which I actually think is very interesting and I actually really enjoy. Well, Pips of Glory is actually very simple. Let's say, for example, I roll two sixes. I have a floating ten. It's just there. I can use that ten to spend it on something or I can use it to fuck off. I just have like a floating ten, ten die, you could say, over in the corner. But you can also get it if you roll... Ones. So let's say you roll shit and you get double one. You get snake eyes. You have a floating ten now. You're getting something, even if you roll the absolute worst you physically can. You're still going to get something out of it. And I do enjoy that. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Uh, this also kind of plays into like the dice modifiers and things like that. It's... I enjoy this system. I think I think this is a very cool system, and I would like to see this expanded out a little bit more. Maybe uh, I think that could be very fascinating. However, <laughs> you know, negate uh, the, the user resistance checks. NPCs can't do that. This is very important. Rules for making are described. So, 
Choose the target. Oh no, he's trying to attack me with his sword. Not limited to the area of the user, or multiple PCs can attempt resistance check the same target. Roll the dice. Roll number of dice equal to the amount of resistance you are spending. Equal, to, equal is known as the result. <laughs> so it differs from the action check in the following ways. The entire idea is that you spend, is you make a check with that resistance die, and you try to hit whatever the fuck you spent on it. And let's say someone is attacking me, and they would normally just do like a knight's chivalry, it costs four. However, let's say they spent a six, they spent a six and a two on it. Technically, they have an eight now, so I need to take my resistance and try to roll above an eight to resist taking one noir. That's what a resistance check is. Little bit wonky, not perfect. And there's some other like very detailed things. Like technically, you can have hatred toward the sun, but you can never get rouge toward the sun. And if you fill it, you just lose warmth, but not you don't gain thirst. But however, if you have zero points of warmth and fulfill noir toward the sun, you just die. Because you literally get burnt up because it's the sun. <laughs> so, what are characters like? Well, characters are... Interesting. They, what they want you to do is they really, really, really want you to use sample characters because it's a very weird system. They also want to hide the fact that there isn't actually very much there. So, the big thing is I use Chippy, for example. Of course, Chippy got his full name, Sir Chippy Herr van der Gestalten in Ended Ventiger uh, van der Werwolf uh, Oran. As you can tell, I'm very Dutch. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately for everyone involved who could read Dutch for that. Um, yeah, you pff, formal place of origin. They give you like a full thing on like how you're supposed to do the names. This is the full name. Like this is like a, a full technical name is your name, your family name, Vaughn, the name of your lineage. So, Enhard Bergen von Drock. Or in hen gerde vergen von drak. Because that's just how it works. It's Sir Bergen. For the Knights of the Woods, full name or full title. Sir, Sir Enard Bergen von Drak. Sir Enard Bergen. Sir Enard Gerda von, von Drak. Not Sir Bergen. Different. Uh -huh. Then you have some ba basic ones. Sign one sign of corruption from 3 12. The 10 omen tables. So, full creation. We gotta select our bloodlines. We have to select our path, and then we have to select our renown. Alright. And did you really think we would get out of not designing our very own coat of arms, which are very specific, by the way? Very detailed. Yes, these are the sample characters. This is the Lord, Lord of House Drak. You can kind of see here, she's our she's our undead lolly. We all love her. Pat her head, she will kill you if you do not. Uh, Pilgrim of House Vazenberg. Vazenberg. Uh, our Jewish wizard friend. <laughs> uh, this is the Night Beast Lolly. Uh, pretty much all Night Beast is is somebody who fell to darkness temporarily and now goes sicko mode 24-7 and everyone hates you. The fairies are here with us. <laughs> or you end up with things like the god of House Hell's God. You can tell you can tell she's very she's a very accomplished knight because she's wearing short shorts. Um because the one thing about this setting as well, that they just it's it's quite literally like they just mention it offhand and just ignore it for the rest of the time. Because all of these people all the knights have something called realization. All the realization does is that they can literally manifest things by virtue of being super fucking chivalrous. The more chivalrous you are, the more heroic and more you you are, you can just materialize things. Including clothes. She isn't actually wearing real clothes there. She's wearing imagination clothes. She's literally convinced everybody she's wearing by virtue of being a vampire knight. 
<laughs> it's just one of those things you look at, you're like, why the fuck is this in here? You can't do that. You can't change your body. That's one thing. They do they do make a point of it. You can't change your body at all. Once you're kind of set in, set in stone there. But it's like, yes, just be a vampire now. Like, all right, this is fine. <laughs> Everything's also in German, by the way. Like, here's this edgy fucker. I hate this guy. He looks super dumb. But yes, you... We're just gonna roll. We're gonna roll once in this chart. Let's see. We're gonna. We got a 33. What's our 33 set? Uh, faithful as a commoner, you had unshakable faith in Dracul and the Crimson Moon above. Perhaps this is what led you to become a knight. Uh, let's see. So our life, our life path. Let's see how old we look. We rolled a 62. Uh, let's see. At the time of your accolade, you vowed your loyalty to your liege. Even if it turns you against the world, you swore to never betray, betray your liege. Our knight, what's our knighthood like? Uh, t 26. You never want to stop fighting. Even if you are brought to your knees, you will fight until the end of your existence. It is your reason for being. What a little ling! Yeah, you can also be a boomer in this one, which I always find funny. Like, there's one where you roll, which is just like some stupid. Amount. Like, you can you just roll. Uh, because this is the, the how long you've been a vampire for. Ah, uh, right here. Survivor. Technically, for as a survivor, you can be 12. So it would be 12 times 20. You can be a vampire for. <laughs> pretty much. The absolute oldest you can be is 240, by virtue of surviving the, the endless apocalypse known as the sun. Uh, <laughs> yep, uh, also, don't forget about the forearm tables, and oh god, here's all the action details. How how all the exemplums work, what you can do per thing. Everyone gets these. But each bloodline also gets a, two combat actions and two social actions. And each each of the bloodlines has three branches. Uh, let's say, for example, this is the, uh, the Dragon Rampart. Uh, Stehender uh, Druk. Let's see. Know the distance of eternity. Summon, s summon Steward 3. These stewards are on the throne. No character in the throne can perform actions with the target other than these stewards. Witness thine ruptures. The, the, point, the target gains noir equal to the number of stewards in the area divided by two. So you just spam, spam out stewards and then bash them over the head. The jewel of the throne is here. Treat the target area as if it were the throne. At the end of the turn, characters of your choice and target gain point of root. I shall become the moon. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's shit like this. And... <sighs> but yeah, I know everyone gets two combat, two social. I'm like, all right, that makes, that makes sense. I'm like, all right, that makes perfect sense. Now let me... You got a lot of options. Then your paths. Your paths also give you three options and two combat actions and two social actions. Uh, this does mean that you should spam out shit anytime you want. Just spam. Endlessly spam. So, <laughs> you may be wondering why I'm kind of speeding through this a little bit. And the reason why, because this is what you're doing. And it's, you get a lot of things like pedal, pedal shattering strike. The target takes one noir, cost three, or fall with the red moon up to cost time divided by three characters. The target area take one point of noir. Whispers of my valiance. The target gains one rouge. Mm-hmm. Invitation beneath the move. You force move the target. In addition, after finishing your actions, you may move to the same area as the target. Be like, don't worry. Hello, everybody. It's me. Be literally be a sexy vampire, and 
yeah, there's, um, most of the time, what you're going to be doing, almost every single thing you're going to be doing, is gain war, lose, gain war, lose war, gain rouge, lose rouge, do another thing. That's pretty much the entire game. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to believe that it does actually have like something more in it. It really doesn't. You know, it's like, oh, a target takes three more. In addition, you may erase a realization present upon the target. Invading malice. Uh, yeah. Poor, poor role model. <laughs> All characters present in the target area lose one rouge and one noir. Yeah, uh, <laughs> poor role model. Song of the song of revenge never ends. Horrifying smile. Yeah, there's some combos that you can do. Like everyone hates the night beast. Just remember that. Renown are pretty much bonus abilities that you can have. This is what you're supposed to do. Your exemplum is pretty much what exemplifies you. So, for example, uh, Chippy here. Chippy has passion and he's flame. When war is inflicted upon you by actions, you gain one rouge towards yourself. When you gain rouge to an effect other than the above, you take one noir towards yourself. Pretty much, Chippy hates himself. Chippy loves himself so much that he hates it when other people love him. And that's also kind of plays into some of these other ones, such as Laurel Ree. Character of your choice in the same area you make an action check, they may raise their lower lowest die by one point. That's some of them are pretty simple, other of them are pretty big and are pretty important. But it's like I wanna work this. Um For all the options here, and there are a lot of options, don't get me wrong. You get all these, you know, all the reaction tables, and all right, well, don't forget about all the the Dracul sections. I'm gonna tell you exactly how to make them uh, because everyone gets an action value, this particular one, and the idea is that they get a certain number of points more than anything, just to spend rather than having to roll or anything. That's kind of the odd bit. Uh, I'm not, I'm gonna say, this is almost secondary to the actual, like, making the game part, that makes sense. Because the entire idea is you, they get actions and presence points. So it's like, okay, you have to divide those actions among, those amount of action points among all the characters in the area. Final act, we better use number of PCs times 10. And sometimes they can use more, sometimes they don't have to use more. It's... How do I want to word this? Hmm. Let's... Okay, here's like some here's some kind of example options for each individual characters and such. But, um... Here's the thing with, uh, dra with, uh, Chuni Vampires. Here's the thing. Chuni Vampires is good. I like Chuni Vampires. There's one problem with Chuni Vampires. One singular beautiful problem. If you are not invested in this idea, if you are trying to think that this is like a regular game, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to have a really bad time. If you think this is anything more than a play, if you kind of take your mind out of it, close your eyes for a moment, say, this is a dramatic play that we're doing together. We are gonna make this thing work together. And it's, you don't take... In other words, BK suck next. More along the lines of, you can't say, uh, I'm going to use in your arms tonight. Uh, I mean, yeah, okay, I'm going to use your in your arms, uh, remove one uh, noir, and uh, then I'm going to use, um, I think I have enough points for this one, and 
that happens. You can't do that. No, 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 no. That ain't how it works. Because if you do do that, the game falls apart at the seams. Because you realize that your characters aren't actually that interesting. Actually, no, I take that back. Your characters are interesting. But it's like, you don't have things like health or and you don't have health, you don't have attributes, you don't have anything like that to kind of separate yourself. Mechanically speaking, you have, I am this person of house, this person of this bloodline of this path. All of these things together is what makes my character unique, but at the end of the day, it's going to be like increase rouge, decrease, it's going to be increase value X, decrease value Y, do thing, summon thing. That's a majority of what you're going to be doing. It's not like something, for example, say as um, Kamagakari. Kamagakari, you can quite literally close your eyes and not even give a fuck about the setting or anything going on there. You could quite literally play that entire game, pure mechanics, nothing else. Because it's a game about moving between places, finding the right opportunity of like looking at your abilities, being like, okay, if I do this, if I roll this, I can use this dice here and I can make these big attacks here. Or it's not also like things like story game, like more hardcore story games where it's the idea of like you have kind of these infinite number of options to do things with. Chuni Vampires does really need you to be a Chuni Vampire, and that Chuni Vampire needs to want to do things, and when you get hit by something, when you get hit by an attack that does too noir toward yourself, you, you know, actually it would be too noir toward that character, it's not, you can't say, oh, I, um... To noir, all right. Uh, it's got it. You gotta be like, ooh, as the blade strikes my chest, the the blood in my body boils with hatred toward you. I feel nothing but a rage in my heart, as I wish nothing more than to rip your skull from your shoulders. You need to be in it. You need to fully embrace it. This is probably one of Ryu's uh, second. I would say. This is one of Ryu's more thematic games. However, like, of all his games, of all his games, uh, uh, this is going to be my uh, contentious opinion with, uh, with Notepad. Um, <laughs> S-T- okay, I'm going to say S-tier. Uh, it's going to be Necronica slash Golden Sky Stories. Because Necronica, allow, like, has a very strong mechanical foundation. And it also sells you exactly what's going on. I also like Golden Sky Stories for the exact same reason. Everything is very thematic and everything makes sense together. You are in a very happy little thing together. Actually, not even S tier. I would say... I would say these two are pretty much equal to each other, in my opinion, anyway. Um, Maid is down here. I don't... I'm not a fan of Maid, personally. I, I, I don't like... Maid never really sung to me, to be honest. I understand why people like it. It's just... It was fun. It's fun, but not, like, mechanic fun. Uh, let me... I would put, like... Dracu Scooge, like, right... Right here. Like, I, I I like it more than Made. I don't like it as much as Necronica or Golden Sky Stories. Simply because you don't have those options that I like. And you don't have those, like... It's thematics is fun, I, but I would want more options. I want a little bit more leeway in both directions that the game doesn't really provide. You're going to play by the game systems, and if you don't want to play by the game systems, you're going to get your shit rocked. So, that is uh, Chuni Vampires. It's a, it's fun. 
I think it's a good idea. So, but we're not done yet. We are far from done, my friends. Uh, we'll save you. Uh, I need to click on all the right things here real fast. We're going to click you. We need to open up the right notepad document again. And we are going to do... Oh, all right. See, now we get to do the little games. Those were all the big ones. The big spooky ones that were going to be weird. Uh, we're done with the spooky games now. We're done with the big ones. These are all kind of odd ducks that I've found. This is Zombie Line. What is Zombie Line, you may ask? Well, Zombie Line is exactly what it says right here. A base defense TRPG. Notepad, what the fuck does that mean? Well, <laughs> good news, everybody. I don't quite know either. So. <laughs> I, for some reason, I, for some reason, know about that one, and I'm sad I do. So. One second. This is it's the bright person. Uh. Yes, I believe this is. This is the writer of Zombie Line. I believe, anyway. It's kind of hard to tell, because Zombie Line is an, unof it's an unofficial translation, of course. It's very unofficial. Very, very unofficial. Uh, and it's kind of an odd duck in more than a few ways. Just because there's a lot of stuff behind it and I uh you know, let, let's actually do a little bit of kind of see actually there's some vague I would say vaguely necronica esque art. Uh let's do zombie line TRPG. Let me if I can find it again. <laughs> Broken line, that's not it. Uh Japanese Nope. <laughs> yeah, it's uh they work for this or at least are part of this group. This is a tabletop collective. Zombie line right here. And go here. Game market J JP. This is the cover of Zombie Line. This is the official cover of Zombie Line. And technically, they say the price is 1,000 yen. How much is 1,000 yen? No, pound. let's do a little bit. Let's do a look. How much is 1,000 yen? A thousand yen is nine dollars. It's nine bucks. All right, Pie Manly. Yes, uh, this game is fairly um light, and it is quite literally a zombie def tower defense game. You can kind of see some of the locations, and it's a little bit hard to read on this particular one just because it's in Japanese and the actual PDF doesn't have any of the artwork or anything like that. But, yeah, it's a base defense game. You literally get a, like in a, a house or something on a grid and you defend it. You set up traps, you set up barricades, you do everything. You know, PDF with full, oh, let's... Let's let's go on a magic adventure, everybody. Here it is. Here's Zombie Line, the game. I, I didn't see this last time. Let's let's save as. Let, I'm saving live on stream. Let's fucking do it. Hopefully, that's just enough. That's enough of the artwork to kind of explain what's going on. Uh, all the all the sample stuff. Yeah. Uh, they have... Let me see if I can find their other stuff that they've done. They've done a few... Bits and pieces. Okay, here's some of the other games that they've done. Which, surprisingly, which kind of baffled my... Yeah, no, it's, uh... I do have the fan translation, that's what I have. Uh... These are the guys who supposedly also did Summon Skate, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. They have a few other games in here that I'm like, oh, that's odd. Unrealistic Escape, Dungeon RPG, Summon Skate, Nylanthrope Werewolf. 
uh, Soul Keeper. Like, okay, like this one is uh, unrealistic escape game. It's an escape room game. You want to play an escape room game? <laughs> or this one? I don't know what the fuck's going on here, but you can play it. Well, let, let's let's see. Let's translate to English. Like, what what's this game about? Learning points. So, order to a hundred people. Creating character, choosing actions, exploring through ideas in one hour. Dungeon RPG with everyone. <laughs> with everyone. <laughs> uh, these guys are what I would like to call artists. I think these uh, these guys make some really weird games as more of a proof of concept more than anything. I couldn't really find anything else on it. Like, it's uh, very Japanese. I've heard of none of these games. Only Summonscape was the only one I had ever heard of. Which, after kind of learning about it, it's like, yeah, okay, this makes complete sense of why this is made, because these guys are fucking weirdos who, yeah, like right here. These guys are just fucking weirdos who publish anything. Or who just like, let's make something weird that no one has ever done before. It's like, yes. I'm I'm completely in. What, what, what's this game? Let's see. Techno B. Dungeon RPG. Get Dungeon RPG. Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, research introduction. Download up. Play the free RPG. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is an introduction. To, uh, this is a TRPG about playing other RPGs. Yeah, these guys are um, fascinating. But yeah, this is the main writer. You can kind of see some of the stuff that they that they're interested in. There's Sheena Bagami actually, and there's Zombie Line. Yeah, that's a uh, that's them. Nothing more I can really say on the matter, simply because they are. Um, it's exactly what you think it is. Let me, let me, um, obviously this isn't Japanese, so I can't really do anything here. <laughs> but I'm assuming this is kind of like what they were using, like the basis. But yes, here is the game. So what is this game actually like about? Well, <laughs> this is a game about doing things so pretty much you in modern Japan it's in like oh no there's zombies here that's really all you need to need to know about um, they're going to kind of go over like there are no really guns in Japan just because it's very difficult to get you know get guns and this is exactly what they do countermeasures wear long sleeve clothing and gotta create a character. How do we create a character? Randomized. Everything is randomized. Maybe easily off. Like one good hit can actually kill you in this game pretty damn easily. Uh, skills you've acquired. Morale. Oh no. Clothes. Actions. The means of attack. So yeah, there's literally 100 different options that you have. Um, <laughs> you wanna, you wanna play all of the. Play various students? You can. Nothing's gonna stop you. You roll twice on the personality table. And uh, if you're if you're me, you roll atrociously on the, <laughs> on these tags, and you end up with Ito. Ito is my sample character. Ito is four nine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this kid is a uh, 4'9". He is literally a manlet. And he, he's part of the Kyoto Club. This is literally the entirety of your character. And this is all you're really going to be doing. So. You know, child, adolescent, youth, body type, average weight of the Japanese population. Yeah, there's an average height and weight chart. Because that's important. I'm assuming... Yeah, here's all the options right here, all the various tables. Here's the averages, you can kind of see this. I think this is all like a direct translation. 
and our various combat skills. Yeah, because there's combat skills in this game, but not very many, and they kind of want you to randomize them. Because at the end of the day, you're going to end up with about four, you're going to end up with about five skills. Two of them are, one of them is going to be chosen by your background. One of them is going to be chosen by you. Uh, then you're, actually, most of them are going to choose them by you, but then you have to roll for two of them. So, these are things like maintenance, plus one maximum tracks can be installed at the base. All right. Uh, strategy, when you determine an issue, start around. Roll D100, choose once. Patience, once per scenario, you can patience in your turn to suppress stress symptoms in combat. Use bow weapons. Martial arts, you can use the takedown attack. Okay, because this is a D100 system. Yes, this is a full-on D100 system, and you're going to enjoy it. There's also things like treatment and research and do stress yeah you're gonna get a lot of skills in this particular game and those lot of skills are kind of set up in a weird way and it's i can kind of go over i'm gonna go over this one the best i can it's more of a broad overview simply because this one's a kind of a weird one, and I'm not a huge fan of it. Maybe it's just a translation, maybe it's just, um... Well, there's a bunch of different reasons what might occur here. Well, one of the big things is that since everything is D100, instead of being like a traditional, like, you get stats and stuff like that, everything has like a basic attack attack check or something with it. You already, You always know what you're going to be rolling in every situation, effectively. So let's say, for example, I have a blunt weapon. I just have a bat or something. So I'm going to roll my D100, and I rolled an 11, so I hit them with my blunt weapon. That's it. That's the system. Not really like a do, th like get an action or something like that. Not really. Most of this comes down to things like being prone, being bound, having being injured. If you're infected, or you have a blade weapon... Or it's like how much AP you use because there's an attack, there's an action point system, pretty standard action point system, nothing too exciting in that regard. Now, it's um, oh boy, bolas get ranges like bolas. You know, you got shooting and archery and firearms, and even going through here, it's. Jesus, there's a lot. Because this isn't really the main set of the game. So get some of these. Because if you notice, there's this. You get something called supply. Supply is kind of like this a abstracted concept that you can spend supplies to get things. Spend one supplies, get a new change of clothes. Spend one supplies, get a mask. Spend two supplies, get a radio. You know? Reduce stress. <laughs> Playing game, reduce your stress by one. There's a 10% chance you get bored of the game and fail to reduce your stress. Cool. More fen, you know, or, you know, 9mm bullets. A famous brand of sake or something like that. Base living. Because the entire idea is that you have your base. It's a place to live and defend. And you get food... This is where things get... You have food, you have water, you have electricity, you have supplies and electricity. Your food, food is good because you can eat food. And if you, every day, everyone needs to eat food. If you don't, you become hungry. If you that, you become sick. However, if you fail to get food, you instead get unprocessed with it. Which is, you roll a D100, find if it's raw, suspicious, or dangerous. Don't eat that. Drinking water is the same way. Uh, you know, or hey, supplies, it's just your junk, it's just stuff you have. Uh, same with electricity. However, electricity is also weird because it's like, oh, well, everyone always, you already have electricity. Because solar panels. Like, it's like, oh, that's fine, I guess. Alright. So, <laughs> spend more time exploring the morning when enemies are less active. The entire thing is that you have to explore. Congratulations. You choose one of the following. You make an exploration check. And you gain one living resource. Good. You, you fail. Oh, no. You get some unprocessed stuff. Mm -hmm. 
or you can get some more. You know, we gotta get our management sheet because the big part of this game is this. Yep, this is you are kind of shacking up in a location and you're gonna try to survive it. And you have things like stairs, you have what's illuminated, what's not illuminated, and sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller. It's a base defense game. It's not fucking with you when it says it is a base defense game. And you can force supplies contain something you need for each unit of supplies. You can save for something that costs less than 10,000 yen. How to read the base sheet. So it's... Because every part of the base is also... I wonder if I can find like a good diagram. We have a good diagram of the base at all? No, we don't. Here. So, let's say for example, this location right here. Every single part of this this particular base is going to be composed of different things. And you may be able to build like platforms here to be able to get up higher or destroy staircases to do that. And every single place is a little bit different. And oh my god, who the fuck cares? <laughs> yeah, it's um a little bit hardcore because it wants it the thing is it wants you to understand that you are playing a base defense game but also an rpg yeah and you have three time periods during the day start of the day morning day and night don't forget because if you don't take the lookout action bad things are going to happen you might get raided and if you don't take the lookout action and get raided you're fucked but also it's like Base without proper entrances, the exit take twice as long to explore. Just climb out a window and rope to leave. The number of traps is the maximum. More traps than its max takes twice as long to exit and explore. Base takes twice as long to explore the outside. It's like, oh my god. It's like, all right, let's 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 do this. Let's. Because the entire idea is that you're exploring, you're looking out at things trying to rest, you're trying to defend things when a battle occurs, you're cleaning things, because anytime someone dies, it's sometimes, pretty much anytime someone dies or they kind of invade an area, it becomes dirty. You need to clean the dirty tag, but you also need to succeed at a housework check. If you don't have the right skill for it, there's a chance you're going to fail it. Then you don't clean anything, and if you're in there, you're stressing creatures, which is bad. That's things like mental care and survey and other actions. And then you have all the facilities. Don't forget about the facilities, which you need to put into your base. Remember, these these things up here are actually important. It's things like, yes, we have our solar panels at the top of the, you know, at the school building. Yes, we do have you know some like basic little gardens and we have a basic thing up there. It's like, here's some workshops, here's a factory, and you need 20 supplies and electric power, don't have that, you're fucked. Or, it's like a kitchen, it's a laboratory, a solar panel, it's a depot, it's movement, it's ladders, it's stairs, it's baths, it's garages, it's infirmaries, it's ah! So what's, uh, what, what, what's going on? Pad, no pad. What's up? What's what's going on? What's come on? Tell me. Yeah, this one's a little bit um Yeah, it's a gimmick. It's very much a gimmick. I think a little bit more than most games. Cause here's the thing. If you were to pitch to me that this is a board game, like just a legit board game, I think I would be pretty down with it. Like, okay. Everybody, you know, everyone gets around being just like, okay, here's our base that we have to defend. You could even put in like a tile, like tiles or something, so you can spell like expansions. You just get more tiles, put all the tiles around. And it's like, okay, I'm here. And it's like, okay, I have three people under me. You have three, three. And it's like, you, you got little character cards and stuff. And it's like, well, uh, Ito here, like my, my little sample character, Ito, is, you know, he is an archer. He's really good at combat. Uh, but he maybe has like a four, three up on combat and a four up on exploring, but only a five up on mental care. He gets really stressed out easily. 
And so it's kind of like, I need to, like, I need to assign things to him. But if he does something, he's going to gain stress. So it's like, okay, what am I, what am I choosing to not stress out about? What am I trying to not stress out here? What am I doing here? And it's kind of like this mutual, like, assistance game where everyone's working together to try to survive. Which, unfortunately, I remembered, that is also, um, what is that game? It is a zombie board game. I remember that. It is a zombie board game. Uh, uh, Dead of Winter? I believe that was what it was called. I realized that I wanted to play Dead of Winter again more than anything. I wanted to play this, then I wanted to actually play, like, this particular game. And it's like, alright, like, I understand, like, what's the appeal? And I think this was, again, I think this was more of a, I want to do something new. I want to try something that I've never seen before. So it's like, yeah, well, let's create checks. We've got to make the crafting check. And oh, here's how you make all the crafting checks. Because, again, we don't have stats or anything. So it's like, oh, okay. And sometimes you need manufacturing. And sometimes you need this. And it's like, oh. Ooh. Cool. And that's that's really all I can really say. And like, this is a cool idea, but I'm also not really. Um, how do I word this to be nice? I'm not really in. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not in. Uh, I like. I think there's a lot of cool ideas here. But I think a lot of those cool ideas always have, like, this, this butt moment in. It's like, yeah, you can build onto your base, and you can build new things with, like, pillars and stuff. But it's like, but why? I, oh. It's like that, there's a lot of time and resources that go into it, and it's like, oh, well, that's not really, not really in it as much as I was hoping. Like, that's fine, I guess. Like, you want to build some facilities? Here, here's how you do it. You gotta get, like, a room or something. But this is where things get weird. So... We can prepare for the next session. If you report your survival on SNS, you will receive supplies. Alright? You're stronger than one its original state. Was long. Okay, alternate realities? Alright, campaigns. Now you want to do, like, a campaign. Evacuate to a safe zone. Sees everyone leaves the base. Participants which the game be played many times as desired until the story comes to an end. Because there is also one mechanic which I think is like just comes out of fucking nowhere. And I'm assuming this has something to do with like like a Japanese thing. Like I'm assuming this is like a Japanese thing. So, stress drops to zero. So if you roll a 10 on when you get overstressed, you become a teacher and create a prop propagate a doctrine. The effect continues until the next symptom appears. You find truth in the zombie-filled world. You become a teacher. And he's like, wait a second. wonder where is the... Um... There is a section in here I need to find, which I thought was very fascinating. Because there is a victory condition in this game. Yes, there are victory conditions. Uh, oh, wait, yeah, it's, it's the endings. So, yeah, there is, um, like, a victory condition system in this game that you can, like, try to aim for a victory condition. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, if the ending conditions are met, you proceed toward the ending, which continue basically when they postpone the ending. Uh, where is the fucking ending system? Because pretty much, like, <laughs> boy, it's cult, and that's what it is. Where the fuck is the cult ending? Okay, yeah. Players aim for ending by uncovering the truth, escaping to a safe zone, becoming self-sufficient, or establishing a cult. 
yeah, for some re yeah, here's the endings. Probability ending. Probability of, you know, reach an ending with a probability of 1% 1, 1 to 100%. Timed end. Uh, maintain status quo with all living resources at, at infinite. Cult end. Everyone at the base becomes a disciple or a teacher. Like, <laughs> for some reason, like, this is... Uh, th there is this. Li there's literally like a cult ending to this game that I'm like, what the fuck? But the weirdest thing about this entire thing is right here. This is the thing that like, <laughs> what the fuck? Write and post on SNS the hashtag zombie line or hashtag release supplies hashtag. GM approval and amount of supplies equal to the number of likes and l hearts you get. We spent on your base before next session. Don't have any needs any supplies. Simply use hashtag zombie line hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> you can post on Twitter to get bonus supplies if you want to. <laughs> I don't know why this is a thing. I just think it's funny. I think it's, it's something that you just kind of look at and you're like, this is a thing that exists. But uh, yeah, that's Zombie Line. Fascinating little, uh, a fascinating little thing more than anything. Not necessarily like a, oh boy, but more like a, oh, cool, I, I guess. Like, uh, it's, that's all you can really say about it. Oh, fuck, it's this one. All right, so, um, all right, so we have a special game up next. Um, he had a special one up next. So, it is kind of, it. If you go under the assumption that that entire group's concept, that entire group's idea is to just make weird one-off games or to just talk about, like, let's talk about some RPGs in general, then it's like, yeah. Okay, so, this next one. This next one is weird. I'm gonna need him here. And I need him here for a very special reason. This... This is Crisis Heroin. What is Crisis Heroin, I hear you asked. Well, everybody. <laughs> it's the Japanese tabletop roleplay again. Adult-themed, wicked, viewable by people over 18. Right? It's legal for you to view this in your nation. Do not go past this page. Uh, I believe we actually have, like, one of the translators here, actually. St. Mobius. Weren't you, like, a part of this? Or at least you knew the translator. I believe so. This is the reason why I even know this was because of uh, you, I believe. But yeah, this is Crisis Heroin. I <laughs> translate it. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. This is the site host, by the way. Yeah, this is Crisis Heroin. So, um... <laughs> okay, give me one second. I need to remember, um... Okay. Innocent Doge, I need you to be, like, this big real fast, just to block out the entire screen. As I, like, okay, this is the, okay, this is the one. Oh. How, how am I gonna, just we gotta go down a little bit, okay, yeah, let's go. Come on, oh god. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, I, <laughs> yeah, like, we're just gonna leave him, like, right there. <laughs> uh... Actually, I, I no, that's that's bad. That's a, that's a that's a no. -no. So this is Crisis Heroin. Crisis Heroin is a porn game. Uh, <laughs> not gonna lie, not gonna not. I'm not gonna beat around the bush at all. This game is a porn game. And yeah, you know, around mid 1990 when the increased rapidly, their so-called ba you know battle-based girl cartoons at the same time instead of transformation heroin, magical or insult. Postponed the Dojoni, Eroge, and Erotic anime, etc. Landlord labeled 2D dream novels without light novels. No such work for the numerator. Effectively, this is a game based off of Magical Girl Hentai. <laughs> yeah, this is based off of Magical Girl Hentai. Um, specifically, a very specific thing. Now, the interesting line is right here. The thing that I was actually, when I first saw it, I was actually kind of interested. Right here. 2chan table, 
table gedge, I think table bay, you know, two chan table based board game original TRPG production synthesis thread, fourteen thread five oh three. This, my friends, was a literal 2chan RPG that I'm assuming a bunch of shit posters like us decided to make one day because they fucking could. Uh, the... <laughs> Good save, Mr. Doge! Good save, Doge! <laughs> Right, there we go. We'll keep you right here. Now, our 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 man here is a is, it is a two chan RPG. Like it, it's pretty um, it's pretty much said like it's a two two chan RPG. Uh, heroin crisis. It's crisis heroin or heroin or it's crisis heroin or heroin crisis. It kind of goes both ways, and it is very. Odd. I did a little bit of digging on this guy. I did. I tried to find as much as I could, and the most I could find was this. This is Fifteenth Moon. This is at least the the guys who claim to have written it in some capacity, and these guys are pretty old. Uh, they don't really talk about it at all. It's it's things like Super Robot Tyson Imitator like like list of participants. It's like this is a it's pretty much a group of guys who probably get together to play rather than anything like hardcore. I don't think this is like a company or anything. Yeah, last updated two thousand nine. This is over you know a decade old at this point. And they were like, yeah, let's chill our, our, our IRC and. Yeah, it's a steel sa you know, steel salvation metal saver, Ma Steel Shell Giga Demon Tetsukutsi Dynastar. A lot of these are very small. Like, I'm not really seeing anything like big after World War Three, uh let's see, like pfft, that's not that's not a real fucking file. <laughs> Like battle tech, yeah, combat mecha, you know, full metal panic, you know, it's like pfft. Captain Tsubasa wrote it 2002. Yeah, it's a uh, they um couldn't really find much on these guys, being being perfectly frank. Um, most of the guys that I can find are things from like S these like these kind of sites where it's like. The SRC official website is this, the Simulation Art RPG Construction, which I'm, this looks like a fan site more than anything, which is more like a yeah, RPG self-made tool for Windows. Apparently they have connections there. Um, leads right back to 15th Moon. Um, then we have this one, which is like, oh, Arasaka Internet. The rental server that they have here, you know, scenarios for SR, like they pretty much deal with these guys. I think I don't fucking know. Like this is this is ancient shit. Like, <laughs> like yeah, no, it's like all of this stuff is. It's 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 vaporware. It's kind of going the way of the dodo, and you can kind of even tell like most of this stuff is like really old websites. I think most of these things are older than 2009. I, I think a lot of these are older than 2009. It's these are pr most likely much older, much not as um uh, yeah. From what I could gather about Heroin Crisis, kind of the extent of what I could find was that it spawned in about 2004. Yeah, this is about 2004, 2005 is when it was like first mentioned 
with an update like later in like 2000 like 2007 as like heroin crisis advanced what's the version we're going to be looking at no fucking clue i can genuinely tell you i do not know actually uh, 2005 classic and 2008 is when it was uh, formally updated it's, uh, i'm assuming it's the 2008 version i'm just i can just make an assumption like yeah, there are various R of this lightweight, easy to learn play system. Yeah, like. Yeah, this is. It's, it's a little bit of a rabbit hole. At all insert. Yeah, here, give me one second. If you. Uh. Like, the problem with 2chan, like, currently what's going on is 2chan is currently divided into, like, three fucking camps or something like that. Because on one hand, you have 2chan. 2channel is owned by Hiroshi Moot now. But 2channel is a scraped version of the original 2chan. 2chan is now 5chan. 5chan got scraped, which 5chan is the evolution of the original 2chan, which was bought by a guy, another guy because there was legal issues. Because Hiroshi Mood owned the website. He owned the servers of the website. And the Japanese court effectively ruled like, yeah, he owns the website. Of course he does because he owns the server the website's on. So he can do whatever the fuck he wants, but you own the copyright to 2chan. So it got, got really messy. And now there's also Futuba-chan. And all of these kind of... Oh, wait a second. Did you... Did you... Mid-update. You know, mid there we go. Mid-update, everybody. You saw it right here, folks. This is, the, this is the benefit of knowing people. Ah, oh, sorry. Like, I'm I'm assuming that this was... Chan sites make bank. Uh, 2chan was actually the most visited website in... Most visited... One of the most visited websites in Japan. Like, social media websites in Japan, by far. It was one of the most viewed for a very long time. I don't think it, like... And they actually ran ads on 2chan pretty actively. 4chan was weird because... Because Moot didn't. Well, 2chan is... Well, 2chan is actually a lot. Let me let me see if I can find... Uh, well, actually, the 2channel. This is the official 2channel. So, 2channel.net. Uh, let's see, Femi Heart Plants find it rice. Yeah, no, it's important. No, that, no, we're back to 5 channel now. We don't want 5 channel. We want, um, t t f Tuba. Can we do Tuba? Tuba channel? Gotta go here. And it's 2chan.net links directly to Fatuba chan. This is, this is what it looks like. And, um, <laughs> This is what shit's like on Fatuba Chan. Um, we'll we'll look at something. Um, yep, fortune telling. Let's go to fortune telling real fast. <laughs> Across the world, <laughs> no matter where we go, he's always here. Yeah, like it's it's shit like fortune telling. And it. Pff, let me see. If, uh, all alive can't get the insects. Is this gonna be insects? <laughs> I'm looking at bugs. I'm looking at bugs on two chan. Like two, four chan is actually like fairly regimented compared to two chan. Like, God, so. <laughs> Like, 2chan is, like, very much a, this is a social media site, like, more than anything. 
Like, Hollow Live, you want Hollow Live shit? Here it is. It's, they're just like us. Uh, let, let, let's see some other ones. Um, Tokatsu. Toku. Yeah, just Toku shit. Like, yeah, because they actually they have things like military math. You want to do the math channel? Uh, let me see if I can't find oh, movies, robos, self-made PCs, 2D, parenting. <laughs> you want to go to the parenting channel? <laughs> Why is there? We have parenting. Have no fear. It's here. Right, right there. For God and the whole world, here's Futuba Chan's parenting one. Here's the math one. Like, <laughs> Futuba Chan is a lot more chaotic in a way. Uh, because it was a social media site. Like, that's the big thing with, like, 2Channel and Fatuba Chan and all that. Is they were social media sites. They were things that people would hop on. They would say, uh, how, do, how the fuck do I raise my kid properly? I'm a fucking dumbass. Completely anonymous. Before things like Facebook. Before things like a Twitter or anything like that. You gotta remember, like, this was back in the way back. This was early 2000s tier shit. Even probably earlier, too. Like, so when it's like, ah, oh, that's funny. I mean, like, that was what you had. Anonymous board that you that you could, you could ask people that you didn't, that you were a stupid fucking parent and didn't know what the hell you were doing. Or you can try to be a good human being and not. <laughs> you know, pretend you know what you're doing. Uh, but this does lead me, though. We are, we are here. This is a... This is the 2chan game. Uh, so, what's the world like? Um, well, uh, world setting, pretty simple. Uh, there was, there's heaven, there's uh, heaven, hell, and earth. Uh, heaven declared war on hell, hell lost, and they had the flee to earth. However, uh, God was like, well, we kind of fucked up, so uh, they gave a few humans magic. The problem is, demons... Uh, they they absorb their life force and uh, and uh, and and impregnate them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh. You get these girls don't have a shred of knowledge how to use magic. To, uh, give them a catalyst. Catalyst key to use magic. Multi shape magic the way they can be best. Pretty much, you are a bunch of dumbass magical girls with zero information of what the fuck you're doing. Uh, even smaller number of heroines are not enough to stop them alone. Teams succeed in attacking mankind, absorbing human essence, the humans to the cause, impregnating human females, and little by little, re re reviving their former glory, or revving to their former glory. Uh, among these victims are even heroines who fell in battle. Uh, one of the pretty evil... This is, yeah, they're trained to fight evil, investigate demonic activity, dispatch heroines with location of discovery. To support heroines in battle. Uh, yeah... All the cartels, they're pr yeah, they're called cartels. Like, yeah. So what is um? Pff, fuck. How do we even fucking do this? Uh, I've I've looked a little bit too deeply into the system at this point. I I know, I know enough to be dangerous at this point, and I don't want to be dangerous. Uh, but I do know it. However, um. So I'm gonna bring up our character sheet here. Uh, my my little thing I have here is just oh god, what the fuck, crisis heroin. No, I have no name on this simply because it is painful for me to even consider. So we need to roll on our features table. What's our features table? Well, this is how you actually make a character. You roll on you roll on this chart and you determine who you are. It's a d66 check. Let's roll. I rolled a 5 and a 2. So, for example, with a 5 and a 2, I roll 25, effectively. I'm an athletic student. I'd have one in my body, two in my agility. All right. And then we have to start doing physical features, which are, thi which are things such as strange and mystical, like an albino, or petite, tickly, not short but slender, tiny breasts, short hair, small chest, androgynous, ordinary standard type, uh, 
tall and stylish, oversized breasts, beauty and center of attention, voluptuous, childbearing hips. Yeah, the Crisis Act section is fucking nuts. And the way it's handled is also fucking nuts. Personality features. Adult-like charm. Laid-back boyish demeanor. Hot-blooded tomboy action. Competitive and stubborn. Optimist who never quit smiling. Bright, spirited, sociable. Seems normal. Secretly lewd. <laughs> but yeah, no, this is... This is how you make a character. You don't assign stats really at all. You more roll in the features table and pray. You pretty much add two two stat points. Minimum, you have to have one and maximum of six. If you any of your features put you above seven, you do not need to redistribute. That is incredibly rare, and that's like if you roll exclusively like magic or something. Like you have to get very, very um, specific. So this is uh, our sample, our sample girl. That I don't even have a name for her again. Like she just because I was like this is horrifying. Um, I rolled this all, by the way. Just remember that. Like, for example, I have a body of four, magic of five, intelligence one, agility two. Like, roughly speaking, like, three should be the average, but, eh. And pretty much everyone only has conjuration or evocation magic. I, you know, our initiative value is three, and you have your basic personality traits. Like, all right, this is, this is fine. So, we distribute that, and our attributes, conjuration, evocation... And evocation is your ability to use magic and your ability to materialize magic. Conjuration is money. And then we need to choose spells. Spells are our thing to actually do things with. So, for example, our constant spell. These aren't, half of these are not spells. They're like more like passive abilities more than anything. So think of these are... Are, um... Like, thing, for example, this is a constant spell of attacker. Increase damage of weapons by one. Can be taken up to three times speed start. Gain plus two initiative. Strong heart. Gain eight HP. Mind suit. Critical hit. Okay. Then it's like auxiliary spells. Increase damage of melee shooting attack by 1d6. Burning hit. Icicle hit. Lightning hit. Magic ruins. Then you split. So change target of a sorcery to single to an area. Like, some of these are actually pretty... Like, there are some clearly, like, some magic abilities, but, like, majority of the time, treat these more as, like, what we would call, like, a perk system or something. Like, for example, Luminous Ray. You spend three mana, and it has range. It's target single. Perform a sorcery attack. Damage is 2d6 plus magic. The attack has the light element. That's what a majority of these things actually are. Like, a majority of, like, these rays, like, one, two, three, four... Like, these four, like, these four abilities right here are the exact same. Nothing is different, except the element. Or it's, like, all the enhancements and, like, reaction spells. For some reason... There's a... It, it looks math. It looks very mathy, but also not mathy. It's a lot of... Give me one second. I'm going to rest my coffee. I think the best way to do it is there's a lot of things to keep track of, but here's the also the catch. Um, there's a lot of guaranteed action in this game. There is an absurd amount of guaranteed action because you see these reaction spells. These are the only way to actually defend yourself. So, for example, I picked on our girl. I picked um, shield. So reduce damage by the user's magic. So. For 3 MP, I can use it to reduce damage. If you do not take any reaction spell here, you can't defend yourself. You literally don't. Normally, it's going to be 2d6, and that's how much damage you're going to take. And it's like, oh, oh shit. So it's like, all right, so that could be a little bit stronger. But like, honest to God, if you if if it was just this... I'd be like, that's kind of weird, but all right. I can kind of, I can get behind it, you know, or it's like, oh, opening spells, like top speed, you, right? When the battle begins, you increase your agility, you, you know, increase, you know, flight, like all oh, these are the same fucking. Or you can break traps because traps are like a big part of fights, anti-traps or just guts. Plus one D6. It's like, all right, like this is a, all right. Um... 
Now we get crisis ability. What's a crisis ability? You can kind of say that a crisis ability is your uh, trump card. You get to spend crisis points. Crisis points you get from crisis abilities. And some of these are things like, for example, saving grace. Declare any roll. The target re-rolls the dice for one crisis point. Resolution. After succeeding on a corruption roll after being defeated, you rise from the defeated state at half HP 3 corruption. Uh, invincible. Ignore one attack. You may also ignore any accompanying features like a bad status. Increase your melee attack by damage by 8d6. Final shot. 8d6. Sorcery. 8d6. Uh, resurrection. Uh, get re you gain all HP and MP. Restore you from defeat. AP is not restored though. Like, oh, fuck. Like, it's... Last shot. You know, increase a shooting attack roll... By 20 D6. <laughs> 12 crisis points for literally rolling 20 D6s on an attack. That's actually it'd be 22 D6s on an attack. That's fucking nuts. But, but uh, I can see all your hands raised in the air. Notepad. Notepad. How do I gain crisis points? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, give me one moment. I'm going to go to the bathroom for a second. Uh, and I will tell you how we gain crisis points in a second. And we're all going to have to suffer together. Just remember that, everybody. Because I hate all of you. All of you. Everybody. All right, so um, then we have equipment. Equipment is pretty standard, and the entire idea is you choose what you want. You pretty much have to pay the cost of how much conjuration you have. And a lot of these things are pretty standard, you know. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's say, for example, we have a gun or something. It could be, you know, four, or we have a can for more source, better sorcery rolls, or, you know, major weapons. EM weapons, we have a sword. Sword. And our armor. So, let's, you know, cute robes. Cost one. Thoroughly decorated. Magical girl style. Kenochi suit. Cool. Armor suit. Sword dancer dress. Uh, maybe noticing chest AP, waist AP... Uh, notepad. Well, <laughs> the issue is that what happens is there's actually an armor system in this game. When you get hit by an attack, you you roll and be like, oh no, I got, I got hit for eight damage. And then you kind of get applied to whatever your damage is. So let's say, for example, we're wearing leotard armor and we get hit in the waist, 20 damage. Actually, for 8 damage, we'd reduce it down to 12. That's pretty much it. So some of these are actually, like, even among so-called Bishoja fighting type fighting clothes, these are relatively little exposure, high-ranking battlesuit, luxurious decorations and defense. Uh, easy to move in, 
you get bonuses to avoid. Here's some armor law. Don't forget, we also get accessories. What's this direct hit value? What's this direct hit value? Well, when they roll and they hit you dead on, they ignore your armor and directly hit you. It's just a little dink in the armor. That's all it is. And yeah, this is the equipment section. And... Oh, okay, our derived attributes. So, <laughs> okay. Hit points, pretty standard. Mind points, okay. Crisis points. Eh. Initiative. Sex points. Characters begin with zero. But as they are violated and lose their purity, this number rises to reflect the increasingly lewd nature. Stats split into chest, waist, ass, mouth, pain, and spirit. Uh, references to SP, for the total SP. Uh, since corruption checks are, uh, upon reaching zero P are made versus your total SP, greater SP results in greater risk of permanently falling to darkness. <laughs> what are those crisis points? <laughs> okay, now we get to do the crisis point section. All right. So, first things first. Twitch. As someone, as a as an affiliated streamer, what I am doing is simply showing others of what this is. This is not my own work. I am simply informing others of what this is. YouTube, I am also informing. This is an informative piece of work as a review-esque narrative. I want to show people something interesting, and this is what I need to show. If you, if you ignore this section, something is lost. So, now we've got that out of the way. For those of you who are faint of heart... This is the Crisis Act system. You choose 10 Crisis Acts. What do Crisis Acts do, though? Well, they are triggered effects. I think that's the best way to kind of word it. And what happens is, you know, ten to, well, you can use up to 7 Crisis Acts per 7. Each Crisis Act can only use once per session. So pretty much when something happens, you can only use it once. So out of your 10, you can use 7 of them. So normally you can only use one Crisis Act per scene. During combat, you can use multiple Crisis Acts. Fill combat requirements for the Crisis Act to use it. Crisis Act, you gain CP. Growing stronger as you grow looter, standing up to countless humiliations. Okay, so, again, you're gonna, this is gonna be weird, but we're gonna keep it at a very analytical pace, everybody. Doge, avert your eyes. So, Chest Crisis Axe. Massive chest. Requirement. No feature gives small breath or imprinted within large breasts. You cannot also have the tiny chest crisis act. Battle use. Chest AP zero. Your breasts are huge. They are smaller than the American they are no smaller than the American D cup or Japanese E cup. Uh, when your chest armor or clothing is removed, they instantly pop out and bounce about. Furthermore, being as big as they are, they can be used for all sorts of things. <laughs> yes, okay, so mechanically speaking, what a crisis act does is that if you fulfill the requirement for the Crisis Act, you have the choice of using it. If you use it, you gain the CP. You gain the Crisis Points, allowing you to use your Crisis Moves. The more Crisis Moves you get, the stronger you get. This is cool. Let's say, for example, though, um, nipple teasing. 1 CP, 1 SP, not imprinted with hypersensitive nipples. Uh, battle use, HP damage. If you take any HP damage, you're allowed to use this. Rubbing, teasing, or digging into the nips, your nipples are played with as they are nothing more than a sexual toy. Obscene fruit! <laughs> your breasts tremble as your nipple hot in anticipation of their sexual assault, regardless of your own desire. Like, oh, God. Ah, uh, yeah, no, some of these are pretty, uh, woo. Uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> this is... This is Crisis Heroin. This is a weird 2chan game. Um, Japanese RPG. Very fascinating game. And um, we're going through the Crisis Axe system. Crisis Axe are pretty much your way of actually getting stronger. And these are all triggered by you. Some of them are... This is... Um, I'm going to say, this is 18 plus. And this is pain sometimes. When I was, I, even when I was reading it, I was like, holy shit. But yeah, there are... Shaving. Rotch complex. That. Proof of purity. 
hot nectar. <laughs> um, yeah, there are actually legitimately things that you need to sufficiently actually like note, such as a virgin or not. You have imprinted is a little. They don't explain imprinted on here, but effectively. Uh, when you get your shit rocked, you can actually have things imprinted on you. These are specific, usually problems, that you have to now deal with. <laughs> Repeated loss. Uh, uh, unusual insertion. <laughs> Hips moving on their own. Clowns. The pleasure of insemination. <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus Christ almighty. And again, some of these are pretty standard. Again, for example, um, we'll use um. Okay, we're not. We'll, um, okay, we can't use that one. Uh, maybe we'll use um. Oh Jesus! Oh Jesus Christ! Oh my. <laughs> I am not, um, I'm effectively, but the big thing is this, this is like the big thing about this game. You, you choose this. The GM cannot at any point deliberately choose to perform a crisis act. It has to be you, which is a very tame decision on someone who decided to write this game. That is an incredibly tame decision. And it is... <laughs> it's one of those things where you look back and you're like, somebody somewhere said this was a good idea. And somewhere along the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the writing process, the, the writer must have said, okay, maybe we should tone this down a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, Mouth Axe. Drop my dice, I'm gonna fucking step on it. Mouth Axe. Defiled Mouth. Ser service servicing Mouth. Cock Milking Tongue. Come Drunk. Secret Flower Garden. Wedgie. Ravaged Peaches. I'm just going to leave that one on screen there. This is my life now. <laughs> That's not how that works. Uh, spirit Axe. Voyeur. Pure Heart. Uh, knowledge of Disgrace. Yeah, so some of, like, effectively, these ones are pretty standard. Let, let, let's, like, these ones are pretty standard ones. However, when you get into spirit acts, these are a little bit more personality driven. For example, literally, there's nothing for Voyeur. So you actually trigger Voyeur, you do nothing. You just gain spirit. Uh, however, you get things like, for example, um, you end up with ah, bashful insults. There's no, usually there's no requirement for any of these. Uh, you just gain it in exchange for uh, pain. You get it for, and then, um, yeah, no, we're just going to leave that there. Delirious Smile. Uh, uh, the Pleasure of mon Monster. Uh, uh, a Sow's Joy. Begging. Flashback. A Cage of Leers. The Joy of exposure general acts okay general acts can actually be used by literally anyone and these are things like secondhand knowledge <laughs> yeah you've never experienced sex yourself when it comes to knowledge you've got plenty when you hear one new thing you imagine 10 even in the middle of a crisis <laughs> uh yeah uh for some reason, that's one. Dirty glasses. You wear glasses. They've been coated, coated in coom. Uh, who need actual glasses? Yeah, that's like a. Uh, yeah, no. Um. Yeah, yeah. And then don't forget, we do have 
Painax. Yeah, Scarlet Blood. You thought you completed avoided a fatal attack, but the blow grazed you and fresh blood runs through along your skin, staining it red. Anytime you take AP or HP damage, or you end up with um, well, eat these ones. Uh, stomach gouging pain. A violent, full power attack slams into your stomach. Whether you lose a bruise or a scar, the pain leaves you reeling and fall to your knees. Uh, we're not going to read that one. Bloodstained vomit. Uh, exposed scar. Brand of the week. Uh, <laughs> pain that turns into pleasure. Status of favor. Oh, gee. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, every stereotype possible. We're just, I'm just gonna leave this one here. <laughs> yes, Fudinari is technically a an option. That is a, a thing. So that of the Crisis Axe system. Yeah, no, okay, so. Then we have the Emotion system. The Emotion system is you can have one of three emotions. Ideal, Affection, or Hostility. One emotion at rank three is fine too. Nope, the emotions always have to have a specific target. Uh, is... That's the entire idea. And those actually play very significantly into how those work. So, um, we don't actually have anything on session flow, so we have to go to rolls and battle. How does this game actually fucking work? It's 2d6 plus stat. That's that's it. It's 2d6 system. Yep, not exactly the most, um, uh, we'll, we'll say, robust system ever. But uh, are you really playing this game for the fucking system but yeah uh, so combat is round start turn order character order now the big thing is unlike most rpgs attacks will always hit the attack will do 2d6 plus your weapons power so i rolled a six and two with a sword of float four i technically rolled did 12 damage pretty good these are actually pretty simple like this is a pretty simple thing even down to the fact that you can use an auxiliary action to remove any bad status effect any of them, most. I think only one or two of them you can't remove using this way, even down to just using a spell. And when you get hit, you have to use a, a, a reaction. Strenders or escapes, which leads to damage and violation. So, the idea is when you take damage, you reduce your armor. Okay, pretty standard. If armor can get destroyed. One thing that does do something interesting, if you have one armor and say take 12 damage, you just lose the one point of armor. Nothing else. Unless, if the dice, not the result of the attack monster, meets or beats the armor's direct hit value, it's dire applied directly to the HP. So let's say your direct hit value is 11, and I roll, and I manage to score an 11. I'm going to go straight past your fucking armor, and I'm going to just beat the shit out of you. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah, and you can... if That can fuck you up pretty fucking bad. It's slipping through, it's bad. Yo, know, the big thing is when heroines or dark heroines stack one another, ignore the direct hit value. It's... <laughs> Our damage is described as acts that are central to the spirit of crisis heroine. AP, their armor stripped away, takes HP, and they're fiddled by tentacles, and yeah. In these circumstances, you can use several crisis acts, that's the entire idea. You want to earn more to do more. Cool. You can literally go this entire game with nothing happening. You can play an entire game of crisis heroin, not a single crisis act popping up. Because it is entirely you. Fucking weirdo. Yes, this, is, this system does have guaranteed action when it comes to damage, which is pretty fascinating, actually. All standard close will be damage, activating, deactivating traps, because how, how that works is pretty simple. On the battlefield, traps are, are present. Pretty much traps can either be triggered or they are sustained. A triggered trap, very simply, happens when something occurs. So if you, you know, the battle begins and a heroine is hit for two damage or something or it can be like okay every round the heroines roll a 1d6 and on a six they take one damage or something shit like that usually these are pretty bad uh they are a lot more complicated than that because these are some of the for example our um our bad statuses bound 
in heat, in large breasts. Uh, pff, these two, Futanari. I'm glad that Futanari is not one that's a taste of the session beforehand. Futa, that's fine. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, exposed. Yeah, that's. Uh, SP roll, it, it keeps her wits are swept away by neuroticism. It's an intelligence roll with a difficulty here is total SP. If it fails, she acts accordingly to the erotic situation. Which, if you think about it, again, if you never build any, you are not going to deal with that. Simply jump into the situation based on the feelings of the heroine. Uh, yes, gain it. So, how does this work? So... When you reach zero, you're not, you know, it doesn't mean she has serious injury or death. Instead, it represents a complete lack of energy to fight back against the foe. At this point, uh, bad things will happen. At this point, at this time, here, we must make a corruption roll. The roll is unique compared to others. D6, number D6 is equal to their level plus the sum of their ideal and affection emotions plus their, plus their hatred emotions toward the enemy who dropped them to zero. The enemy is a minion of someone they have a hatred emotion. They can add as many D6s. So when they have affection, the player subtracts these sixes equal to the emotions of adding them. No ability spell can be added, gut, saving grace, nothing. If you beat... <laughs> Imagine being the one magical girl and all the tentacle monsters leave you alone. Uh, yeah, so... Heroines who succeed a corruption roll are still out of the fight, but resist giving in. Their noble heart stays true. After the fight, she's restored to 1 HP. Fails and breaks and kneel, and she begins to kneel as a slave to the monsters. Uh, yeah, we'll let that... Yeah. The thing is, like, when you reach 0 HP, you're just kind of out of the fight, but you're not out-out. You add up all your SP. If you, can, if you can't beat the SP, you're fine, which... Does make you gaining like two or three of them not actually that bad, especially if you have say four or five dice. It's like, yeah, I have three. Oh no, I've rolled a fucking seven. Fine. <laughs> but if you gain a shit ton, well, well, that's bad. And when time you advance, you get a, some XP. Stats up, health up. Uh, new spell, new crisis ability, and every level you, and every, even level, two plus one. For health, more items. And, uh, if you have ten total SP, uh, you end up with a new imprint. Crisis act, prerequisites. Uh, exchange it for no cost. When they're across the end of session, run rank in any emotion. Uh, should be fitting with the session. Single five. What are the imprints? Well, imprints are, um... Why the fuck am I fucking here? Yeah, no, it's uh, th th this is a no-no. This is th this is the no-no square one. God, I've been streaming for five fucking hours. This is gonna be the longest video. This is gonna be the longest stream by far at this point. Uh, I don't actually know. It won't be the longest stream because I still have the ultimate streams. So yeah, monsters are pretty standard. These aren't actually that fascinating. This game is pretty simple in that regard. Like, oh wow, you got fucking 20 health and I can do like 2d6 plus 12 or whatever. Some of these things have like 2d6 plus 4 damage. Like these guys can hit like a fucking truck. Here's the odd thing with Crisis Heroin. This, this is the odd thing. <laughs> yes. Um. Here's the thing. How do I want to word this? Crisis Heroin is fascinating because if you actually take the game as rules is written like yeah you're gonna end up as like yeah <laughs> you funny magical girl get raped uh for my my sample pc uh she has 32 health so yeah like you can 2d6 plus 8 is like you you're, you're taking a little bit of damage like you even getting hit a few times like you're gonna be on your fucking ass pretty quick 
but you don't really want to do that. That's bad. Like, oh god, we're gonna we have to try to try to survive these things, and it's fucking hardcore. If you really, if you play it by by pure numbers, like yeah, like this two d six plus thirteen. Yeah, you can fucking kill people really easily. But it's also something called the Flesh Torrent. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, enough saying to be level three or higher. You're mostly like supposed to be dealing with like rooks, maybe a knight. Like, yeah, you're, you're like this is this is the extent of what you're supposed to be taking on early on, which is like twenty seven. Like you got to be level three or four to even like think about dealing with some of these guys. But by that point, you also have a shit ton of abilities. Yeah, it's split over the whole party. Um, sort of. It's if I punch if I punch you in the face, you're gonna be dealing. I'm gonna you're gonna take the damage. But if I punch you in the face, like action economy wise, it's not bad. But yeah, it's a lot of things. But these guys also don't forget they also have electric dam, but they also take bonus damage from certain abilities. And if they take negative one from body based skills, and well, here's some. Or abilities and slime monsters sometimes have a lot of health, but sometimes they don't. Like, here's the odd thing. Like, this is the this is the thing that like gets me gets my noggin jogging. If you, honest to God, just played this straight with none of the actual like, if you played violent magical girl TM. Then yeah, this system could actually work well. Maybe not perfect, but it could work. It would be a little bit weird to kind of transfer things over one for one, but it's most of the time these aren't really too hardcore. Like uh, even down to things like defense. Like you don't have that much defense actually. Like you can get fucked. Our heroines are in fact the queens. Like yeah, you can get fucked up pretty. Badly, if you really want to or not. Some of these skills kind of do things, and sometimes they don't. It's. I think in like a raw play, I think raw play wise, I think you're going to get your shit rocked. But if you use the power of friendship and everyone's blasting them with their highest abilities, and you do a couple crisis acts and you get some of those bigger abilities, think about it. You might be doing 10d6 damage. 10d6 damage is a lot of fucking damage. And, oh, well, add all these... Oh, well, I'm going to use a spell that's going to do 10d6 damage, but I also can use this ability to let me do this, and, oh, my armor took all the damage, and now I am fine. And it's like, oh, okay then. All right. So this is also the optional rule section. Uh, the big idea is that you pretty much build a demon core. And... Yeah, uh... And the the entire idea with these ones is you build a demon core, try to do things, and you're trying to like build up the leader and build up the the problems, and like oh well we want to do all that. There's an entire system for building up your own personal fucking demon army for some fucking reason. Yeah, no, and then it's you become a dark. There's a chance that you can become a dark heroine become a dark heroine, you get dark crisis acts, dark crisis abilities. Really dark crisis acts. Oh no. You know, dark, you know, will never change. Spend her days as an, as an important soldier and sex life as the demon of the demon corp afterwards. It is aesthetics. We'll fall one day, you know, turn to a normal heroine, serve another demon corp, becomes the leader, leave the game. So you martyr herself. Uh, yeah. And some of these are like, this is exactly what you would fucking think it is. Like, some of them are odd. I don't, I don't know why. I really don't know. Why. It's like, oh, oh no, I don't, I don't like this. Yeah, that's Crisis Heroin. Um. How do you? 
how do you even deal with Crisis Heroin? How do you even fucking summarize a game like this? Uh, here's my opinion on the matter. Uh, <laughs> you get used to it. Um, as a... As a game, I think it works. I think enemies hit a little bit too hard. So it makes character it makes the fights have to go like a very certain way. Like you have to get kind of lucky at some points. Or you're fighting like one enemy. Like, oh no, there's like two enemies. What are we gonna fucking do? It, it's kind of those extremes in one way or another, and it's like, well fuck. Um I, yes, but the problem is like Here's the thing, Crisis Axe don't actually do anything. Now, if the system was, for example, the number of Crisis Points you have can either be spent on Crisis on uh, crisis abilities, they let you do super big things, or like you gain a plus one damage, then alright, I could see it being valuable, or like the those that resource was a little bit more valuable. The thing is, it's not really, like you only get to use the Crisis abilities. And because you only get to really use the prices abilities, and some of these are pretty expensive, like, it's... There does come a certain degree of mechanical intricacy which you need to do, which is like, I don't really give a shit about what's happening, just give me my three fucking crisis points already. Because I need to ignore the bad effect or whatever. If there was a little bit more you could do with the crisis effects, uh, crisis uh, points, I'd be a little bit like, alright, this works a little bit better. Um, however, this is the thing with this particular game. This is a game, I think, built by, like, one or two guys that were probably like, can we do it more than anything? Is the game good? No, I don't think the game's actually very good. I think the problem with the game is that it's kind of, um... I think the math is a little bit wonky, and I think the math is wonky because you wanted to incentivize a very certain kind of play, and that very certain kind of play kind of works and kind of doesn't. Kind of depends on how you're feeling. So... Does it have solo player rules? Absolutely not. <sighs> you almost need to do a group with this. I mean, I... <sighs> the only thing I could think of for, like, that is that if you make, like, a... The heroin bumps up in power significantly, but even then, I don't even think that would really do that much. Because the thing is, at that point, what you'd need to do is you need to make a gauntlet. It would be a gauntlet game, and I don't think that would work very well. Uh, if anyone wants to pay me $120, I'll fucking rewrite Crisis Heroin. But... Yeah, it's... I don't even think running as a group's gonna help fix the math. Just because it's not spread damage. It's, again, it's not like a spread of damage, it's a single hit damage where if the GM is an asshole, he's going to be able to kill you all pretty easily by just focus firing, like, one person. Like, the GM has to be invested in the... GM has to be invested in it, while the players also have to be invested in it, and then everyone has to be kind of on board with it. I think this is more of, like, a proof of concept, like, yeah, of course we did it. It's kind of that wink to camera kind of thing. And, um, it's here. In front of God in the whole world. But, yeah. That's Crisis Heroin. Uh, the next three games are gonna be on- Yeah, because, yeah, we're, we're only- We've got three more fucking games to go, because I have lost all sense of right or wrong in my life. Why did I agree to do fucking nine games? Why did I do this to myself? Well, the next game we're gonna be actually going over- Uh, the next game we're going to be going over is actually a kind of a weird one. Uh, let's see if I can fucking find the thing. Uh, uh, let me fucking... I need to find the correct site. Uh, there we go. So, this is a game. God damn it. I'm going to have to fix that. It's driving me nuts. So, this is 
Ancient Scar translations. Most specifically, going over LOST, Lost, a game about fighting or something. It's a survival game. And the entire idea is everyone over the age of 18 has died. It's been five years after the fall of human society, and you all are all getting together to save the day. And, um, uh, yeah, it's written by this guy. This is Gene J. Blackwell. Gene J. Blackwell is the kind of the translator for this, and I haven't really seen anything that he's, like, like, done much on it. It's like, I don't think he's like, yeah, let's fucking translate some more shit. I don't, I haven't seen really anything of that. This is the actual writer of the game, though. This is, uh... Hiobo who, Hiobo who, or whatever the fuck it is, they are the writer. And as you kind of see here, uh, translate to English, they've written a few games before. These guys, this is a person who likes to play games and is unfortunately stuck in the, um, the ever, ever increasing nightmare that we're unable to escape of not really being able to tell people about it. So yeah. Most of these, there's, this game has actually been translated into four languages, which is kind of like, oh, yeah, all right. And we've been translated into four, four languages, which is a lot better than most of these goddamn games. So, even down to things like this. Ooh. These are all that they like, no problem. Like, this is literally like a consent sheet of like what you want to play. Is this a degenerate one too? No. This is actually probably one of the nicest games available. And there's actually a very good reason why I decided to do this one after Crisis Heroin, because this game is entirely online. There's no other way to play it. It's everything is literally right here. Uh, it's not a physical book at all. You can't buy, I don't think you can actually even buy the game as a physical book. Um, like, Scourge Looper? What the fuck is this? Like, I'm... Uh, oof, wow, that's fucking painful. But yeah, no, this is the main writer. Uh, he likes Idol Master, it looks like. And, yep, Tragedy, Tabletop, Memo, I like all these things. He's a, he's a man who tweets and plays games. That's all, that's all I could really ask for a in a human being. Uh, he's also a big proponent of a bunch of these, like, online VTTs. Which I, I have a respect for. I'm like, alright, cool, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. The fuck? What in God's name is this? Let's click on this. <laughs> Lucifer and Biscuit Hammer references. Ta-da! <laughs> like... Yeah, this is ancient scars. There isn't really actually much here. But yeah, what is Lost? What is this game? Well, this is a game about surviving in a very hostile world. Pretty much, uh, the world fucking ended. And you now have to fight to survive. The big thing is that there's these things called fields between camps. Fields hold bosses. You need to kill the boss to clear the field to make sure that everyone is alive. However, everyone is a fucking child. Uh, so, it's like a fight to survive. Alright, this came out in about 2017 as well. This is kind of an older game at this point. Now, let's do camp creation. Character creation. Camp creation. You gotta name the camp. Uh, don't forget about all these tables. You gotta like, GM's last name, player's last name. Like, yeah. Like, it's a... You're gonna like what you get here. It's very simple. And... You start with all the following facilities at level one. You get a roof that sucks. You get a wall that sucks. Sleeping area that sucks. Storage, pantry, they all suck. And let's roll. What, what, what additional facilities can we get? Oh, wow. We're, we'll roll a D6. I got a four. We start with a garden. Yay! We all like the garden, right? Like, all right, and it's nice, nice and little, 
That's a little fun. Next, we got to choose our class. Pretty much, we get to choose up to two of the following classes, or we can do one class with one additional ability. Are the 12 classes big? <laughs> Small. Adult. New Age. Like, they have supernatural abilities. Wounded. Change one body part specialty in this area to wound. Uh, uh, you become wounded. Uh, fighter. Scout. Hunter. Professor. Worker. Hope. Mama. <laughs> can you technically play small mama? Yes, you can play small mama. Can you min-max mo your, your mama, your ara ara energy? Yes, you can in this game. That's okay. Kind, yeah, kind of the um, assortment is kind of odd. <laughs> Uh, choose your specialties. Fill the name of specialties on your character sheet. Some abilities are directly linked to certain specialties. Wait, wait, wait a second. You've been all bamboozled. This is secretly an adventure planning service game. Ha ha. Uh, yeah. So we're gonna go over the system here real fast. And I, this is one of the reasons I also chose this one first. Uh, the system being used here is called Adventure Planning Service. So, what is the Adventure Planning Service in general? Well, they make a game. They make a game system called Psych uh, Psychoro Fiction, I believe it's what it's called. And it's by this company. Adventure Planning Service is a subsidiary of Boken. And what? What's up? What's the? What's the? What's the gisterino there, Munchkin? Like, what's the fun part? Well, the thing is, these guys make board games and they make ta tabletop games. Like, oh, all right. They're the ones who made Shino Bigami. They're also the ones who make most of the games we're going to be going over now. So, for example, we'll do Gear Tower, va Gear Tower Vacancies. We already went over the people who worked on this one, and it's literally you know, the Adventure Planning Bureau by this person. And apparently, it's by the same people. They all use the same system. They all use the same ideas. But let's, let's do one that kind of stood out to me that will never be translated all I'm all I'm saying is um hey hey buddy hey hey saint all I'm saying saint is uh get get your fucking people working on this shit come on brother come on come on man Bingo. dark days drive <laughs> Dark Fiction, Dice Fiction series, finally, the 13th. The players become a twink and serve a vampire master. Travel around the country by car, enduring the toughest missions and war gamma master. I'm sure sometimes a day will come when you become a vampire. The translation changes each time. However, the theme remains the same. <laughs> Um, the entire idea behind this game is literally you become a sexy man and accompany sexy vamp- a, a, like, a lot, like, a sexy vampire who's usually a lolly, because it's still fucking Japan. Uh, that's literally the entire game, is, like, you are a sexy man with a vampire lolly that you, is your boss, and you're trying to become a vampire. Not necessarily even twinks, like, it's literally, it, it gravitates between twink and handsome man. Like, literally, it's literally just handsome man half the time. Yeah, no, they are uh, very unsubtle about this one. Most of these are very unsubtle, which is, um, I don't think that's not the right fucking word. Uh, this one's literally about t detective or assistant and investigate the case. It's a two-player game. One of you is an assistant and one of you is the detective. Uh, Shino Bigami, which is actually we went over before on this channel, which is all about giant ninja battles. Uh, let's see, we have, um, ah, yes. Yankee and Yog Sagath, which you play a Yankee and try to fucking kill Satan. It's ridiculous and uses the exact same system as the rest of these games. Uh, let's see, uh, we have Card Ranker. I know Card Ranker's in here. Um, Kill death business. We're going to go over beginning idol. I don't know why all the translation is just botched. <laughs> like, the translation is just fucking botched. <laughs> it's great. Or it's like, yeah, there's... We have to fucking kill monsters and shit. Like, 
that they also did like Mayu Kingdom, Labyrinth Kingdom. The adventure planning service is they actually all, they also did the uh, Kantai Collection RPG, the, which we already went over once, unfortunately. Uh, we yeah, shipped this RPG. Yeah, the, the something's broken. <laughs> I love broken translation. Thanks, Google. Yeah, I know that's effectively the system. So how does it actually work? <sighs> so the game works pretty standard. Two D six versus five. Sounds pretty easy. However, things get a little bit complicated. So, let's say, for example, you say, um, you're going to need to make a shoot check. I'm like, well, I have dominant arm. I have dominant arm as one of my skills. To make a shoot check, I have to move down one. So that, that target number five becomes target number six now. However, let's say, for example, I have no, only, I only have no and I need to do a shoot check. I would go, no, one, two, three, four. I have to roll under, I have to roll over a nine now. That's pretty much how psychro fiction functions. You take a... Uh, you pretty much have a few skills spread throughout here. You select them, and anytime you need to make it go up or down or anything like that, you add one to the check. So if I need to make a dominant arm check and I have a dominant arm skill, I only have to roll five. If I need to make a shoot check, six, grab seven, throw eight, off arm, nine. Uh, every system does things slightly differently. Uh, this one is just like, you just choose six specialties, spread among all of them. You can have, do whatever the hell you want with all of these. Uh, these ones aren't actually very good. We'll go over actually a very good one. Uh, not, a not after this one actually, yeah. So, then you have abilities, represent techniques and powers. And some of these are fairly standard. Most of the time you're gonna have like attack abilities and support abilities. Now, when you use this, you can also gain uh, willpower, which is your recoil. That's pretty much like your resource to use abilities with. And most of these abilities are say, for example, uh, weapon attack, recoil zero. You don't need anything like a free hand. You make a specialty check. Deal damage equal to the power of the weapon. Whip for the chosen specialty. Add two to the hit check for this attack. Okay. So let's say, for example, we make a new age. Well, actually, no. Let's say we make a a big. We can choose to do an I have the iron fist ability. Succeed at a specialty check because we have to do our specialties. Hit. Deal one damage when making the attack again. Plus three to the hit check. So pretty much, it's the entire idea is that you choose these specific abilities, you choose these special ability uh, specialties, and you start beating it, and you start doing stuff with them. It's pretty much what the game is all about. Not actually that um, complex. The game is actually incredibly simplistic, and Psycho Fiction is very good at being able to be molded around things. I actually quite like uh, SF. I think the game is kind of underappreciated in some aspects, but I enjoy it. Um, carrying capacity, obtain your items. Because everything is tr everything is odd in this one because everything is measured in jerky. That's the that's the unit of measure. That's the unit of currency. <laughs> it's uh, ten jerky equals one can of food. So you begin a backpack in ten jerky. It's like, yep, this is uh, this is what we're doing here. You know, melee weapons, armor, bag, foods. Like this is it's the thing is it's a little hard to read sometimes because this is what you have to work. with. It's a fucking Google table at some point. <laughs> like, you like Google tables? Like, yes. Like, okay, it's going to be fine. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit more con you know, complicated. Uh, let me see. So, determine your name, determine your gender, and your history. Um, that's, that's it, really. The main thing with the session flow is that you have four main things. You have the camp phase, the search phase, and the showdown phase. Technically, you also have result, but we don't talk about result. So, when you get done with the camp phase, pretty much you just cycle through everything. And you are continuously going forward. I think that's the, the best way to word, word things in this particular game. And the best way to kind of... What I mean by that is we complete a thing... We do a thing, cycle continues, we do a thing, we complete a thing. It's, there's a very clear sense of cycles. 
and a cl very clear sense of beginnings and endings. And when you do the camp phase, you do like you have to resolve everything in the camp phase. You do the showdown phase. You resolve the showdown phase. So, for example, this is the take a walk table. During the camp phase, you can choose to take a walk. I rolled a eight. I rolled a nine. I mean. Uh, you managed to dig up something good from one of the far corners of the camp. Roll 1d6. Battery, jerky, or a kitchen knife. A can of food. Cool. Or you end up... Uh, then you get things like the search phase. Pretty much how this goes is that you're supposed to... You get this big map set up, and you move from point to point trying to clear checkpoints. Checkpoints could be anything from, like, there's a literal block in the road and we can't continue... The things like there's a giant monster or there's a beastie in the way that we need to make go away. It's very... Checkpoints are kind of abstracted. It's anything that's, you know, overcoming a ha you know, overcoming a hazard to get from checkpoint to checkpoint. Uh, which, the, the hazards are checkpoints, but checkpoints are locations. I've been streaming for over five and a half hours. Cut me some fucking slack here, people. So, during this time... Random encounters, your enemies, setting the scenes. Pretty much checkpoints are points of interest, while hazards are hazards and things that are going to try to stop you. You want to keep doing things, you want to recover stamina, you usually only have a very certain amount of time to do everything. And because you have that kind of that timetable, that's when things start going wrong. So, most of the time you're saying doing like a search table. So, for example, I rolled a 9 again. So in the middle of the search ground, you crumbles, you leave, the pile leaves, a, you step, it was concealing a collapsed ceiling. If you succeed at a fall check, you land cleanly inside a room and search to find an item or three jerky to the left. If you fail, you take one damage and unable to search. Your friends must come to help you. Cool. Or you end up with things like, oh, well, here's some problems. Here's this. Here's here's when you rest, and to rest you need to gain more abilities to make increase your willpower. You want to interact with objects. You just, oh no, there's a limit to the number of cycles. Oh no. Yeah. Um. <laughs> if I'm going a little bit quickly through this one, it's because there's a lot of fucking charts, and like this is what a majority of the game actually is. It's like flow the round. Then you make adventure actions. Then you make enemy actions. So here's the initiative check table. Because there's an entire initiative check table for some reason. Which you have to make a target speciality depending on what it is. Which is kind of weird. A, a little bit of Excel simulator, not going to lie. A little bit of Excel sim. Uh, some people are going to really like that kind of kind of game. Like They kind of like the jankiness of it. I'm not a huge fan. So characters take one of the following actions. You can attack. Oh no, you can critically fumble if you fuck up. And those cooperative, you know, cooperative attacks, you target if possible, select one support type ability. Oh boy, we're working together using the power of friendship. We're kind of moving things around. Because one of the big things too is you have to take an action to take something out of your bag versus just equipping it. Because it's a traveling RPG. It's it's one of those games where you have to kind of manage your supplies. It's very important in that regard. It is also, however, very odd in how it chooses to handle things. So when you attack damages a target, the damage is subtracted from the target's stamina as long as the target's stamina is not zero. Damage will reduce the target's stamina to zero. Damage is dealt to the stamina. The attack will cause body damage. Now, body damage is actually pretty fascinating. Because, for example, let's say I take... I take a hit to the heart. Oh no. That's bad. And because I've taken a hit to the heart, uh, let's see, I need to do here. What occurs is, let's see, where's the heart? So right here, I've got hit in the heart. All of these abilities here are now unavailable to me, including the heart. None of these can be used. And, but you still have to like, so if I need to do a dominant hand and use my off arm, I still have to go through them all, but I can't use any of these, which is bad. You know, also abilities eight squares surrounding the pile, not, do not count gaps, cannot be used, and death. Take body damage, you roll death check. While it's greater than the number of your character's body parts that are currently undamaged, you succeed. 
uh, the result is lower than the number of character body parts, you fucking die. So, what are your body parts? You have sensory organs, brain, mouth, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. You have eight body parts, effectively. So you can take about two damage, like, you can take about two damage reliably after your stamina runs out, but after two damage, um, one bad roll and you're fucked, kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you know, things get pretty bad. Oh, yeah. All good. Yeah, because it's the same system. Oh, uh, look, when, uh, it is, it's all called, it's uh, the psycho, Psychoro Fiction, Psychoro Fiction system. That's, they use the same exact system, same exact concept, same exact idea. But I like this. I like the way they handle this. This system, then, I usually like in a lot of different kinds of um, games, like like kind of generic systems. I would rather play a psycho fiction game than not play a, a psycho fiction game. So, yeah, showdown scenes are showdowns with the boss. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that's kind of fucky wucky, in my opinion. Thing that I'm not a huge fan of. When you hit the results phase, if you manage to clear the boss's phase, things are good. Things are going really good. Have the right to first dibs on spoils. Three actual X is the level of the boss of the field. So, wow, we get a bunch of shit. Cool. You also gain camp points. Oh, no. We can also get abilities to increase our camp's power. All right. Because this is the main core of the game. The main core of the game really does boil down to building up your camp. And building up that camp is important. So if we go to, like, say, for example, the personnel tables, we need to increase our roof, for example. We need to increase our walls, our storage, better food storage, better water barrels. Or maybe we should invest in more garden. Maybe we should invest in a better clinic. It's shit like that. Some people... Some people are going to really enjoy this kind of game. You know, kind of building up this camp. However, everything I've said, you don't actually change that much. Like, that's one of like the, the the parts of this game that I'm like, ew. Ew. Yeah, like a lot of these, like, oh, oh boy, we can, you know, set everything back, reassign character specialties, uh, and players can reassign their characters' abilities. So what do you mean by that, Notepad? Yeah, um, they don't really tell you how to improve your character, really. It just happens. You just get better. Um, there's not really any abilities you can, like, pick up. Experience is, experience is awarded. Um, I'm assuming that this is, like, a part that wasn't translated very well. Or maybe you can missed it. Warhammer Fantasy, good guys. Warhammer Fantasy second, uh, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay second edition is fantastic. Uh, I haven't played. I need to go over fourth edition and third edition actually. But yeah, no, this is how pretty much bosses and most enemies kind of just use this level system for everything. And then we have the enemy abilities. Enemy abilities are very simple. Uh, I just sneezed. But yeah, it's... Here's the thing. Do I like the idea of this game? Yes. But I feel this game is also incredibly fucking confused. Because, like, this is how you're going to be improving your spells. You're like, yay, here's a new specialty. After t 15 fucking points. 20 points, 30 points. Like, it's... How do I word this? Psychoro Fiction does best, similar to how I would say uh, Apocalypse World. Apocalypse World does incredibly good when you have a very focused kind of game. A very set, very organized, and say one to two to three to four kind of game with everything kind of built around it. Psychoro Fiction is kind of the same way. Shino Begami excels. It, because it's very focused on what it does. Trying to make Shinobigami do literally anything other than what it's supposed to do, it will break immediately. 
it will break into a thousand fucking pieces. If you try to make as a psycho fiction game, try to do most other things, unless you kind of build up, it's not going to do too hot. And I think Lost kind of shows that. It's There's this kind of divide between like increasing the character and increasing the... The camp, like, that's kind of like the central drive. And the central drive is to improve the camp and improve the characters. All right, that makes sense. Problem is, it goes very slowly. And it goes... In, it's also in a system that's kind of not really designed for that, and it doesn't really feel like you're gaining much at the same time. It's a very slow-paced game. For a very slow paced experience, but for a system that wants to go a little bit faster, you know, it's putting a fucking, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it's putting a fucking moped engine in a goddamn Lamborghini. The shit, the car wants to go fast, but the goddamn engine does not let it. Yeah, that's lost. Uh, interesting game, though. I, I would say check it out. It's free. You can go right here, ancientscars.wordpress.com. You can look at the entire game for free. Uh, why am I sneezing so much? This is driving me nuts. So the next game we're going to be going over is actually one I am very mixed on. Welcome to uh, Magica Logica. Uh, Magica Logica is a game. Uh, Psycho Fiction. Ta-da! Uh, fan translation. This is actually, I believe, a Russian translation of... Of the game itself, and I say it's a Russian translation uh, simply because these are the pregens. Uh, yeah, I believe these are uh, the the pregens, and it's a uh, yeah, it's um, I think uh, th these are Russians. These are Russians, everybody. Nothing wrong with Russians; they're just Russians. So, what is the what's the kind of the the basic idea of this particular game? The particular idea of this game is that you are part of a secret organization trying to hunt down play things called grimoires. Grimoires are evil book USB flash drive monsters that are trying desperately to free themselves and cause magical chaos. Magical chaos is funny and amusing. Uh, however, you don't want to get sued, so you're trying to stop them from doing that. Uh, Magical Logia, uh, Magical Logia uh, is again, as I said, it's a psycho fiction game. As we, uh, let's, let's see if uh, they kind of give you the the gist of what the game looks like. I see right there. That's kind of one of the covers. That's the. It's not it. That's definitely not it. But it's very. Um, We'll say, uh, one of the actually one of the immediate comparisons that they actually gave to the game was that it was very um, like Fate, like the Fate series. Uh, if you've ever played any of the Fate series, if you've ever played or read any or watched any of the Fate series games, kind of think like that. Because one of the major things that you have to do is actually. You summon shit. You summon a lot of things. That's one of the major things. Uh, yeah. Summoners use magic power searching and destroying sentient grimoires to possess people. It's very anime. Exactly. He kind of does his best to kind of go over everything. Like, this is a very utilitarian uh, uh, translation. Uh, so most of the time, what I'm going to do here real fast, actually... Uh, is we're going to be using character sheets, Maho Shoujo Ramboy. Oh god, okay, so give me one second, we gotta, uh, we're gonna use Maho Shoujo Ramboy, and right here, got to bump you up slightly, because if I don't do that, it will reveal all my personal data, and I don't want to get doxxed. So yeah, this is Maho Shoujo Ramboy, as you can tell. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> the main thing about it is again, psycho fiction. 
except instead of them being tied to like locations on the body, they are instead the magical abilities of the body, such as star, beast, power, song, dream, and dark. Obviously, I made uh, Maho Ramboy here. A, I gave him the Fursona skill, because the skill of the soul is effectively a skill that is, defines you. You can be anything you want. And you will always be true as if you put it there. Which does lead to things such as the, the summoning abilities. So, because Maho Shoujo Ramboy is the way that he is here. Yes, Eros. Uh, let's see, kind of code name. Yeah, magic names are kind of like functions. A lot of random tables, optional. Magic names, just roll tables. You like tables? Japanese people love their fucking tables every fucking time. Um, there's no indication on gender. The magic ranking is everyone is going to be three. Practicus. And stats in case three... Is Scores will be recorded as your attack power, defense power, and origin power because this is the stupidest fucking combat system I've ever read. And I also kind of love it. Uh, so, your innate magical supply. Because the idea is that your. So, the entire idea is that you don't have like traditional. Uh, how do I word this? You don't have a traditional set of like health or something. You instead rely entirely off of MP. Because wizards in setting, mages, are inherently magical beings. If your MP reaches zero, you're fucked. So you don't want to do that, but magic is also how you cast abilities. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Like, you are kind of going back and forth, trying desperately to keep yourself alive, but also kind of generate random magic. And, you know, it's a, it's a mess going multiple directions. And, um... I or I sort of like it. Yeah, so each class has six unique spells. So, uh, I chose... So, these are technically the classes. So, they're kind of... You have a flavor, you have a drive, and most of the... Kind of like how the magic does. You don't really need to follow these, but you should also do it at the same time. Uh, because that's very important. So, when you use a skill, you choose it. So, pretty much... How skills are chosen in this particular game uh, is you select one category, this is your main category, and then you blank out these. That means you don't actually have to count them when you're counting forward. So, for example, I need to make a, uh, we'll, we'll say a, um, we'll say a joy check, for example. God fucking damn it. Let's say I need to make a joy check. Instead of going one, two, kind of counting the middle, I don't have to count that, just one. So this goes from 5 to 6. Pretty simple. Uh, but let's say I need to make a ring check. I would go 1, 2. It would have to be a 7. That's pretty much it in that regard. <laughs> it finally ended. It was just like, I've, we've played this four fucking times. No. Start again. Start again, Dr. Saxlove. Now, let's see. Not exactly the most complicated system in the world. Uh, it's not. The thing is, it's not really supposed to be complicated. Uh, domains, column blank between that. Pretty much determines all your skills. Death domain is not considered addition to the star domain. And bottom row skills not considered addition to the top row. That's it, really. Um, I would like to say there's some like fun and exciting mechanic in here, like going in here, it's really not. It's really not exciting. So pretty much any check made using your skill of the soul is a fixed target value of 6. However, each time you use your skill of the soul, it takes a toll on your magic, reduces your current magic power by 1. Zero magic power is dead. So you're temporarily dead, because Magician and Magical Logica are fundamentally magical beings, and you can just come back. But the problem is, you have to draw on your anchors, which is another major mechanic in this game. Which is the idea that you have to draw upon people who you know and they know you, but you don't really need to know them either. You've pretty much bound your souls together by destiny, and you're like, don't worry, we'll make it together, brother. Uh, when something goes bad for you, 
they're going to have something bad happen to them. But you, they may also make a wish that, that you kind of have to succeed at, but if you fail at, you probably are going to start suffering pretty fucking hard for. So, leverage on able to resurrect yourself by other means, you become lost, super dead. Now, MP changes every game due to the volatile nature of your existence. You roll 1d6, add your origin power. So, you roll a d6 plus 3, determine your fucking health. <laughs> like, <laughs> I always thought that was kind of interesting. Like, uh, let's see, you always have emergency summon night summon. One of these four spells must be from class specific magic lists. Most of the time, your sum like your summoning skills are based almost entirely around summoning a knight from something. These are the most common summon spirit and summon knight. So, for example, let's say I want to spend two mana of a specific type to a domain to use the skill for the spell. And it becomes the knight of the skill name. So, for example, my particular character, Maho Shoujo Ramboy. Uh, Maho Shoujo Ramboy can summon a knight of insanity as well as a knight of sleep or a knight of mystery. Because what happens is you randomly gain fucking mana through combat or just existing. You can also summon something like a knight of joy if I wanted to, but it's a little bit harder to summon him. Just as much as an otherworld knight or an eros knight. A little bit more difficult, but not possible and usually these are the most important parts when it comes to like how the summons work which is a little bit weird and I'm not a hundred percent fan of them uh, so <sighs> delicious and then you're allowed to start taking some more generic ones, such as Annihilation and Incantation spells. These usually allow you to, you know, see on skill check, swap the attack order of the next round of combat. Or spark during your magic battle, succeed on skill check, deal a damage. Uh, these are very, um... Spells are weird, because spells aren't really what they're supposed to do, because magic combat is not what you fucking think it is. Magic combat is very different and very weird, and I'm not a fan of it. Uh, but yeah, so, it's something like, for example, trouble. Usable on your turn. You succeed at a skill check, it's like a random status effect on your target. Cool. However, if you have, like... Let's say, for example, you go down here. Uh, like, retrospect, like, a uh, poison... During your turn, if you see the skill check, give you the target disease status effect. Oh no! Or death. Blech. The main thing is that you are building up mana. Mana is just based off one of the few key ones, which are, again, you can either build up star, beast, power, song, dream, or dark mana. And you can spend those mana points on either random shit, Or you can start spending them on specific stuff. Usually it's like, oh, if I want to use the support action, I can spend any mana, but I need two dark mana to use the infection ability. It's things like that. Maybe not the most complicated system in the world, but just the way of getting it is a little bit weird because it's randomized. Sort of. And you also get it for free. So most of the time, like, each of the classes have a very dedicated thing that they're supposed to do. Outsiders are supposed to summon. They're supposed to summon a shit ton, and they're going to throw as many bodies at you as possible. Uh, you, you may attempt to summon twice in your summon step. You choose to do so, take a negative two penalty. Oh no, for each summon, if you use emergency summon twice, roll skill for each, each of them separately. Oh no. Increase your origin power by one. Tolawad. Apocrypha spells, you know. Appendix, resisting magic. Opponents by a target spell. Resistance check. Okay. You can choose to adopt a he your true form, and you get superpowers by doing that, including, but not limited to, becoming stronger. All right. Defense enhancements. Cool. Take one damage from minimum zero. Mana emissions. Use any time for the duration of magic battle. Cover two mana. Archetype transformation, where you turn into a knight and start trying to fucking kill someone. Go sicko mode. Uh, and then finally, concentration. You can only use your true form once per session. Make it count. 
And then we have the anchors. Each anchor has destiny value. Destiny value increases for various things. So you want to consider an anchor. You want to use the anchors because the anchors are going to be good. And you can gain more. And if you gain more, you can use more power from them. If you use more power about them, things go wrong or games go right. Uh, then, oh no, there's a vortex going on. And a vortex you know, begins to fuck people up. They die and become a scar. Because, yeah, you can kill killed pretty easily. Yeah, it's incredibly easy to die in this fucking game, just as much as it is for you to kill someone. Fateful interventions. Oh no! Skill check. If you succeed, the misfortune suffers by the anchor is reversed. Even if the anchor is dead, they will come back to life. Intervention. Your destiny with the anchor is set to zero. Remove from your relationship. It's all about your character. If you fail the intervention check, your character ceases to exist. You may only attempt to intervene within the same session wherein the misfortune occurs. So one of the ideas is that if your anchor dies, is you begin a, well, a thread of destiny gets fucked up. And you can possibly lose everything in a particular domain. You can't gain any mana, and you can't get any abilities, you can't get anything there. And that's bad. Gain mana from that domain. You can't really use any mana from that domain, which could potentially cripple you entirely. Uh... Main thing is what you want to do is resurrection. You want to form contracts, which can be pretty much make you stronger. Uh, <laughs> However, the more the more times you use your anchor, the anchor can start making demands and they make wishes. But if you don't do the wishes, you get a scar. And then you have to make the fucking skill checks, and then if you make the skill checks, we have to do the system all over again, and here's special results. It's like a, Jesus, fuck. There's a lot to this fucking game. Do I like it, though? Because you still have the scenes, and you have the master scenes, and we have to introduce people, and everyone has different cards. They have secrets, and they have who they are, and you're trying to find out if they're a fragment of the evil monster book, or they're a not an evil fragment of the monster book. And the problem is, they usually aren't. And if you attempt to fight someone who isn't magical, they're just gonna fucking die. Yeah, you can just fucking start gatting motherfuckers if you want, but you're gonna go crazy if that's that, that you start doing that. Uh, in such cases, right triggers on that secret side as well. Yeah, no, the I think the best way to kind of word this game, it's an investigation game. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna leave this right here. The main thing about this particular game is that it is an investigation game. You are people going around doing scenes to investigate people to see whether or not they are kind of on the up and up. And it's like, hmm, I wonder why you're here. It's just like, well, I think this. Or like, hmm, maybe do you know about this or why you were here? Oh, no, you're a fragment. You're a bad person. You're a monster. I've revealed you. Let's do 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 duel. And when you do 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 duel, you get down to business and start flapping each other. I like that aspect of the game. I like this aspect. I like the investigation system. I like the idea that you're kind of having to look around because the main idea is you kind of are trying to track these secrets down and once you're trying to, you know, you're trying to find out who the fuck they are and sometimes you can't. So it's like, hmm, who the fuck are you? And that's pretty much it. Pretty much everything you can do, you can start to do a drama scene or a battle scene. Drama scenes are all about progressing the narrative. Battle scenes are where you rip off your shirt and begin in the duel. Tagging the protagonist, comfort the maybe in exchange a few blows before the antagonist inevitably gets away. Battle scenes usually between characters and a fragment. Initiated after a fragment has been discovered. But if a non-magical NPC, i.e. not possessed by a fragment or non position themselves, chance to magic battle, they automatically lose and die. So yeah, it's just start gatting fuckers. It's just start gatting people. That's a, that's a strategy in this game. It's a good strategy, too. But yeah, it's... How do I want to do this? Oh, that feels good. 
But yeah, the, the main thing is about investigating. If you fail the investigate shit, you make it succeed. Uh, like, hmm. Even down to things like, oh, well, you're trying to investigate things. And if you investigate, try to find, reveal the handout of the NPC. But you may be able to find something about them. Or I can reveal their secret, if I already know about them. Like, aha, I know about you already, it's here. And sometimes you get into incidents and you're, you're trying to build more destiny with people around you, including your friends, to engage in horrifying battles. So this is where things get a little bit wonky, where I don't like it anymore. So, battle scenes are pretty standard, alright, makes sense. Like the representative, you may choose to become a representative of that character's place. Pretty much it's a 1v1 duel, except when you come down to uh, boss battles. With boss battles, you are incur you are pretty much, you and all your friends are blasting together. So, you charge one mana of your choice. Pretty much you make a decision and choose that mana you want to charge. First attack, summon or step. Second attack or summon step. First attack, second attack. The entire idea is that you want to summon people to assist you. So let's say you have the Knight of Idiocy and Knight of Eros, so you're spellbound at the same time. Already summoned a Knight of Idiocy during the course of this magic battle, you cannot summon another. You can have as many archetypes in your spellbound as your origin power. If you attempt to summon an archetype, that would cause your total number to exceed your origin, and one of them die. What do they do? Oh, wow. All of them have archetypes. So each of these things have, like... Block the number, like, block value, just reduce damage, follow up, you deal damage if you if you hit, actually, boost, you can use a plotted attack dice and control an archetype to re-roll that dice equal to its boost value. Because the entire idea of this is that you take your dice equal to your attack or defense die, you roll them, and then you secretly plot where they're going to go. The enemy also plots where they are going to go. So, it's also very dark in my room all of a sudden because I've been streaming for six fucking hours. So, they also plot where they're going to go, and they have to try to match. That's not exceed or anything. So, when the attack done, first step attack, challenge swap these rules for the second attack step. Number of dice equal to their attack power, number of dice equal to defense power. Plus their attack, respectively, if you case forgot. Plotting your dice means to cover them up secretly any combination of values you want. Not allowed to consult other players when you plot. When all players have finished their plotting, they reveal their dice at the same time. As matched by an identical defense dice, is considered to be nullified. If there are any attack dice which are not matched, attack is successful, and the defender receives damage equal to the number of attack dice that were not nullified. How this actually works is... At least how I read it repeatedly. It's more aligned the idea that you are taking all of these and you're comparing. Like, first dice forward, first dice forward. Oh no, I have a four, you have a two, you take one damage. Uh, next one, you have a six, I have a five. They don't match, so you take one damage. Five and one, you take one damage. It's like, oh. Wait a second, like that... It's like, hmm? Oof. Yeah, I'm not, a, pff, I'm not 100% on this particular system. It's a little bit weird. Uh, this is longest stream. No, longest stream is eight hours. Uh... <laughs> Yes, this one is. I'm. I'm not a hundred percent on this system. It seems a little bit wonky, and I don't think they. I understand what they're going for, but I don't think I also know what the fuck they're going for either. I would need to see this in play because either there's two things that this is. Either you like both randomly roll, and then you have to just assign what you think is going to happen in certain locations, and then you just reveal and be like, "Haha, I blocked all your abilities." Alternatively, it's literally. Well, I want to do a 4, I want to do a 3, and I want to do a 1. Then they also say, well, I want to do a 5, I want. To, I think they're going to have a 3 in there, or they're going to have, like, a 2. We reveal, oh, wow, you have a 3, I have a 3, 2. Well, I, you take 2 damage. Either way, I'm not 
really happy with either of those. I think they're not... I'm not 100% in them. Because I'm assuming that's like what it's supposed to be. Be like, well, I've successfully debated that you have a, you're going to put down a two or something. There's a little bit more to it. I guess you could do something with there. But uh, or you just say fuck it and just roll the dice. I guess that's an option with some abilities. But either way, it's like, what the fuck are you doing here? Like it. There might be a part I'm just missing. There honestly might be, because like, number next to it, boost value, once per round, plot of attack or defense type, control archetype with the boost, may reroll the number of dice equal to it? Not plotted, like, I I guess that might be like the thing you're supposed to do, like, oh no, these match, so I'm gonna, instead of losing my five, I'm gonna roll and be like, oh, I got a four instead, so I'm fine? Like, I, I really don't. Like, yeah, it's kind of a, I feel like there's something I'm missing here that I would need to, like, if I can see this in play, I could, like, say, like, okay, this makes a little bit more sense, but I'm, like, still not 100% on it. Uh, then we have, like, mana conversions, you know, convert any number of defense sites that did not nullify an attack into mana, each defense site remaining, not used to nullify an attack, you gain one mana, corresponds to what show the face on that die. So you can get a lot of free mana by virtue of getting your shit rocked. And this also kind of counts for characters, but the idea is pretty much if you you can try to defend if you have supporters and you're trying to kind of guess more. The more supporters you have, the more dice you're kind of putting down, you're trying to match what they have. It's converted to mana by the character who plotted it. So yeah, it's... I have a feeling there's like some like big think, like example picture that's going to like summarize the entire thing. But I don't see that, and I, I'm a visual learner. If I can see it, I can understand it. If I can't see it, I'm not 100% on it. So let, let's say, uh, with magic, they claim a prize, win the lose prize, special item. Thing. One thing I actually do enjoy is that the fact that if you beat a fragment, you beat kind of part of the big bad, you gain one spell the fragment new, or you gain one skill the fragment possessed. Do not use spells that are unique to pain that the fragment split off from. I actually think that's kind of interesting. You kind of indirectly you're gaining a shit ton of power very quickly, and it's like, oh, that's very you know that I quite enjoy that. Like I think that's very interesting. It's like I like everything in this game, like every th single thing that is like it's saying. I enjoy. I just. There, there feels to be, like, a part or two that I'm missing. Yeah. Like, there, there feels like there's, like, this part of the, the game that I'm, like, just not feeling. That I'm not, like, this isn't right. Like, overall, do I like Magical Logic? Logic? Ah. Maybe. I maybe like it. Because I like the fact that it's... This kind of it's an investigation game with magic in it, and kind of it's it's an investigation game punctuated by intense bouts of horrifying violence, which I think is very interesting, and it kind of leads to these like a hundred plus IQ plays where you're like, wait a wait a wait a moment, if he's doing that and he's here, reveal to me his secret. Da, 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 he's the fragment. Oh no! You rip off shirt magic, you know magic battle. I like the summoning idea. I think that's a really cool idea. I like combining everything together. If you combine everything together, cool. It's just that combat is like pooped on to the top of it. I'm like, can you just go away a little bit or like change the nature of it just a smidge? Because when they pitched it originally, I was kind of excited because they're like, it's a summoning game. And I'm like, cool, it's kind of a, it's a game that's almost focused entirely around summoning. And if that were the case, I think that would be kind of interesting. More along the lines of, you yourself can't really fight, you have to summon these knights, you have to summon all these spirits to kind of assist you. And so it becomes a little bit more like, hmm, how do I, you're playing a chess game except nobody knows what pieces everyone's bringing. That could be pretty cool. I'd be down for that. That sounds like fun. It doesn't quite do that, though, and I think that's kind of like, 
something I'm not a huge fan of. So, our final game today, our absolute final game, uh, is <laughs> probably the best psycho, psycho fiction game that I've seen. This is Beginning Another Oro! Uh, yes, this is Beginning Idol. Uh, <laughs> this is the most authentic idol sim uh, currently going on. And um, I'm going to say this, though. This is an idol sim. And it's by I think it's by the same translator because it's the same idea, you know, Challenge Girls side published by Adventure Plan, etc. Very utilitarian. I actually quite enjoy it. It's obviously put a little bit more time and effort into this one, at least or had a little bit more time put into it, but same idea. So, one of the, there, there, there's there's a few different ideas when it comes to this one. Mostly, one, you have to choose one from each category. Obviously, because we're dealing with Henry Tudor, uh, otherwise known as my friend Pro, uh, who is a very serious idol, I went with the fact that they are 180, they are sexy, they have physicality, he is a living sex machine, uh, his hobby is sports, and he's from the over, he's from overseas. Uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, you can choose any of these, and I actually quite enjoy that, especially being the fact that um, being being a gamer does technically make you better at dancing than being an idealist. <laughs> I don't know why I find that amusing, but. Uh, why is Sex Machine in a different font? Uh, because this is actually, this is one of the actually the uh, things I actually find interesting is the quirk and hobby section. You can actually write in anything. Uh, you can write in any of quirk, any hobby that you want. These ones, for some reason, they are linked. Uh, I don't know why they're linked. They're not supposed to be because these are your hobbies and these are your quirks and about what it is. So, for example, my individual super, you know, good old Henry's here. Uh, his super skill was physicality. His entire thing is that he wants to, that he, regardless of whatever happens, he can choose to, to supplement it for physicality. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, we have our reaction. We have our reaction table. The Gaming Workshop is a promising com company. Um, peak tutor. And it's like, all right, cool, cool, cool. Poggers. Poggers in the chat, everybody. We're making progress. And same thing. If you fail, you fuck up. You know, don't successfully accomplish. However, other idols may offer their support to the active character. When they do, character making check adds their cooperation value to the result of the check. Operation is value is zero. They do not gain support. So, you can only do it applied once per check. So, pretty much, if your squad is together, you're going to succeed together. A certain items, dresses, in idle skills. Because, yes, those, those are things. Uh, so, special dice results. 12 or higher, it's a special. Critical success. Fumble. If you roll two or lower, it's a fumble. Yeah, uh, when you roll fun to the character that rolled, it should consult the production sheet. The producer suffers one negative status effect at random from the negative status effect table. These negative status effects affect all PCs, but we'll get to that in a bit. It's one recollection. So yeah, pretty much the entire idea is that if you start fucking up or you start doing well, you're supposed to kind of build things leading up to a big set. So you're gaining things like recollections. You're gaining... You know, idle skills throughout the entire time. You get your learning, understanding to you work together through the power of literal fucking friendship. So, your breakthrough skill is the thing that's really gonna like m make or break you. It's like it's time. Like it's time to duel. Games workshops the promising. I fucking have fucking hate Russia. <laughs> so, we have our showcase, obviously. And if you pretty much is the same as a specialty of a check, it's a, called a showcase. You roll 3d6 instead of, a, instead of a 2d6. 12 or higher, it's considered a special as well. 
So, the entire idea is that you, if you are doing well, if you're using the thing that makes you you, gamers, it's time. If I were to use physicality, for example, if I'm really to like use that body of mine, you know, good old Henry here, Mr. Pro, he gets to roll 3d6. Doesn't mean he's gonna roll fucking well. He rolled a fucking six. <laughs> And it's, this one's pretty detailed. You get a lot of stuff. You know, let's go over all these. And <laughs> we got our idol rank. Ten ranks from idol candidate. Yeah. If you rank multiplier when you gain fans. Yeah, gamers. So, your chances. How many chances before they must retire? It's eventually come to an end. This is, um... Pfft. This is, uh, these are going to be a little bit hanky here. We're going to go over that one a little bit. How many sessions? Yeah, fans gain total fans. Your standing tracker with your fellow NPC, reactions. And finally, your mental. Because remember, you are an idol. You are a, you're supposed to be anyway, a Japanese schoolgirl, effectively, or someone who is like 17. You're a 17 year old girl. So instead of having, you know, this is not a game where someone's going to pull out a gun and shoot you and you're taking like 10 health damage. No, you have mental. Mental is your ability to keep yourself focused. Keep yourself okay. And everything's going to be okay. And we're not going to talk about the voices in your head. Uh, it's to keep yourself mentally sane. Uh, if you ever hit zero mental, it's you having a mental breakdown on stage. And that mental breakdown is hysterical. It's like, oh shit. <laughs> so we have character fluff, background, and then our finally, our idol class. Come on. So here's our... Uh, all our, our, our very basic ones. So our three... Three classes. We have serious, collected and stoic, but even without showing it, people can feel it when you're truly happy. You're pretty much the focused one. You don't shade anything, but you have the highest base mental, you know, stability. But you also don't, because everybody hates you. You're just really good at doing one thing. Comedy is like, you love to laugh together. So you get three stats and two in the rest. Wow, goo me. And then you finally have Hono Bono. Which is like you just suck, but you're also the one who just don't want to be there. It's like, yeah, gamers, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, serious is hardcore. <laughs> yeah, serious is a little bit. Uh... Yeah, you get pretty much one per. Uh... And then about mental. Equivalent of HP, picking up items. Uh, items you can use during... Pretty much when you're allowed to, such as trademark items, dreaming shoes, uh, dongos. Yeah, you can use your dongos. Uh, refreshments, just... <laughs> because, again, this is not a game about violence. Idol Curl Phantom is massive. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, this is not a game about violence. This isn't a game about, you know, beating the shit out of each other. This is a game about singing. And this is a game about idol culture. Not necessarily anime idol culture. This is a this is kind of in that middle place between idol. Hey everybody, look at me. It's me and Love Live. Yeah, look at us. Snow Halation. Let's make that the song that makes like a billion fucking dollars a year. And like the brutal reality of being a trying to be a fucking pop star in the in the J in the fucking J pop scene, like it's like Jesus, holy shit. <laughs> because there is the the chances mechanic. So this is the chances. The idea is you get to <laughs> down your mega elixir. You have a panic attack through. So here's the thing. The number of chances you get are pretty much the number of chances that you get to get to the next level. If you don't do that, the character is gone. You retire them because they didn't make it. And this is not easy. The game is fucking brutal the first like two sessions. Like this game will kick your dick in. 
you will get your nose is broken by the end of this shit because you are struggling. It's the struggle bus. It's, you know, choo choo, everybody. We're going on to the despair train. Because it's it's rough. Because sometimes it's like, yeah, get a thousand fucking fans or something ridiculous like that. It's like, you can't fucking do that. You have a rank multiplier of one. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, you get 2D6 fans. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's like, yeah, you pretty much get, you know, you get two chances from the first start off. It's like, what the hell? Like, it's... It's pretty rough sometimes. But the big thing is... You, your understanding is like you can help people out instead of things. Well, finally, recollections are kind of like your way to save your ass during performances. Because performances are your combat, but not combat. So, performances are a little bit different. They work a very, they work a lot different. They work, utilize stats. Checks related to rules like breakthrough and support don't apply. You probably, you just want to get it as high as physically possible. So. If a character visual of four, then four that requires visual, they roll 46. So, for example, we're going to roll physicality. So, let's roll. Let's see Let's see what our performance is. Uh, this is actually a really good roll. So, all dice with duplicate value showing are considered invalid. However, a uh, character is, so, one, two, six, six. Six is, you roll off of three. Duplication regardless of the number of duplicates. So, you know... 555 is 1. 3366 5, 5, 5, 5 is 0. If all dice are cancelled out, total is 0. A miracle occurs. When a miracle is activated, uh, yeah, it's at the 10. Uh, sometimes you can just get, if you get dubs or trips, you can immediately become better and things go well. <laughs> How much XP do I get <laughs> to fucking run over a fan? <laughs> Yeah, it's um pretty much <laughs> this is where the thing is get amusing when you get the symphony action. What symphony does is be like, don't worry, I understand you, you understand me. We're going, I'm going to help you out here. I rolled a six. It's actually really good. But let's say for example, uh let's say for example, I rolled a five on my symphony. I'm helping you out. The dubs thing still it counts. So I've taken it, my five in this roll and made it go away. I went from having a lovely spread. Let's see. Uh, let's see what I would have. I have, t I have 14. I have a pretty good spread here. I went from having a nice 14 to a nine. Because one person decided to help. That does leave with some like very amusing things going on. It's it's fucking rough. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, sorry, like we're friends and we just kill it. Yeah, however, if you work together and you get it zero, you perform a miracle synchro. If you work together, it's 15 and pretty much you become a super. A third type, perfect miracle. Every value, one to six with no repeats. One, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect miracle occurs. You are set at the 30. That is insane. If you Yahtzee that shit, you're like three times better than if you just suck. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, you pretty much want to use recollections you want to re-roll you want to try your best you know miracle synchros you're trying pretty much everything you're trying to do uh to do things recollections effectively allow you to just change the dice ever so slightly uh allowing you to do things such as uh kill all your dice making it so that you automatically wreck everything out and allowing you to do crazy shit uh this is zombie land saga if i remember correctly these are all dead girls. Um, yeah. It's a fascinating thing. Yeah, everyone, is, if they succeed, except Breakthrough Peg, the mental cost as usual. Uh, you begin with 1d6 fans. Uh, write down the character's name. Reveal a set list. 
There's one fascinating thing about this game, and actually something I actually thought was very fascinating, very fun, that I actually quite enjoyed, was the idea that you are pretty much being told immediately what you're being, what you're going to be working with. Including the fact that you're going to be told exactly what's going to go on and how we're going to do it. If we can work together, if we can do this, we're going to do it. And if you succeed, congratulations, like you're going to do well. You know exactly what's going to happen. The problem is, you know exactly what's going to happen and things are going to go wrong. So, and the entire idea is you immediately move on to the drama phase. So, you become a scene player, you go, and you have to roll on the work table. Do you have the day off? If the answer is yes, you're able to, go, you're able to practice or play or lose your fucking mind if you choose not to. Or you work, carry out the scene, increase understanding. Because you're always going to be paired with somebody else. Every single time thing you do, you're always going to have another person with you. Even if you're doing a job. And you're going to have fun. And the thing, that's what you kind of want to do. Working allows you to work. Well, you gain fans. If you succeed, you get a lot of fans. But you need fans to succeed. If you don't have fans, what are you doing? Come on, guys. Come on. And if you succeed with this, congratulations, you get a more spe you get random specialties. You get more specialties, you can actually get more skilled skills or increase your stats to make things easier, to make sure you're rolling higher, to make sure you don't fuck up the performance like you usually do. <laughs> come on, come on. Uh, scene hanging out with partner player, making memories, recollections with them. Carry out a player scene unless the work. Eh, specialties. Gain one recollection. You want to build recollections. You build recollections, good things happen. So you always want to do things. That's the big thing. You want to. You really, really, really want to. Like you want, you, you, you kind of thing is like you, you want to work. Because that's how you build fans up and that's how you actually do things. But you also want to play because you want to build up recollections. So when you inevitably fuck up, you can fix the fuck ups. And you also want to practice so you actually have the ability to not be a terrible waste of space. And it's like, oh. Oh, fuck. Which leads to the key person scene. Now, the key person scene's a little bit weird. Uh, I'm not, like, very, uh, I will say it's a fascinating one. So, for example, you, the viewer, are my key person for this one. Uh, they're going to give everybody five power, five fans, whoever shows up for the prerequisite. And as long as you get the prerequisite and you make the performance stat correct. If you get the per if you get over a 10, you're going to get me as a bit me and every one of my fans along with you. Which is good. And you need those people. Because they're usually going to help you out. They'll record fan power and production... Well, nothing happens. And sometimes these can be very essential. Sometimes these are going to allow you to give you certain abilities or certain bonuses. All right. Going good. <laughs> My throat. I've been talking for six and a half hours. Ah, uh, uh, ripping my fucking throat to pieces. So, we gotta select our outfits, which you can technically... Everyone just gets outfits. I love it. Uh, programs. This is actually kind of an interesting idea. Which is... So, this is their set list. Pretty much the first half pressure, when you first start, when you start the actual, you know, match, everyone's gonna lose 2d6 mental. If you aren't taking care of yourself, there's a good chance you're gonna have a mental breakdown before you even begin. And the entire idea is that you're going through pretty much a series of programs. It's things like, you need to do the the British Invasion, which we're going to be using the overseas and this. Or, hey, Games Workshop, Game Design, Visual Acting, ooh, the Ubuntu Experience, Acting and Physical. Then we get to try to make an action as the producer. Then we go into the end phase, which gets harder, by the way. Gets much harder. And there's a good chance you're going to go... You're, you're going to... Things are going to go wrong. Things are going to go wrong very quickly. If you lose your... No better, you die. Are you feel? Am I feeling it, Mr. Krabs? Yes. 
I am feeling it, because I drank a fucking cup of coffee, and now I'm drinking water. <sighs> so, make a performance use specify performance stat. This is good, we want to make more performances. This should be symphonies is normal, it's fans equal to their performance score multiplied by their rank. So you want as many people, and you want to make as many performances as possible. And try your best to not die. There is literally a thing called prayer. Is praying for your success right to the last moment. Somehow you can feel it. You all make a check on the specialty of their choice. See they may remove one status effect from the production sheet. Or retrospection. Think back to the time practicing together, along with the producer supporting them. Because yes, the producer is a character in this game, and it is a very valuable one. <laughs> If you don't do it, things are going to go wrong. Uh, within one more system in the program, carry out step, step details, and then we conclude. So, and then things is the fast how to minus fans. We get more fans. Highest remaining mental. Highest number of special results on checks. Number of fumbles. Because yes, you get literally bonus fans for fucking up hardcore because you're Gap Moe. You know, or the highest number of miracles and miracle synchros. We want more. Activated a perfect miracle. Idle rank multiplier to all these bonuses required, fans gains, and you know, great success. Double the amount, production level, and failure, but you lose. If you, you have a production value level of two to begin with, uh, you fail fucking twice, it's over. It's over. It's like you you just it's it's done. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Play the game is a one shot. The game's in here. If you enjoy the fine, make a multiple session move on the section five post session. Yeah, everybody, check for retirement. Uh, adjust your idle rig. Or you know, adjust fan power and shit like that. Because like there's a lot to this, by the way. And I think this is the this is the part that makes me actually quite like beginning idle. Because, like, you... It's rough. Like, it's a rough game. Because you're going to get your shit rocked. Because you are not, um... I think the best way to word it is, like, you are the least likely person to succeed in just about any... Eh. I think you're... Yeah, no, you're, you're pretty much the last person anyone really wants you to succeed because you're fucked. You're, you're just f fucked. You're always gonna like. You're just you're gonna lose. This is bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of skills, a lot of a lot of abilities. It's literal TL drip. <laughs> and each of these are also gonna do something different. And I think the big thing with Beginning Idol, and I actually like Beginning Idol. I think this game is uh, has a has a particular sense of charm to it. The big thing with it, though, is that you need to get into the mindset of that you are an idol and you're ready to break your fucking balls doing it. You gotta be ready because it's about managing a set list. It's about managing the how your girls are doing and everything like that. See, I actually, I'm actually curious though um, if there is if there is a board game with this kind of concept. Not necessarily for this because I actually quite enjoy this. Idea. I think this is a really good execution of the Psycho Fiction system. Uh, to the translation, I will be posting everything in my server, I, as I usually do. Uh, I'll be posting this one as well. Uh, I think if you Google Beginning Idol translation, it's like one of the first things that pops up, so bear that in mind. Um, but yeah, I actually enjoy Beginning Idol. I think it's uh, it's. I would actually want to see a full translation because there are there's challenge girls. And there's another one focused on male idols, which apparently is e easier. That's the joke. It's easier to be a male idol than it is to be a female idol, which I think is kind of amusing, apparently, anyway. So, um, yeah, that's that. I'm going to exit out of you. Oh, go away, Maho Shoujo Rant Boy. So, the, the, I, I usually like to make a theme or something similar to these, to these things, something to kind of get the noggin jogging, and I think the the major theme 
about this game. Uh, no, we're not done yet. You, you damn well know I'm not free yet. Um, I think one of the big things about these kind of games, about, you know, Japanese RPGs in general, is they're just like us. They got they they have the uh, the same kind of philosophies. You have your weird quirky indie games. You have not good games. You have not bad. You have g great games that are just kind of bad in their own right. Or you have these really kind of quirky games. You've got weird designers. You've got kind of traditional designers. You've got the whole mess. But the big thing to always consider, big thing to always know, is that. We don't see many Japanese games. We see a very curated list of them. And I think one of the big things is the reason why we see that very curated list of games is there's a dozen factors, but I think it really does boil down to some just appeal to people that others don't. Again, only two of these were actually fully legally translated. Most of these are just fan translations. And that's... What we're going to see, more than anything, I think, of... Until there is, like, a fucking renaissance in the market and millions of dollars is put into it, we're not really going to see anything else. And I think that's always kind of a... I think I always like to iterate. Something that's always kind of painful. So, that is uh, the, the Curious Case of Japanese Role-Playing Games number three. However not done yet because God has abandoned this world so uh, let's go to Kickstarter yeah let's uh let's let's, let's pretend not to want to fucking kill myself on Kickstarter it's my favorite thing in the world we love Kickstarter the most great oh god the blinding light of Allah that's uh okay ow yeah Kickstarter is bright fucking white apparently I, I forgot that I forgot Kickstarter is the you know the color of yeah, ah, my eyes. Newest. So, let's look through. Let's see what we can find. Maybe we can find something good. Maybe we can find something bad. Ooh. <laughs> my eyes! <laughs> Deep inside, are you really a gamer, girl? <laughs> so, let's see. Um, no. No, not feeling it, Mr. Krabs. Uh, is there anything fun and exciting? Oh, wow. It's Oh, wow. Look, everybody. It's a 5e game. We love 5e. We love 5e. Deep Rock Galactic, the board game. Oh, wow. It's... Is this, like, an official... This is an officially licensed game. Yeah, this is an officially licensed game. <laughs> oh, God. How much money is they already read? 1.8 million dollars. Yeah, they got 18 days to go. Yeah, they're gonna make bank on this fucking thing. Jesus. Rock and stone, brothers. Rock and stone. I just don't look at board games because I don't know board games very well. I actually do know board games well. I just don't know design wise. Teslaopoly. Wow. I fucking hate crypto boys. Uh, wooden decision. That's just a fucking coin. Uh, let's see. Immersive Adventure Escape Room. Mahjong Party. Norse Deity Patrons. Oh, wow. Look, everybody. It's 5e. We love 5e. 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 Foofy 5e. Foofy. 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 <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I'm just gnome maxing. You don't understand. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, wow. Look, it's a fucking RPG cool kid. Oh, yeah, because it's zine month. Fun, fun fact, it's zine month. Um, what? But yeah, it's, as a zine month is where we get shit. Shit is, zine month is terrible. Nothing good happens in this in zine month. Run and gun, a app driven tabletop shooter. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> this seems like, okay, here's the thing. This seems like a really like obtuse method of just making a run and gun. That's just RoboCop of just making a run and gun game, but you just put it on the table to make everyone's life a little bit more complicated. Um, f cool, I guess. Fuck it. Uh, let's see. Um, solo game from the creators of Warped Edge. Wow, anomaly expansion for Warped Edge. Wow, it's almost like I don't fucking care. Amazing. Uh, Mind Man. I actually saw the uh, shut up and sit down on Mind Management. Seems kind of interesting. Monkey. Monkey. Greedy Spurn. SDL file. SDL files. I love S. I, I fucking. Kickstarter, for fuck's sake, just put STL files in its own thing. You can keep it in the game section. Just give them its own fucking section. Uh, let's see. After the rain, the role-playing game. All right. Uh, Iron Forest. Raiders of Ice Cool. Absolute power. Oh. More. Wait. Daiskami Publishing? Wait a second. I know you. You motherfuckers. You fuckers, I know you. You're the guys who did Anime 5e and BSM 4th Edition. Oh. Oh. Funding canceled. That's always that's always fun to see. I always love seeing that. Funded in 90 minutes, three mini role-playing games. So you're pumping out a... Silver Age Sentinel 2nd Edition. Why is it called that? Why isn't it called Silver Age Sentinels then? Wait a second. Wait a fucking second. Did they get the rights to Silver Age Sentinel, but they want to rename it something so people don't know? <laughs> yeah, no, this is Silver Age Sentinels, alright. $20,000. Uh, they got 57 on it. That's pretty good, actually. Invincible. It. I think this is riding the uh, the success of things like Ascendant. Because Ascendant made eight or billion billion dollars because the Axe guy is fucking nuts. I do not understand people who are like, I mean... Me need Dice Tower. Nobody needs the Dice Tower. Not a single human being needs a fucking Dice Tower. It's the stupidest fucking thing. Uh, let's see. Cardboard minis. Wait a second. It's... Why is this a... Why are you offering this as like a side thing? This should be like its own fucking thing. This is a Tristat Core. Like, oh, fuck it, alright. How much do I need to pay you to get Tristat Core? I need to pay $200! Holy shit! Jesus, mother of fucking God. Ooh, look at that $15 shipping rate. Oh, baby! Ooh! Ooh, ooh! I don't like that one, Jesus. Even fucking dollar it is. Um, then we'll want to... Uh... Okay, everybody, it's a minimal one-shot role-playing game experience. How... I'm, I'm genuinely curious how big these books are. If it's like, uh... Oh, okay, it's something that's very as wild as your imagination. Black Plague, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. It... So it's a gimmick game, you're putting in a giant fucking book for no goddamn reason? Cool, that's cool. I'm... I'm cool, I get like, is this it? After the, like, why are they so big then? Like, this doesn't really seem like that big of a game. 
Hurt got get new pre- God, why does it always look so fucking awful? Who the fuck is working on this? I'm genuinely curious. Who the fuck is working on this? Because, again, these are spread over three books, but, like, I guess it's just tables? Like... That or it's, like, comically small. Well, actually, look, okay, that's his hand. Yeah, okay, I think this game is just comically fucking small more than anything. Yeah, okay. So the books make sense because they're probably, like, 50-page books, but they're the size of, like, my fucking hand. All right, that's fine, I guess. No, it's not really. Remind me of it. They already made their fucking money, so it doesn't really fucking matter. But, oh, that's not good. I don't like that one. I don't like that one bit. Twilight War, supplement fuck the party. The party first RPG. Untranslatable feeling from another world. Oh, God. And to express what it means to be together. Wow, everybody. Let's use the power of friendship as I now put the shotgun against the temple of my mouth. Yay! Pfft. The fuck out of this nightmare. I cannot leave. Uh, pff, I mean, party first. There are a few happy endings of party first. Is this game called Party? F yeah, it's called Party First Twilight War. The Party First RP. I mean, I'm not exactly. I don't like where this is going. Ooh, oh. Ew. Now we always have to ask ourselves, is it unironic communism or ironic communism? Because there usually is a very thin line. We do not trust communists here. The only good commie is a commie... <laughs> The only good commie, kids, is one being thrown out of the fucking elevator. Thrown out of the fucking helicopter. Uh, the, ro the royal cartographer. Look, everyone, it's a communities to represent. Uh, barkeep of the Borderland. Pub crawl, point crawl, adventure. Hello, everybody. We paid $30 for this fucking game. Uh, comic book series. The Blue Bolt. A science and sorcery. Okay. Uh, Akishotic Titan. Wait a second. Wait a second. Oh, it's used for dungeon crawl classics. What? Cool, I guess. It's a DCC thing. Um And the journal uh, detail two setting four limit blue bolt. Oh, it's a Okay, it's a setting book for this. I'm don't really give a shit, actually. It's astounding how like one thing can like quickly. It's always funny when you see like one thing and just like all your evaporation goes, like... <laughs> goes to fucking nothing. It's truly amazing, actually. I'm I'm actually impressed how I can lose faith in humanity in like one fell swoop. It's great. Uh, let's see. Who wants to be a billionaire? Yay! Unfair expansion. Comic book hacker. Uh, Clefton Mangled Hill. Look, it's Dungeon Crawl Classic. Dungeon Crawl Classic! That's never a good sign. A unique, uh, rules light TTRPG world. Oh, sweet Jesus, mother of Um, oh, look everyone, it's a fucking, it's a 5v magical adventure! No, it, well, it's a magical adventure! You want to go on my magical adventure with me, where I go jump off the fucking bridge? It's great. Uh, okay. What's what's it fascinating? Give me... This is a unique fucking game. It better... Oh, it's unique, alright. In a typical... In a typical... 
I'm already feeling fucking unique here. Unique on the fucking special bus, but hey, what do I know, right? God damn it, I didn't know we were dealing. Uh, storytelling over mechanics. You and everyone else, mate. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Type of challenge they want. Uh, without. Wow. Hey. Oh, but oh, well, uh, you can set any challenge you want, but also not character for level stories. Unlike high fantasy, gaining regaining a greater past civilization, set in the young world with stories yet to be told. In short, a typical fa high typical fantasy, your character would play to an ancient wizard. In Pharaoh, your character is the wizard on his path to great power right now. What the f was the X minus one? Oh God. In our very unique game, with nothing ever different. Come the f shut the fuck up. Just shut the fuck up. Well, yeah. so wait, yeah. With the result of five or higher success, but each of the three classes excel in one category. So you you have a fifty percent, or you have a. Uh, I'm trying to think. It would be a sixty-six point six percent chance. Technically, a sixty-six point six seven percent chance. Uh, no way, it would be 33.33%. 66.67% failure. <sighs> That's not unique. It's not. I don't fucking know why people are like, oh, this is my brand new unique game. It's, I know it's SEO's, brother. I fucking know it's SEO's. Oh, wow, I'm feeling... Wow, 5e, 5e, 5e. You just fucking failed that. Uh, 5e. You did a bunch of 5e stuff. Man who has seen nothing but the boss baby goes view the first movie he's ever seen. Man, this movie's giving me some big boss baby vibes. Ah, damn it. Ugh. No shipping. Wow, I am so astounded. I would have never thought that this game is going to be a retro... D OSR retro clone... Except this time, you just roll a single D6 where I break my fucking skull. Projects we love! What? What is there to, He misspelled typical! Is he sucking someone's cock? Is he fucking one of you at Kickstarter? Is this man literally sucking his dick in you? Ugh, God, no, 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 don't, don't get, don't get sad, don't get, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's, is he is he sucking your kid dick or he's fucking you? I don't fucking know. And the thing is, there's no other resolution system. And it's like, what, what are you fucking... This isn't a unique game. This is an OSR game like every other fucking OSR game. <laughs> Way to be a hero. Let me... If you do another D6 fucking game, I'm going to beat your ass, Terry Crew. Owner of LARP.com. Oh my goodness. Let's do what's what's LARPs.com? Not a I'm gonna feel real goddamn sad if it's not LARP if it's not LARP related. Have you LARPed? Oh Jesus. Oh sweet Jesus, mother of fucking God. I am not oh so I I, I wanna just believe that's him right there. Okay, that's fundamentally agonizing. Uh, characters nostalgia create a vibrant world. 16 plus super towers. Wow. Oh. Robust smash some villain. Relies on the power by the apocalypse system. Well then, I know I can disregard this piece of shit. Jesus fucking pe Christ, people. Welcome to Zines, where we're allowed to create whatever we want. And really... Yeah, we're allowed to create whatever we want and explore vast new ideas. Vast new, interesting fucking concepts. And instead, let's just rely on everything that's been done. I'm on, the, you, know, you know, let me just put my fucking face on the ground as it rams in my fucking ass with its cock. Jesus fucking Christ, I hate scenes. I hate... Uh, connected with Alien Species, fired by Becky Chambers Wayfarer series. Oh boy. Yeah, what is, come on, come on, hit me, come on, give me something interesting. 
Uh, feel alive, engage with favorite TV show character. Shut the fuck up. Do not care. Tell me what the system is. That's fuel and food. Oh, wow, everybody. We got to deal with fuel and food. Uh, barrel with earth monkeys. Find it easier. Swing along corridors. Uh, Reese Aberrell crewmates mood while system is installed. Soak tank. Oh. Oh god, it's a furry game. It's a f oh god. Rim world. Don't bring Rim World into this. More plan. What soundtrack? Why the fuck are you getting a soundtrack in this? Get to be a fucking game. <laughs> 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 Man, I fucking hate this month. month. The station. It's a long way to train people around them. GM was world building prompt game. Nope. Nope, not dealing with that horse shit. Maps ready, tabletop role playing game. Bob Bad, Fantasy Pinup. I'll do werewolf after the darkness. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, it's a bad deal. Apocalypse. Oh my goodness, I've never seen a game like this before. Holy shit. Please, someone just fucking kill me. Just, just put it, just three in my chest. Just two, two in the back of the fucking head. Don't look, look at the look, look at the rabbits, George. Bang, bang. Except I'm George. <laughs> time after time, mothership adventure. Zine, man, 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 man. Take it to car, take it to carcass on. Cat shit crazy. Crude fast plays word game. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's great. A zany no prep tabletop RPG about abandoned goblins. <laughs> Look everybody, goblins! <laughs> I hate goblins. I hate everyone who fucks goblins. Every single one of you fucking troglodytes should get drowned in the fucking river with the puppies. No. I'm okay. Zen notepad. Seven hours Zen notepad. I've achieved peace. I'm okay with it. Are you okay? It's great. Yeah, no, this is 500 euros. Like, let's see what you actually. Well, let, let me guess. It's gonna be like a five page game where it's 95% art. Like, it's gonna be 95% art. Also, you know, proud German man. Uh, sharkbomb.com. Tell me more about Sharkbomb. Let me guess. It's going to be interaction designer, and oh my god, I want to punch you in the fucking face already. Um, hand in nowhere profit. Oh, he like did that, I guess. Why are you doing this? Oh, actually, I, I know what you're doing. You're doing it because Zine Month is, is easy, and you know how to draw a goddamn goblin and get dicked. Fucking. I fucking even more, even more. Go a new goblin playbook, playbooks. No, 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 no. You're not dropping this on me here. No, 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 no. You do not get to go away. You do not get to avoid this little thing. Whopping four playbooks. Oh my. No, no, no. No! No! You do not get to do this. God! Uh, another game in the state, and your family trying to protect their loved ones. They keep, pap like, capitalizing P, so I get a little bit, like, apocalypse, so I keep getting worried. So it's a D100. Oh, it's open quest. It's open quest, I don't really get it. Uh, uh, struggle for Mexican independence. Evolution. Accessible gaming quarterly. These guys are actually these guys are actually pretty good. Look at it, it's accessible gaming quarterly. Uh doesn't mean I gotta like any of this other shit. Uh, Legends of Crowless. I can really follow this one. This is one that I thought was like very odd because it 
Like, something isn't right with that one. I, I don't think that one's going to... Why do you people keep backing fucking TCGs? Why do you keep doing it? Stop it. Stop it right now. Stop backing fucking TCGs. You didn't... It fucking failed. Why'd you cancel this one? You fucking re... Oh. Oh. Oh, that's why you failed. You decided to do... Th Hundred fucking thousand dollars. You dumb motherfuckers. You you dumb motherfuckers. Every, like, you dumb motherfuckers keep back and fucking TCGs. I don't know why. They're not gonna kill magic. They never will kill magic. No matter what you do, no matter how many NFT shit, no matter how much anime Coomer art, no matter how many innovative game design things you keep putting onto it. It ain't. Make an LCG, man. It's like five times easier, five times better, and no one's going to get pissed at you when they don't get the fucking foils. Jesus fucking Christ, people. <laughs> Look at me, I'm very funny. <laughs> I hate it. Uh... This one got funded, unfortunately, and God is dead. Uh, wow, look, everybody. The Soviet-era TTRPG. Look at it, everybody. Look, it's, it's funny. The roulette system. Wow, everybody. It lets life without conflict. Wow, I fucking hate it. Communism was a mistake. <sighs> okay, no, no. I keep looking here. Keep looking and I keep getting sad. The more I get sad, the worse I feel. So instead, we're gonna go to the other sadness place to itch.io, this shithole that I can't escape from. Oh wow, that's. <laughs> oh wow. This guy rate. $1,500? Bitch, this is fucking Lumen! <laughs> it's Lumen, people! No, oh, it's Lumen. It's Lumen, guys! Why are you giving... Why are you giving him money? Why? You don't need it. Wait a second, please. One XP. Samuel... Oh, that's why. Uh, are you a dude? Thinking? No, notepad. No, don't get angry. No, angry. No, sad. Happy here. You're happy. Happy. Everything is fine. Out of here. Get me 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 out of here. Happy, happy notepad, happy notepad, happy notepad, happy notepad, happy notepad, happy notepad. Uh, you may be wondering why I don't hop on on the Lumen train, because, um, I fucking hate Lumen. Uh, I just don't like Lumen very much. Uh, I generally, like... I find Gillo to be a, um, a charlatan of a human being. With bare, I, calling him a human being is actually kind of an insult to humanity in general. But yeah, I don't really like it. And I actually like making interesting things that are new and innovative. Or trying to push boundaries. Or trying to do something different, at least. Because um, the, if you keep using the same shit over and over again, you do not develop anything. You don't build anything new. You keep making the same thing and pretending it's new. That's not how any of this works. Uh, okay, what's... Um, it's literally role-playing game conversation. God, that is... God, we live in a society. Bubblegum gasm, let me... That's a 20... It's a $20 early fucking access and you're charging charging for a next game? Is it done yet? Oh wow, no, it's about Asian people. Um Wait a second. Are you is this f The 
with being Asian about it. A ritual for rainy days, otherwise known as rainy fucking days. I'm okay with rainy days. Because I'm feeling, oh my god, it's a lyric. She's a lyric game designer! No. I'm okay. <laughs> you aren't, you aren't even a game of the protagonist, though. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts, though. I don't want to make money off idiots. I want to make money doing things I enjoy doing. This is my hobby. I like writing games. I don't like writing the same shit over and over and over again unless I'm doing something unique with it. Yeah, it's nothing much. Alright. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna cancel right now. We're done. We're good. Also, I should actually say this just because I saw this. Um, Wild I actually saw the uh, early beta for this game, actually. Very interesting. Actually, I, I'm kind of digging the... I, I dig the art. I dig the look. Uh, don't know about the system, though. I need to um, actually delve into this a little bit. So that's, this is a little note. Kind of an interesting, cool little idea. So, as we as we end up here... Uh, let's all just remember that um, I don't drink enough for this shit. So, Godspeed and good luck. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. We're seven hours in. No, we're ending. We're ending it now. Uh, so let's see. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be streaming. There are two stream ideas for tomorrow, depending on how I'm feeling. Uh, stream A is uh, I get uh, is I sit down and I play a game. Probably Dwarf Romantic, and I talk about uh, fun things like how the indie crab bucket exists in the tabletop gaming sphere, how there's no fucking money in this industry. I either go over that, uh, or B, I uh, do the uh, uh, Blood Coin and Steel episode five, which might actually end it. I don't know yet. It, it's could play, man. No, no, no. I see. My normal game got canceled. So, uh, it's kind of like, I should do something tomorrow, because I usually don't do anything on Sundays except play. So, Godspeed, good luck. If you need anything, I'll upload everything here on the uh, the Discord. Uh, thank you all for watching. My name is Nopad, and I hope you all had a wonderful time. Uh, uh, this video, this particular VOD, will go up on next Saturday. However, I should also add, because we got knocked back a week, next Saturday we're doing the Root and Tune case of Western role-playing games. So, be there if you want to hear me talk about Western games. Or don't. I don't fucking care what you do. We live in an egoist nightmare. Alright, Godspeed, good luck. I will catch you on the uh, flip side. Goodbye.